Ah, don't touch that dial, because there's nothing else on. You might just as well listen to Blondie. Blondie, rebroadcast for the servicemen and women of the United Nations, with Penny Singleton and Arthur Lake as Blondie and Dagwood Bumstead, respectively. Before we join the Bumsteads of Shady Lane Avenue... Let's gather around the bandstand for a curtain raiser from Lenny Kahn and his orchestra. Raise that curtain, Len. weekly visit with our neighbors, the Bumsteads of Shady Lane Avenue. Well, just at the moment, things are very quiet this afternoon at the Bumstead home. Uh, well, that moment just passed, and now there's going to be a little action. In just a second, the phone is going to ring. Uh-huh, there we are. And here comes Blondie to answer. Oh, dear, now I wonder who that could be. I just talked to Cora Githers an hour ago. Hello? Blondie, is that you? Oh, yes, Dagwood. Oh, my goodness, it's hot today. Where are you? I'm in jail. <laughs> well, I hope it isn't as hot there as it is here because it's in jail. I've been arrested. What for? Jaywalking? Oh, no. Uh, I've been arrested on suspicion of bank robbery. Oh. Oh, Dagwood. Yeah, isn't that awful? What bank did you rob? Uh, the First National Bank. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, uh, that's the one they think I robbed yesterday afternoon. I'm innocent, Blondie. Listen, will you come right down here right away and get me out of jail? I'm not happy here. <laughs> All right, Dagwood. I'll get Mr. Dithers to meet me there. I'll call him right up. Okay, honey. Goodbye. Goodbye. J.C. Dennis Construction Company, office of J.C. Dennis, president of the J.C. Dennis Construction Company, J.C. Dennis saying hello. Hello, Mr. Dennis. Oh, hello, brother. Say, do you know where Dagwood is? He should be in the office working. Oh. <laughs> but wait. Who gave him permission to go there? Mr. Dizzard, they arrested him for robbing the First National Bank yesterday afternoon. What? How 
day he rob a bank on Dither's company time. <laughs> he was supposed to be working for me, not himself. But wasn't he working for you yesterday afternoon? Why, well, that's right. He was in the office all afternoon. Well, then he couldn't have robbed the bank. Why, of course not. Listen, I'll meet you down at the jail, Blondie, and we'll get him right out. Oh, thank you, Mr. Dither. I knew you'd be anxious to help. Oh, I'm not anxious to help. But every minute he spends loafing in that nice, cool jail is costing me money. Goodbye. Well, Dagwood, now that you're free, just relax. Yeah. And enjoy your chocolate soda. Uh, and tell us what happened. Yeah, why well, should they think you'd want to rob a bank? Yeah. Mm. They know you know as I know that crime doesn't pay. Yeah, but do they know as I know that the Dithers Company doesn't pay either? Bumstead. Oh. Huh? Don't be so ungrateful. Yeah. Now explain things. Yeah, well, Blondie, you know uh, what, what I've been telling you about the dreams I've been having lately? Oh, yes. It's sort of interesting, Mr. Dithers. Mm. Dagwood's been dreaming things that come true later. Yeah, yeah that's right, Mr. Dithers. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and who makes your dreams come true? A fairy godmother, precious? No, yeah. oh, cut it out, J.C. Well, then be sensible. Uh, Mr. Dithers, don't you dare say another word until I find out why they arrested Dagwood on suspicion of bank robbery. Now, go ahead, Jack. Yeah. Well, the other night, I dreamt that the First National Bank would be held up. So, when I went in there yesterday morning, I told Mr. Hoop, the cashier... You did? Yeah. Uh, ...that the bank was going to be held up in the afternoon. <laughs> he wasn't much amused, particularly after he got held up. I, I guess he told the police what I said, and uh, they grabbed me this morning. Oh, well, what are some of these other dreams you've been having? Well, well, Dad would dream that the Acme Market would sell me some clothes pins. Uh, and sure enough, they did. That's practically a miracle. Yeah. And, and uh, you know that property that the Hamilton Car Company bought for their factory last week? Yes, what about it? I dream they uh, did it a week before they did it. Good grief, Bumstead. Yeah. Well, why didn't you buy the property yourself and make a profit? <laughs> See, I never dreamed about that. <laughs> I mean, I, I never thought about it either. <laughs> what a dope. Yeah, huh? What a nitwit. Yeah. Oh, please, Mr. Dithers. Remember, you are talking about my dream man. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> a nightmare, I call him. Mm. Now, Dagwood, huh? why didn't you buy that property yourself? No, well, how could I tell the dream was coming true? After all, last night I, I dreamt that... Today, Mr. Dithers would find a $10 bill. And you haven't found one, have you, J.C.? Well, have you, Mr. Dithers? No. No, I haven't. Yeah, and the same night I dreamt that Blondie bought a pair of nylons at the little place right next door here to this drugstore. Nylon? Uh, next door? Yeah. Well, I don't believe it. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> oh, of course. This whole thing is ridiculous. We all know that. Yeah. I hope. Uh, well, Mmm, mm, it is a good soda. Mm. Oops, there goes my spoon. Mm. Good grief. Huh? Bumstead. What? Look what I found. Holy smoke, a ten dollar bill. Uh, your dream came true. Yeah. Hey, Bumstead, you can see into the future. Oh, now that's silly, J.C. That's silly. How can I see into the future without a crystal ball? Why, this is amazing. Yeah. There's a fortune in it. Stock market, huh? real estate, oil wells, bingo. <laughs> Dagwood, old friend. Huh? I want to make you a proposition. Y you do? That's right, Daggy. Old friend of mine. <laughs> Mr. Gillers, whenever you smile and call me an old friend of yours, I know you've got lost me in your heart. <laughs> oh, bums. You're trying to figure out some way of swindling me out of something, and I uh, suppose uh, I'll be a sucker as usual. I suppose so. So let's get out of it. Yeah. I want to buy exclusive rights to all your dreams and the contents thereof. Hmm. And would that mean I'd have to ask your permission to have a dream? No, I wouldn't think so. Hmm. But you'll have to tell me what your dreams are about whenever you have them. Hmm. Well, what do you say, daggy old buddy? <laughs> well, divvy old buddy duddy <laughs> You haven't uh, mentioned any sum of money yet, as per the uh, party of the second part, uh, ipso facto. Oh, uh, yes, money. Yeah. Well, 
I'll give you $5 a week for your dream. Well, I don't know. $5 a week seems like... $10, then. Well, okay. Gee, I was just going to say that $5 a week seems like a lot for my dreams. <laughs> oh. Well, don't worry, Bumstead. Oh, I'm going to make a fortune on your dreams. I'm going to make so much money, there'll be even some left after I pay taxes on it. And believe me, that's a lot of money. I wouldn't have believed this could happen if I hadn't found that $10. Yes, but look, I bought three pair of nylon. Good grief. Oh, holy smoke. Oh. Hey, my dream was right again. They'd fallen down behind the shelf, and the saleswoman had just found them, and they didn't happen to be her size. Oh. Bob's Ted. Huh? Don't forget that you sold me the rights to your dreams for $10 a week. Oh, Dagwood, it's worth 25 or 50 times as much. Well, Blondie, he hasn't paid me any money yet to bind the contract. Oh, here's $20 in advance. Don't take it. Take it. Dagwood. Don't Well, I promised I'd take the dough, Blondie. Pass the stuff, Dagwood. <laughs> now, uh, go and pay for the soda. Uh, oh, uh, thank you. I'll be right back here, boy. 20 bucks. Now, see here, Mr. Dither. Uh, Blondie, don't try to talk me out of my contract with him. He's stuck with it. Oh, I'm going to make a fortune out of this. And he can't tell his dreams to anyone but me. Mr. Githers, did you ever stop to think that Dagwood might talk in his sleep? Well, uh-oh. I hate to be mercenary, but I'm the businessman in our house, and I expect to be cut in on my husband's dreams. And if you don't want to cooperate with me, I'll just listen in when Dagwood talks in his sleep and sell the information to someone else. Oh, Blondie, is that fair? Certainly. A dream with a lot of inside information could be very valuable. Now, let's really talk business, Mr. Gibbs. Well, I'll give you 10% of all I make from Dagwood's dreams. Mr. Gibbs, I want 75%. 75? Why, that's ridiculous. The most I'd ever give you is 50%. So, I wonder if I spoke too soon. Well, uh, it's all paid for, Blondie. Say, I, I, uh, I guess I didn't tell you, J.C., about another dream I had last night. It was very exciting. What was it? Betty Grazel? Oh, no. Uh, the annual boat race between the east side and the west side. Boy, what a race. Why, Dagwood, uh, that race is tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, I know it. Say, I just thought of something. Why, this will be worth a fortune to me. Yeah, well, what's that, Mr. Gibbons? Well, Cora's been thinking about where we're going for our vacation. Ah. It's the same old business, the seashore or the mountains. Cora wants to go to the mountains and look at the scenery. And you want to go to the seashore and look at the girls. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, let's face it. I'm human. <laughs> That's news to me. Bombstead. Yeah, uh, excuse me, Mr. Githers, what does your vacation have to do with Dagwood's dreams and the boat race tomorrow? Well, Dagwood will tell me which side won the race in his dream. Then I'll get Cora to bet with me that if the side I pick wins the race, I can choose where we go for our vacation. Oh, oh this is going to be wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it is a swell idea, Mr. Gittick, but it had one tiny little weakness. Oh, what's that? In my dream, I uh, didn't see who won the race. Oh, Dagwood, why was that? Well, I guess his both boats drew towards the finish line, and everyone was cheering and yelling and screaming. Uh-huh. Yes, what happened? The alarm clock went off. Oh, oh dear. Uh-huh. Is that all you remember about the race? Well, well Bonnie, you, you, you oh. made me get out of bed, and I haven't learned yet how to continue my dream and brush my teeth at the same time. Say, uh-huh. maybe he can dream the race all over again. Dagwood, uh-huh. how do you feel right now? Right now? Yes. Oh, I feel fine, thank you. Very chipper and wide awake. Well, uh, don't you feel a little drowsy? Oh, uh, uh. I am practically asleep myself. Yes, Dad, but after your experience in jail, when you like to go, oh, you know, I'm on the couch. Oh, excuse me. No, I'm not a bit sleepy. <laughs> or am I? <laughs> Dad, would we better take you right home and let you float off to Dreamland? Oh, no. Oh, no. I couldn't sleep when I ought to be working for Mr. Dithers. Oh, it's all right with me, Dad. Oh, no, no. I just couldn't sleep on the couch on company time. 
Oh, why not? You sleep at your desk on company time. Constantly. Oh, please, Dagwood. Well, all right, okay. I'm willing to lie down on the couch and rest my eyes a little bit, but I positively, absolutely refuse to go to sleep, and that's final. I can't stand to listen to much more of this. I'm getting sleepy myself. So am I. Oh, wait, I think he said something. Oh, boy. Boy, look at him go. Wow! Oh, it sounds like he's dreaming of the boat race all right. Oh, this is wonderful. I've always wanted to be able to decide where to go on my vacation. But it's impossible when you're married. Mr. Gibbers, you know, I never force Dad to go where I want to go for a vacation. You don't? Mm-hmm. I just say, Dagwood, I'm going to the mountains. Do you want to come along? And he always says yes. <laughs> Women are so sweet and reasonable. Here they come. Wow! Oh, it must be the race, all right. Yeah, bump that. Watch that race. Right. Oh, please see which boat wins it. Right. Right. Yippee! Dagwood, who won? Who won the race? Yeah. Who won the race? Yeah. Oh, no, it's no... Oh, I sure was dreaming, wasn't I, huh? Yes, but uh, did you dream about the boat race again? The race that's going to be held tomorrow yeah, afternoon? Yeah, 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 that's right, I see uh, it. Oh, what oh, a race, huh? Mm-hmm. The guys in each boat were roaring like mad right up to the finish. Oh, okay. uh, did you see the finish? No, I turned away to get a hot dog and missed it. Oh, <laughs> uh, Oh, let me at it. Yeah, well, look Please, Mr. Dither, don't. Uh, you got to get off me. Now, stop, children. <laughs> Oh, you dribbling, drooling, drip. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Dither, you forced me to get tough about this. Oh, Ronnie, let go of my ear. All right, you let go of Dagwood's seeds on first. Yeah. <laughs> All right. If you're going to be sensitive about it. That's uh, better. Yeah, oh, thanks. Bumstead. Huh? This is the only chance I've ever had to take a vacation where I want to take it. The only chance in years, and years, and years. <laughs> yeah, there, now, don't cry, Mr. Dizzy. Oh, I just can't help it. Now then, will you please go back to sleep again? Mm, no, I'm wide awake now. Oh, Jag, but you've got to go back to sleep. Mr. Dizzy wants to know whether the east side boat or the west side boat is going to win. Now, dear, please see if you can't take another little nap. No, I couldn't do it now, Blondie. Bumstead! I haven't said go to sleep. No, I can't possibly. Well, I'm not going to stand for any more foolishness. Huh? Put your big fat head down on that pillow. No, 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 wait a minute. Come on, close your broken down eyes. Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> now, go to sleep. Yeah, oh. And if you're not off in ten minutes, I'll come back and rock you to sleep. With a rock. <laughs> Let's go in, but be very quiet. All right, Blondie. Oh, I hope he remembers which boat wins the race this time. I've got to win that bet with Cora. Oh, the poor darling is sound asleep. The poor darling. Oh, she is Mr. Dibby, be careful. Don't step on Daisy's tail. Don't what on whose way? Get out, come on to my foot, you low-bred, squalling, ill-tempered flea farm. Yeah. Yeah, who, who, me? Yeah, what happened? What's going on here? Get back uh, to your sleeping bunk, Ted. Uh, Mr. Gibbons, get off Daisy's tail. Get out of this room before I kick you out. Oh, no! <laughs> hey, Mr. Gibbons, now, now, don't kick Daisy. Now, stop that. Hey, boy. Kick him, Daisy. Get him. Get him. Come on, get him, Daisy. Hey, look out. Help. Take go my leg, you must. Help. I'm calling. Help. Oh, Mr. Dither, stop teasing, Daisy. 
Daisy. Oh. You only get her excited. Oh, oh, perhaps you're right. Bumstead, uh, what were you dreaming about? It, well, it was uh, sort of about the river race. Oh, good. Who won? Well, I wasn't really dreaming about the race, Mr. Giddig. I was just dreaming that I was dreaming about it. So it wasn't a real dream, but a dream of a dream. <laughs> oh. Yes, yeah, you see? Uh, do you understand? Oh, sure. Uh. I understand. Perfectly. Yeah. It couldn't be any clearer. Uh. <laughs> well, there's only one thing to do now. Uh. What's that? Come on, Bumstead. Huh? Get on my lap. Rock a my mama's head. Rock a my mama's Oh, that was a nice dinner, Bobby. Oh, thank you. I, uh, wonder where Dagwood is. You know, Mr. Dithers, I wouldn't be surprised if Dagwood was taking a little after-dinner nap right now. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised either. I know he's taking a nap. Well, as a matter of fact, I know he'll take a nap, too. You see, I put a sleeping pill in his glass of milk. You did? Mm-hmm. Was that wrong? I don't know. I dosed up his milk, too. <laughs> oh, how many pills did you put in? I don't know exactly. It was a sort of a level handful. I just wanted to be sure I'd send him to Slumberland. Mommy! Oh, what is it, Cookie? Daddy's on the couch honking his horn. He's what? You know, snoring. Oh, He's sound asleep. So soon? Why, he just laid down a minute ago. I know he's sound asleep. Didn't wake up when I hit him in the face with my raggedy end doll. Are you sure he wasn't really awake and just pretending to be asleep? Yep. I hit him again to make sure. Oh, Mr. Jitters, we'd better go right in and see if he's all right. Oh, he'll be all right. Those pills are pretty weak. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> Oh, listen to those beautiful pear-shaped snores. It sounds like a frog with a man in his throat. Mr. Dithers, I'm worried about this. I'm going to wake him up and see if he feels all right. Oh, now, Blondie, don't do that. Oh, but I don't want to take any chances. Dagwood! Dagwood, now wake up. Wake up, dear. Now, I'm upset. Wake Come up. On, Good morning, honey. Good morning, precious. <laughs> Oh, oh, he's really out. I'm going to shake him. Dagwood, wake up. Oh, Dagwood, wake up. Uh, hello, Mr. Dithers. Oh, I'm not Mr. Dithers, Dagwood. Stop shaking me, Mr. Dithers. Oh, Dagwood. Now. I'll handle him, Blondie. I'll get close and yell in his ear. Bumstead! Get out of him. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Good night, darling. <laughs> Mr. Dithers, why don't you come back tomorrow and we'll see if he's dreamed about the race. Oh, all right, Blondie. But I'm beginning to wonder if it's worth it. Bumstead, wake up. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. The race is going to start any minute. Those sleeping pills really worked on him. He was awake a couple of times this morning, but he fell right off to sleep again. Good grief. Two o'clock. The race has started. I've got to call Cora and make my bet with her. But you don't know which boat Dagwood dreams would be the winner. Oh, well, Blondie, hand me that pitcher of ice water. Oh, Mr. Githers, do you really think you should? How can you ask that when you're shoving the pitcher right into my hand? Well, time's wasting. Oh, she'll make an awful yell. Well, it's for a good cause. Me. No, <laughs> I'm drowning. Help! Get the nice bird off my back. Help! I've been bird-vibed. <laughs> Blondie, get Cora on the phone right away. Oh, All right, Mr. Uh, oh, Dagwood, yeah. which boat won the race in your dreams? Huh? The east side or the west side boat? Good morning, Mr. Davis. It's good afternoon. Who won? Yeah. 
Oh, oh yes. Well, uh, the way I dreamed it, the race was won by... Uh, Good afternoon, Jackie. Good afternoon, honey. Well, haven't you got a good morning kiss for me this afternoon? Oh, uh, yeah, of course I have. Oh, for the love of Pete, can't that schooner go to stuff wait until I find out who won? Oh, okay. no, Mr. Peters. Here, take the phone. Yeah. Here's your kiss, darling. Oh, hello, Cora. I- I'll tell you the boat I'm betting on as soon as I can pry Dagwood away from Blondie. Oh, come on, folks. Break it out. Oh. Excuse us, Miguel. Excuse us. Now, who won, Dagwood? Uh, I've got Cora hanging on the other end of this phone. Uh, oh, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, now, let me think for a minute. You know, they're going to signal the winner today with one shot from a cannon at the east side wind and two for the west side. Uh, we'll be able to tell right away. Now, hurry up. Yeah, oh, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, now I remember. Yeah, I, I remember who won. Okay, Cora. Yes. And remember that if my boat comes in, we go to the seashore for our vacation. Uh, what is it, that was? Uh, uh, the Navy boat one. The Navy boat, Cora. Yeah. Call you later. Well, I guess that's that. Uh, and I've got nothing to... The Navy boat? Uh, yes. Yeah. What did I say? There's only an east side boat and a west side boat. Oh, wait, Mr. Dithers. Bugs said, uh, what have you done to me? I think I'll go back to sleep again. <laughs> I know you are. I'm going to shrug you to sleep. Oh, wait, wait, Mr. Dithers. There was something in the paper this morning about there being a possibility of a Navy boat being entered. Some of the boys who are sailors got together and were going to rent a boat to row in the race. Yeah, yeah, that's the way it was in my dream. Huh? <gasps> One shot. The east side boat won. No. The west side. Yeah, no. It's the, the, the sailors won. I, I know they won. Yahoo! I'm going to the seashore at last. Oh, this is wonderful. Yes. So long, folks. Yahoo! Oh, oh, my goodness, Mr. Dither certainly is pleased about winning the bet from Cora. Yeah, you know, uh, I just didn't have to a heart to tell Mr. Dither about the rest of my dream, Blondie. Oh, what yeah, was that? Yeah, well, I dreamt that no matter whether Mr. Dither's won or not, Mrs. Dither is still going to make him go to the mountains. <laughs> Where do you late meet the Archie the man you speak and Duffy ain't here. Oh, hello, Duffy. Uh, tonight, uh, Gene Tandy. Mm. Oh, gorgeous. Got a face that could launch a thousand ships, Duffy. Yep, and a pair of legs that'll bring him right back home again. <laughs> Gene Tandy, you seen her in the movies, Duffy. Uh, she's the one your wife once looked like long ago. From far away. <laughs> yeah. Of course, the way your wife is built now, you could make two Jean Tannies out of her and still have enough left over for three Sophie Tuckers and a Charles Lord. <laughs> huh? Why is she coming down here? Uh, uh, maybe because a certain party here is not uh, repugnant to her. <laughs> You know the old saying, Duffy, uh, the lodestone has always drawn to the maggot. <laughs> uh, look, uh, Duffy, the uh, music is just starting. I'll call you back, huh?
Daddy, you know, there's a movie star coming down here tonight, and, uh... What, what, what movie star? As far as I'm concerned, the only movie star, Eddie. The only one that I can truthfully say we was made for each other. Lassie? <laughs> Eddie, you know who I mean. Jean Tierney. Lovely, beauteous, vivacious, cadaverous Jean Tierney. <laughs> ah, she's lovely, Eddie. I can just hear him now. Who? Mr. and Mrs. Lovebug. Mr. Lovebug say, honey, what are we having for dinner tonight? And Mrs. Lovebug, she say, Archie. And he say, what, again? <laughs> now, Mr. Archie, this Gene Turner is a big movie star on Society Girl. All right, rub it in. I ain't Society. And you ain't no movie star. And I ain't handsome. And you ain't got no dough. And I ain't got a lot of clothes. You realize this can go on indefinitely. <laughs> Eddie, you forget that dames like Jean Tinney is fed up with them glamour guys. What they go for is simplicity. You're simple enough. <laughs> so what? So I ain't got no dope, but I'm going to be honest with her. I'll say to her, Jean, here we are. You, a star. I, but a simple, rugged man of the people. I'm poor, yes. But not so poor that I'd be too proud to have you support me. <laughs> you know what could happen if you said that? What? You could be swung on by a star. <laughs> Eddie, don't argue. My mind is made up. Well, okay. If you'd rather be a mule. <laughs> Look, Eddie, a little more respect, please. You have to go back to that again? Well, I suppose I can't force you to respect me. Either you do or you don't. What do you mean? Either you do respect me or you don't work here. <laughs> Honest, sometimes oh, I get... Oh, Archie. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Finnegan. Hey, Arch, could you lend me the loan at five dollars? Lend me the loan. What grammar? Finnegan, loan me the lend of five dollars. <laughs> Besides, what do you need five bucks for? The, to take out an insurance policy. The agent is here. Finnegan, the... you taking out insurance? Well, Arch, the way the agent says... No man with my intelligence should be without protection. Yeah, I agree with him. Uh, yeah. uh, what kind of insurance are you taking out? Uh, accident. Accident, huh? Mm, it's a swell policy, Arch. Only $5 a year, uh, you can walk in front of a truck without getting hit. <laughs> an accident policy means if you get in an accident, the company has to pay you. They do? Yeah. The what, suckers? <laughs> hey, Arch, don't, don't tell the agent about it. He might refuse to sell me the policy. Oh, Finnegan, well, I, I uh, haven't got much more time. Oh, uh, Mr. Hancock. Uh, the, Arch, this is the agent I was telling you about. Archie, meet Sam Hancock. Oh, how do you do? Uh, what uh, company are you with, Mr. Hancock? The Mutual, General Fire and Theft, Liability and Mutual, Fidelity and Mutual, Accident Company, Incorporated. Well, it's a pleasure to know you. It's mutual. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, you see, Mr. Finnegan here is a friend of mine. I would like to know a little more about this policy. Well, it's our newest type of accident policy. Complete all over coverage and sub-coverage, reimbursement rider, premium waiver, with uh, convertible features. Mm -hmm. Well, so far it sounds very dapt. The high art. Uh, what's that convertible thing? Uh, that's in case you get hit by a car with the top down. <laughs> Hmm. I can see you're a man who really understands a lot about insurance. Oh, no more than any other up-to-date intelligent guy. Uh, now, tell me, this policy, uh, is it an endowager policy or uh, uh, parimutuel? <laughs> In other words, uh, what happens if Finnegan is incapacitated by a fatal accident? Well... If the fatality is caused by the insured getting struck by hailstones or meteors while he is walking in an incorporated village or township, my company assumes all costs of interment and funeral up to 10% of the cash surrender value of the policy. <laughs> Provided, of course, that the insured can prove 
that death was unavoidable. <laughs> well, that seems fair enough. Yes, and another thing. We pay instant. The motto of our company is, when rigor mortis sets in, so do we. <laughs> about the money, Mr. Finnegan? Oh, yeah. I How about the five bucks? The five bucks? Well, uh, I, I still, I don't know. I, I have an idea. Until the five dollars is repaid, why doesn't your friend Finnegan make you the beneficiary? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's that, Arch? Well, if I lend you the money and uh, I'm your beneficiary, it means, uh, you know, that if you break a couple of legs or get mangled under a subway train, <laughs> I don't get hurt. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll give you the five. Good. Now, Mr. Finnegan, if you will just step over here, we'll fill out the paper. Okay. Hello, Archie. Hello, What's Mr. What's going w? on here? Uh, well, Finnegan's taking out insurance. Oh, yeah? Well, that's just what Papa and Martin, my mama was fighting about this morning. They was fighting? Another fight, huh? Uh-huh. Your old lady swinging that baseball bat again? Oh, no, it wasn't a serious fight. Just their fist. Uh, what was the fight about? Insurance. Mama feels Papa should take out more life insurance. Why? Well, Archie, even though she can't bear to think of it, she knows that Papa isn't getting any younger. And Well, if any if anything happened to Papa, what, she'd be too old to go to work. And what could she do? Oh, Miss Duffy, nothing's going to happen to your father. Well, Mama's more foresighted than you are. <laughs> She knows the way she's been beating him lately. <laughs> Believe me, the man I marry will carry plenty of insurance. Well, do you think that the guy that marries you would be able to get insurance? <laughs> Why not? Well, do you think he could pass the eye test? <laughs> Archie, that could be an insult. If it ain't, I'll apologize. <laughs> Well, that's better. <laughs> Touche. Uh-huh. So, uh... So, uh, leave us not argue. I, anyhow, I'm in too good a mood tonight. You know, uh, Gene Tinney is coming down oh, here. Oh, running after movie stars again, huh? So what? You're always running after guys. But you're such a snob. You only run after movie stars. At least I'm democratic. I'll run after anybody. <laughs> Look, Miss Duffy, I think who I run after is my own penegative. Daddy Malik and his orchestra play the new dance hit, Dance with the Dolly. Gene Tunney get here yet? I mean, uh, Gene Tunney. Calm, calm down, Mr. Archer. Calm uh, down. Honest, I'm as nervous, nervous as a n- newborn bride. <laughs> uh, hey, wait a minute, Eddie. Here she comes now. Look at her, Eddie. Ain't she the most redundant thing you have ever seen? <laughs> well, good evening, Miss Tunney. So this is Duffy's Tavern, huh? Jean, it was Duffy's Tavern. But what you hear, it has become the bower of beauty. The temple of punkritude. <laughs> Thank you. Are you Archie? I was Archie. But now I am Romeo. <laughs> Young Lockenbox. 
casserole. <laughs> so you're Jean Finney, hmm? Well, I was Jean Finney. And what are you now? Sick to my stomach. <laughs> What do you mean? Bower of beauty, Romeo, Archie. Girl, don't fall for a corny line like that. You know, huh? Miss Tanny, you, you see this little red book here? Yes. See this list of names in it? Yes. Miss Tanny, this is not a milk route. <laughs> However, if you don't like that line, you don't like it. We'll take a breather for a minute and try something else. Uh, by the way, would you care to uh, partake of some refreshment? Okay, I'll take a Coke. A Coke? Oh, no, you know. Eddie, a bottle of our very best champagne from the cellar, that uh, Pipesick 44. <laughs> Sorry, we're all out of champagne. What? Who drunk it up? I don't know. All I know is the last time I was down in the cellar, I saw three blind mice. <laughs> Eddie, please, leave us desist the wisecracks. Miss Tenney is thirsty. Uh, how about a bottle of that uh, fine old Napoleon brandy? Napoleon brandy? We got that? That, that brown bottle on the top shelf. Does that crazy brandy think it's Napoleon again? <laughs> Look, Eddie, please. Oh, gee, never mind. I'll just take a glass of good old-fashioned aqua pura. Aqua pura? Uh, we got any of that left, Eddie? <laughs> yeah, certainly. Mm-hmm. There you are, Miss Tenner. Oh, thank you. Well, Eddie. Well, what? Miss Tenney ordered aqua pura. You're just going to leave her here with the chaser? <laughs> Miss Archie, aqua pure is water. Oh, oh, I guess I was thinking of aqua caliente. <laughs> You're getting in the hot water, but a minute. Hey, Archie. Oh, Miss Duffy, uh, Jean, shake hands with Miss Duffy, the fruit of Duffy's marriage. How do you do? Likewise, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, Miss Tierney, a lot of people have told me that you and I look alike, but now I can see there's a difference. Our hair is different colors. Miss Duffy. Your hair is different colors. <laughs> Hers is natural. Archie, you keep your stupid nose out of this. You, oh, men. Miss Tierney, wouldn't it be wonderful to do without men forever? Honey, are you nuts? <laughs> we could get along without them. Men is only a habit. Just like smoking. Do you smoke? No, I can't get cigarettes either. <laughs> Hello? Oh, just a minute, uh, Miss Duffy, your girlfriend, Vera Fogarty. Oh. Hello, Vera. Said you know who's here? Jean Tierney. Mm-hmm. Standing right next to me. Huh? Well, pretty attractive, but I've seen B-E-T-T-E-R. <laughs> What? Well, I'll tell you the rest of the date when I see you. Huh? Oh, yeah, I'd like to go to the movies. Say, what's playing at the Bijou? Double indemnity? Oh, I don't feel like two pictures. <laughs> what? Oh, well, okay, dear. I'll be there in a few minutes. Goodbye, dear. Well, Miss Tinney, I, I have to run along now. Have fun, Miss Duffy. Oh, I'm just going out with a girl. Who could have fun going out with a girl? I could. <laughs> Good night, Miss Duffy. Good night. Well, Jean, now that we're alone again, uh, how about you and me taking a stroll in the park, huh? Oh, Archie, don't be ridiculous. Cherie. <laughs> Why don't you give up this pretense of frigidity? <laughs> huh? Please. You know that you're in love with me. I certainly am not. A likely story. <laughs> but I think I know what's bothering you. You think that I'm in love with Jean Tierney, the beautiful, wealthy, famous movie star. You're wrong. I'm in love with Jean Tierney, the girl. The beautiful, wealthy, famous girl. <laughs> uh, 
Archie, do you ever hear ringing in your ears? Yes, darling, and it's wedding bells. <laughs> wedding bells? Can you afford to get married? Why not? How much would it cost? Two bucks for a license, ten bucks for the minister, three bucks for a wedding breakfast. I make that kind of dough in a week. <laughs> So, uh, <clears throat> what do you say? Shall we take a little stroll in the park? I'll tell you what, Archie. If you want to take me out, I have an idea. Name it, Jean. Just name it. I the potter, you the clay. <laughs> okay, instead of the park, we'll go to the stork club. The stork club. <laughs> there are storks in the park, you know. <laughs> Archie, it's the stork club or nothing. Mm, uh, I'll be with you in a minute, Jean. It's up to you to help me out now. I gotta get the dough to take this teeny dame to the store club or I'm dead. Absolutely dead. You're dead, huh? How much you need? Fifty bucks. How you want it? Uh, what do you mean? Large or small funeral. <laughs> Stop kidding, Abby. Where am I gonna get fifty bucks? I got uh, How about trying Miss Duffy? I can't. She went to the movies. She had to see that double indemnity. Hey, I just remembered. I'm Finnegan's beneficiary. So? <laughs> Eddie, did you see uh, Double Indemnity? No. Very interesting. Uh, all about two people who knock off a guy for his insurance. Uh, funny I should just happen to think of a picture called Double Indemnity, eh? Yeah. Funny I should just happen to think of a book called Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> Just a second, Eddie. Are you insinuating that I would homicide, Finnegan? I'm just thinking in terms of some little thing, you know, some slight mishap, his arm, maybe, or a small conclusion of the brain. <laughs> Which on Finnegan wouldn't even show. <clears throat> and the agent is still here. I could collect the dough right away. Uh, to me, it sounds Alcatraz. <laughs> Look, don't forget the old pervert, Betty. Fair play near one fair lady. Now, let's see. Uh, what's a good kind of an accident? Uh, I read someplace that 60% of the accidents happen in a bathtub. wonder if I could get Finnegan to take a bath. <laughs> no. There must be an easier way. <laughs> Wait a minute. I got it. Eddie, give me that bung starter. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Oh, uh, Finnegan. Uh, yeah. I, uh, oh, by the way, the accident insurance is all fixed up. So is the accident. <laughs> uh, look, Finnegan, would you mind to help me hang that sign over there? Uh, which one? That one, the one that says, Love thy fellow man. Uh, you just hold it up there while I nail it in. Okay. Atta boy. 
Boy, now hold your hand still. Uh, and hold your head still now. Atta boy. Well, Arch, if you keep hitting me on the head, you're never going to get that sign up. <laughs> This is going to be a tough nut to crack. Uh, Finnegan, uh, would you mind doing me another favor? Uh, what is it, Art? Uh, I want you to go down to the cellar for me. Uh, it's all right. Gee, you're nice today, Art. What do you mean? Uh, usually you ignore me, but today you're so attentive. Yeah, huh? Yeah. Okay, Finnegan, now down in the cellar. Yeah. Uh, here, you go ahead of me. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, be careful you don't fall down the steps, Clifton. Uh, don't worry about me. Good heavens. Finnegan has accidentally fell down the stairs. <laughs> don't kid me. I know what you did. What are you talking? I was just patting me pal on the back. One does not pat one's pal with both hands and a foot. If you didn't already get it, you might as well come back up. (laughs) Boy, this guy is immortal. Hey, Arch, guess what? I fell down the steps. You did? How horrible. Uh, But how come you can fall down a whole flight of stairs and not get hurt? Clean living, Arch. (laughs) This guy is thick skulled all over his body. Uh, wait a minute. Europa, I got it. Uh, Finnegan, uh... Have you tried the free lunch here lately? Free lunch? Ah, uh, nobody eats your free lunch here. But Finnegan, are you a nobody? I'll try it. I'll try it. I'll try it. <clears throat> oh, dear, this is very tasty, Arch. Yeah, go ahead. Keep eating it, uh, Try that laminated herring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, you can... Oh. I think we finally got him, Eddie. Oh, uh, oh, Mr. Hancock, Mr. Hancock. Yes? Oh. Uh, uh, Finnegan here, he's been accidentally food poisoned. Fine, George, he does look pale. Well, uh, I'm the beneficiary. I tell you what, I'll settle for 50 bucks. Okay, okay but uh, first I'll have to make out a report. Now, uh, where did the food come from? Uh, the free lunch. Did the insured eat the free lunch here of his own free will and volition? Yes, sir. Sorry. What's the matter? We do not pay off on attempted suicide. <laughs> Better luck next time. Good night, sir. But wait a minute, Mr. Hancock. Arch, oh. huh? it's getting late. Are we or are we not going to the store? Well, you see, I uh, I just ran out of a little money. Uh, oh, God. Oh, what a rat I am. Look what I done to Finnegan and for nothing. What's wrong? Jean, I got to clean me breast out of this. <laughs> I ain't worthy to kiss the hem of your shoe. You know what I've done? In cold blood, I tried to massacre my best friend. I suppose now you'll never marry me, hmm? Right. I thought so. I should never have done it. Archie, it wasn't what you done. It's on account of what I done three years ago. You too, hmm? <laughs> What did you do? I got married. Good night, Archie. Oh, Boy, it's lucky I found out in time, in addition to a murderer, I would have been a bigamy. <laughs> hey, Arch, you got any more of that free lunch? Finnegan, I thought the free lunch made you sick. No, Arch, I liked it. Well, what was you groaning about? I was groaning about the swell chance I missed. What do you mean? Well, when I fell down them steps, if I would have hurt myself, I'll bet you we could have collected 50 bucks. Tuffy's Tavern, where the elite meet Deed, Archie, the manager speaking. 
Yeah, Duffy, that's right. Next week, uh, Reese Stevens from the opera. Reese. R I S E. Yeah, like the sun races. <laughs> okay. Forces Radio Service. presents the great Gildersleeve. Yeah. <laughs> Kraft Cheese Company, makers of Parquet Margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products, presents Harold Perry as the great Gildersleeve. Kraft brings you the great Gildersleeve every week at this same time, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore, music by Claude Sweeten. Greg Gildersleeve in just a moment. Meanwhile, I'd like to ask, are you cheese hungry? You sometimes kind of hanker for a dish of macaroni with real full cheese flavor all through it? Well, then get Kraft Dinner, the new Kraft Dinner, better than ever. In seven minutes cooking time, this new Kraft Dinner gives you just about the best macaroni and cheese you ever laid fork to. You see, each package of Kraft Dinner gives you a special macaroni that cooks to fluffy tenderness just in boiling water. And there's also plenty of golden Kraft grated a really magic product. With this Kraft grated, you sprinkle swell cheese flavor through and through that macaroni. With Kraft dinner, you make top-notch macaroni and cheese as fast as you make the dinner coffee. Try it soon. Folks who are really fussy about macaroni and cheese rave about the new Kraft dinner. Ask your food dealer tomorrow for several packages of Kraft dinner. summer field in the great gildersleeve like every other town in the land summerfield finds itself on the eve of a national election <laughs> Well, so it goes <laughs> but the hottest discussion in summerfield seems to be over the campaign for mayor so let's drop into the office of the newly reappointed water commissioner and listen in. Don't make me laugh, Judge. Don't make me laugh. Terwilliger may be no rose, but who ever heard of Welsh? Welsh doesn't stand a chance. There, I must beg leave to differ. Art Welsh will be elected mayor of Summerfield on Tuesday next. Art Welsh will be the forgotten man on Tuesday next. Welsh will be elected mayor. You said that before. I say it again. Look, <laughs> Judge, put up or shut up. I'll make you conservative bet at $1,000 that Welsh doesn't come within a mile of being elected. I'll bet you 5000 that he wins with a plurality of over 800 I'll bet you a million he doesn't. I'll bet you $5 million he doesn't. I'll bet you $10 million he doesn't. Well, now you're just talking like a fool. All right, is it a bet? Yeah, it's a bet. $10 million. $10 million. 
Look, Judge, if you want to bet, let's bet. Fifty cents? <laughs> I never bet money on elections. You're afraid. It's against my principles. Judge, if Cyrus P. Terwilliger is not re-elected mayor of this town on Tuesday next, I will personally push a peanut up the middle of Market Street with my nose. My friend, you've got a bet. Uh, make it State Street. Market Street's got cobblestones. <laughs> Miss Marjorie, your uncle's home. Ain't nothing wrong, is it, Miss Gilsey? Wrong? No, why? I just knocked off early because there's nothing being accomplished down at my office. Nothing but a lot of political discussion, and I'm sick of it. Sure is a lot of that. I had it out with the milkman, the ice man, the garbage man, the man that just got lost. Uncle Morris. Well, my dear? You didn't get fired again. Certainly not. Why do you ask? Well, you're home so early. Leroy isn't even home yet. I came home because I thought I'd take the afternoon off if nobody minds. Besides, with this darn election, I can't seem to keep my mind on my work anyway. Uh, what's for dinner, Bertie? Well, dinner ain't for several hours yet. I know. I merely asked. Well, sir, I thought we might have a little lamb this evening. We had a little lamb last night, Bertie. <laughs> yes, sir, but this is a return engagement. Yes, sir. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. No, lamb is good. I merely mentioned it. Hi. Hi, Leroy. Leroy, aren't you home? Oh, or... what happened? Did you get fired again? Fired? Let me make it clear to everybody once and for all, I did not get fired today or any other time. Is that clear? Yes, sir. The only time I got fired, I resigned. Uh, Mr. Gilsey, who are you going to vote for? Bertie, I'm casting my ballot for Cyrus P. Terwilliger. After he fired you out of the water department? A good citizen, my dear, puts his choice for public office above personal considerations. Besides, Terwilliger is also the man who gave me my job back. Let's not be forgetting that. Yeah, Uncle is right. You've got to figure all the angles. He's working for Terwilliger now, so he's got to vote the way he's told. That has nothing whatever to do with it. Are you kidding? Yeah. I am beholden to no man, Leroy. I arrived at this decision as the result of mature consideration and unbiased judgment. Well, I did. How is Judge Hooker voting? The judge is a big sorehead. He votes like a sorehead. Forgive and forget. That's my motto. Oh, Mr. Gillsleeve, you had not a vote for that man. Bertie's right. I'm surprised at you, Uncle Morris. Who are you to be surprised at me, young lady? I'll ask you to remember I'm your uncle. If anybody's going to be surprised around here, I'll be surprised. Well, I don't care. Francie's father says Mayor Terwilliger is no good. That's right. He's no good. And if you don't believe it, ask the ice man. <laughs> <laughs> Francie's father says Mayor Terwilliger is a disgrace to Summerfield. I don't care what Francie's father says. He says he wouldn't vote for Terwilliger if he was the last man on earth. Well, I wouldn't vote for Francie's father, so there. Ye gods, can't a man have any peace around here? I come home early from the office because I can't stand all the politics, and what do I get? By George, I'm going out. Bertie, what time is dinner? Well, I thought if you didn't mind, Mr. Gilsey, I got a meeting at my club tonight. And, oh? Uh, we were going to sort of run over the candidates and the issues, oh, so... Oh, my goodness. I thought if you didn't mind, we'd have dinner a little early, around 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock. Don't mind me. Maybe I'll be back and maybe I won't. <laughs> Hi, Commissioner. Huh? Oh, hello, Floyd. Where are you tearing off to? Nowhere, Floyd. Just trying to get a little peace and quiet. Well, come on in here. I'll give you a hot towel. Well, hot towel sounds good. You'll promise not to sell me any politics along with it. Uh, don't worry. Here, let me have your coat. Okay. There. Climb right up in the chair and lay down, Commissioner. Thank you. <sighs> this wouldn't be a bad place to spend the day. Well, suit yourself. We can start at the top of the price list and give you the works. Just a hot towel, Floyd. But keep it nonpartisan. That's me. I'm going to vote for Artie Welch, but I'll be quiet about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, the moonlight's fair tonight along the Wabash. Uh, confounded, Floyd. Why Artie Welch? Thought you wanted to stay off that subject. Well, I do. But when I see a man planning to vote wrong, uh, Artie a customer of yours? Nope. Gets his hair cut over on State Street. Well, then I should think you'd vote for Terwilliger. Why don't you? Terwilliger don't tip. Terwilliger. Floyd, that's no way to analyze public issues. Issues? That's something else again. When it comes to foreign policy, I'm a regular H.V. Cottonborn. Yeah, well, I'll get that on the radio. I don't see how you figure that a man like Welch is qualified to be mayor of this town. Terwilliger is a real administrator. Mr. Gildersleeve, if I was Terwilliger's water commissioner, I'd say the same. That has nothing to do with it. 
Well, it just doesn't measure up, that's all. How do you decide on a candidate anyway, Floyd? Just flip a coin? Now, Mr. Gildersleeve, I'm a pretty conscientious citizen. I got my own system of picking candidates, and it's a pretty good one. Yeah, what is it? Well, it involves the wife, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, that's nothing to be ashamed of. That's fine. Good idea for a man and his wife to talk these things over. I guess you never met Mrs. Munson, did you? Uh, well, no, I never did. Why? Well, I don't like to knock her. She's okay, as women go. I never had any regrets, particularly. <laughs> of course, once in a while, she might pass a remark that's a little uncalled for, but then I'm no angel. She knows that, too. <laughs> What's all this got to do with voting? Oh, I'm coming to that. Like I say, the babe is okay most ways, keeps the house clean, she don't throw money around, and she's a fair cook, if you like everything fried. <laughs> But on politics, brother, they never should have given her the ballot. And why do you consult with her about your vote? I don't. I just ask her how she's going to vote, and I vote the opposite. Uh. <laughs> Lloyd, you're a political ignoramus. I ain't dumb enough to vote for Terwilliger. Oh, let me out of here. I thought you wanted a hot Let cat. me out of here. Ye gods, can't I go any place without having politics shoved down my throat? <laughs> man. Yeah, try to be. Let me sit here. Let me sit here and get a little peace and quiet, will you? Certainly. Uh, trouble at home, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, not exactly, PV. I was driven out of my house by a political argument, if you must know. I'm looking for a place where people don't argue with me about who's going to beat whose brains out tomorrow. Well, you're very welcome here. <laughs> Thank goodness for one man that doesn't give a hoot about politics. No, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I've got my opinions, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, well, just keep your opinions to yourself. Oh, I do. I believe in the secret ballot. Well, it's a great institution, the secret ballot, Peavy. Keystone of democracy. Uh, you voting for Terwilliger, Peavy? Terwilliger's an excellent man. <laughs> You wouldn't vote for Welsh, though, would you? He's an excellent man. <laughs> Terwilliger is a fine administrator, though, Peavy. I like the fellows back of him, too. But who's back of Welsh? Well, I hear he has some very fine people supporting him. Confounded, Peavy. To hear you talk, I'm beginning to think you're for Welsh. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> you're for Terwilliger. Well, I wouldn't say that either. <laughs> There's only two people running for mayor, Peavy. Who are you for? And for the secret ballot. Yes, sir. <laughs> How can we discuss this sensibly if you won't tell me who you're for? Well, I prefer to listen to arguments for both candidates, Mr. Gildersleeve. So does Mrs. Peavy. Well, there aren't any arguments for Welsh, Peavy. People who vote for Welsh, Welsh are simply voting from blind prejudice. Uh, that's no argument, Mr. Gildersleeve. Terwilliger is a fine man. He has a fine record. He's been a public servant for 20 years. I'm very happy to endorse him personally. And coming from a water commissioner, that's no argument either. I resent that. <laughs> Terwilliger has at no time attempted to influence my vote. What honesty. Why, that's an argument in itself. You think so? Well, hey, Judge Hooker. Yeah, uh, political spy. <laughs> what are you doing in here, you old goat? <laughs> what are you doing? Trying to get Peavy to vote for your friend Terwilliger? We were discussing the situation, pro and con. Well, Peavy, I'll give you the lowdown. Mr. Gildersleeve made a bet with me. If Terwilliger loses, Gildy's got to push a peanut up State Street with his nose. Well, now, that's something I'd like to see. Maybe I'll vote for Mr. Welsh. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Hooker, you're an unscrupulous campaigner. <laughs> Don't forget, Gildy, all's fair in love and politics. Yeah. <laughs> Let me in, Eve. Let me in. They're after me. Oh, I don't see any... There. Well, who's after you? <laughs> Nobody. Joke. Oh, Throckmorton, you fool. <laughs> <laughs> what you doing, Eve? Oh, nothing, really. 
I just got home and I built a fire and I was going to make some tea and just relax. Will you come in? Well, if you insist. Ah, uh, a crackling fire. Mm-hmm. Do you want to sit there? Well, I know. Uh, let's pull the sofa over, huh? Let's pull it up in front of the fire so we can... That's not a sofa, Throckmorton. It's a love seat. Who am I to argue? <laughs> Here, well, I'll do that, Eve. Let me. Oh, you can't handle it all alone. No, you watch me. Nothing but a little... Uh, nothing but a little... Love seat. <laughs> You're wonderful. Now, you sit down and enjoy the fire while I go and... Eve. I'll be right back. I'm just going to make the tea. Oh, forget the tea. Well, if you don't want it. That's the girl. Sit down. <sighs> hmm. <laughs> nice here, isn't it? Nice. Now, Throckmorton. <laughs> I seem to have to keep reminding you we're not engaged anymore. Well, there's no harm in holding a girl's hand, is there? Just a friendly gesture. Doesn't mean anything. Doesn't it? Not a thing. Very well, then. We agreed, you remember, that all that was over and done with. Over and done with. Seriously, Eve, you don't know what it means to me to be able to come here this afternoon and spend a few quiet moments with you. Far from the madding crowd, far from strife and strain. A man needs that. I know. A man needs a place he can come to. A refuge. So nice and quiet here. So warm. So friendly. And you're so understanding. Now, Throckmorton. All right, we'll just hold on. <laughs> Maybe later, though, huh? A little kiss, if I'm good. We'll see. You know what I like to do? I like to sit here in the afternoon with the radio on and listen to good music. Only there's so little good music on the radio these days. Nothing but politics. Yeah, that's all you hear anyplace. By the way, Throckmorton, I haven't asked you, how are you voting? <laughs> now, Eve, I didn't come here to talk politics. But how are you voting? I'd like to know. Well, I'm voting for Terwilliger for mayor, Apted for Congress, Terwill Lynch... Terwilliger, you're voting for Terwilliger. Well, I... Let go of my hand, Throckmorton. Oh, but Eve... Let go. Gosh, if it means so much to Eve, I'll vote for Welsh. Only don't spoil everything. I will not hold hands with a man whose political principles mean no more to him than that. Let go. Oh, nuts. There goes the whole darn afternoon. Ye gods, I wish this election were over. <laughs> Fred Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. And uh, speaking of seconds, everybody at your dinner table will pass their plates for seconds when you serve the new Kraft Dinner. I mean the new Kraft Dinner. Delicious macaroni and cheese. Fluffy light with real satisfying cheese flavor through and through it. It's a delight to folks who hanker for cheese these days. And of course, with Kraft Dinner, you make this marvelous macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. You see, each package of Kraft Dinner gives you the special macaroni that gets tender and light just in boiling water. Never any heavy, starchy taste with Kraft Dinner macaroni. The box also gives you a big, generous packet of golden Kraft grated. It puts really swell cheese flavor through and through that macaroni in a jiffy. So try the new Kraft Dinner tomorrow. You'd better get several packages so you'll have some on the pantry shelf, ready to cook really marvelous macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes. <laughs> Let's return to Summerfield and the Great Gildersleeve. Comes the dawn of Tuesday, November 7th, and what a day for an election. Since early morning, the rain has come down in torrents. Gildersleeve has spent a good part of the day standing at the front window waiting for the rain to let up and trying to summon up enough enterprise to go out in it. Now, in desperation, he goes to the phone and calls up Judge Hooker. Hello, Judge. Yeah, fine day for ducks. Look, Judge, I've been thinking. As long as the weather is so bad and you and I are going to vote on opposite sides anyway... Why don't we make a deal? If you don't go to the polls, I won't go to the polls. And that way, we'll just cancel each other out. Yeah, how about it? Great. No use getting wet for nothing. Okay, Judge. Consider your vote canceled. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. If I don't watch out, I'm going to be a genius. Why didn't I think of that before? 
Now I can go take a nap with a clear conscience. You mean you're not going to vote? You're not going to vote at all? Well, I don't need to, my dear. It may be better than voting for Terwilliger at that. (laughs) The judge and I see just opposite on everything. So by staying away from the polls, we merely cancel out each other's vote. What if everybody in the country were as lazy as that? Laziness has nothing to do with it. Plain common sense. You see what the weather's like. Man could catch cold out there. (coughs) It's our duty in these times to... Our duty in these times to guard our health. Besides, I'm down to my last A ticket. Uh, excuse me if I go out the front way, Mr. Gilsey. There's a lake around the back stoop. Oh, where are you going, Bertie? Going out to vote. I told you, Bertie, if you wait a little while, it'll clear up. I've waited all I can wait. I'm going to get down there before they run out of ballots. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that, Bertie. They got ballots enough for everybody. I don't care. If I was to wait, maybe I'd get took with appendicitis or something so I couldn't vote. But if you go out, you'll get wet. Oh, a little water never hurt nobody. Got my umbrella and got my galoshes and I got my sample ballot. Well, gosh, Bertie, I'd be glad to drive you down there, but I'm down to my last gas ticket. What's in the tank has got to last me till the new ones come due. Oh, that'll be all right, Miss Gilsey, if I don't mind. Tell you what, Bertie, why don't you and Lily B do what Judge Hooker and I are doing? Just cancel out each other's vote. No, Mr. Gilsey, you can't talk me out of it. My mind's made up. I got my candidates and got my issues straight for once, and I'm ready. I got to vote while the spirit's on me. <laughs> yes, sir, I'm exercising my franchise. Hallelujah! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's a fine woman. Fine woman. Well, what are you children staring at? I'd have driven her down there, only I haven't got any gas. None to speak of. Don't you see, if the judge doesn't vote and I don't vote, it comes out even, just the same, doesn't it? Marge, we go upstairs and write a letter or something, will you? You make me nervous. I'm going. Don't worry. Only wish I were 21, that's all. (laughs) Well, Leroy? I didn't say anything. I know. It's not like you. Go play in the cellar or something, will you? I'd like to be alone. Can I use your saw? Anything, only don't stand around there watching me. Okay, I got an idea for a super machine gun. Don't saw any nails. Yes, yes. What a day. Rain, rain, rain. If it had been a decent day, it would have been different. Be glad to vote. A day like this, a man could catch cold. Little Leroy. Leroy! (laughs) That's the last time he uses my saw. Uh, Front door. I wonder who that is. Excuse me, do you have the boss? Oh, yes. Come in, quickly. I just wiped the feet. Uh, Hurry up, it's wet. Oh, <laughs> those my pants? All cleaned and pressed. I covered with newspaper so it doesn't get wet. Oh, well, fine. That's, that's, thank you. How much is that? It's 75 cents. Let's uh, see if I got it here. Quite a day, isn't it? Oh, it's a fine day. Huh? Well, a little rain, but who cares? You know something? Today I'm an American. <sighs> to, what, oh, you mean you're a citizen? Oh, I got my citizen papers eight months ago. But today, for the first time, I vote. Oh. That's a great thing, you know, to vote. Yeah, I guess it is. Sure. In the country I come from, nobody votes. There, a man doesn't even open his mouth. And why? He's afraid. Here, nobody is afraid. He votes, so I vote. Well, that's fine. Sure. Six o'clock this morning, I vote. Maybe it rains a little. What do I care? They open the polls, I'm the first man in. The first man in Summerfield to vote. That's me, Morgan. Uh, what'd you say your name was? Well, uh, my real name, it's a little difficult. Uh, Megunin. Who can say that? So I choose a nice American name, Morgan. What was wrong with Rockefeller? Uh, Rockefeller. Uh, that's a little hard for some people to say, too. What's the difference? My friends call me Leo, so that's how I vote. Leo Morgan. You know, I'm so excited. I walk in there and I say, good morning. I've come to vote. So they say, just a minute, what is your name? Like I was a foreigner or something. So I say, Leo Morgan, I'm a citizen. So then they look in a big book, and I'm getting worried. Maybe they forgot me. Maybe I didn't do something I should. Oh, I'm so worried. And then what do you think? I'm in the book. Great. Yeah, me, Morgan. (laughs) Me, Morgan. 
imagine I'm in the book, so I sign my name. I did, I did, I. And the gentleman, he gives me a big ballot all my own, and he takes me to a little, uh, like a little room. Uh, a booth. Uh, that's right, a booth. All by myself. Nobody else. It's fine. The gentleman says to me, take your time. I say, thank you very much. And he pulls the curtain so I won't be bothered. Such privacy. I'm not used to it. At home, we used to sleep far in a room. So, uh, I'm all alone in there. I did, I did, I. I take my time and I look over my ballot and I vote. Maybe I didn't vote right, but I voted. And whoever gets elected, that's my president. Well, Morgan, by George, you're all right. Sure, I'm all right. And I'll tell you another thing. This country is all right. Hey, Unc. Oh, oh, Leroy. Uh, come here, my boy. You know Mr. Uh, Morgan here? Oh, hi. <laughs> Your boy? Uh, he's my nephew. Fine boy. He'll be voting too one of these days, huh? Uh, yes, I suppose so. Yeah, I got a son, uh, Gregory. Uh, Gregor, a little younger. He goes to school. Gregory? I know him. He's in the 4A. A little punk. Yeah, a little punk. Yeah, I know him. That's my Gregory. Well, I, I should be leaving. I talk too much. Oh, not at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm very glad you dropped in, Mr. Oh, I get so excited, I forget the pants. Here. Oh, yes, thanks. <laughs> Goodbye. Uh, Goodbye. What's the matter, Unc? Uh, nothing, Leroy. I wonder if you'd be good enough to run upstairs to my room and get my car keys. Sure. You going someplace, Unc? Yes, Leroy. I'm going to vote. Yeah, can I go with you? I don't see why not. Hey, 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 wait. What about Judge Hooker? Uh, Hooker? What about him? Well, you made a deal, didn't you? Are you going to tell the judge you're voting? There's an old saying, Leroy, invented by Judge Hooker. Quote, all's fair in love and politics. Unquote. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Floyd, close up the barbershop and get in the car. I'll take you to the polls. I'm still voting for Artie Welch, you know. I don't care if you're voting for McKinley. Come on and vote. Come on, fold up your umbrella, PB, and get in. Oh, thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. By the way, I'm voting for... I don't care, PB. This is a nonpartisan patriotic bus service. Here we go. Put on your old gray bonnet with the blue ribbon on it, and we're here so proud to the shade. Well, here's my ballot, Mrs. Farquhar. Do, uh, do I have to fold it? Yes, Mr. Gildersleeve, right up to the dotted line. Oh, yes. Well, thank you. Well, I feel like a citizen. Uh, you know, Mrs. F., I pulled a fast one on Judge Hooker. He and I were going to vote opposite ways, so I made a deal with him that neither of us would vote. Oh, you shouldn't do that. No good citizen would. I know that, Mrs. Farquhar, but all's fair in love and politics. Besides, if I'm patriotic and the judge isn't, well, that's just too bad. Don't worry about the judge's patriotism. He voted at 9 o'clock this morning. Oh! <laughs> Why, that double-crosser. He isn't patriotic. He's just a crook. Ladies and gentlemen, the returns aren't in yet. I may have to push a peanut up State Street with my nose. <laughs> but at least I voted. You know, there are people in this world who haven't the chance to vote. They know that privilege, and they know what it's worth. Here in this country, we're inclined to take it for granted. But now that the Japs and the Germans are trying to take that right away from us, look at how this country is willing to fight for it. Well, if it's worth fighting for, it's worth going to the polls for Get out and vote on Tuesday, and don't let anything stop you. Good night. Music on the 
this program was directed by Claude Sweet. And this is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Kraft invites you to listen again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Here's special news about a wonderfully nourishing cheese food the whole family loves. A cheese food you can serve in a hundred or more tempting ways. It's Pabstet. Yes, Pabstet, the delicious golden cheese food. Look for it in the familiar round flat package. Pabstet spreads like butter at room temperature, slices neatly when chilled, melts with luscious smoothness into an appetizing sauce you pour over macaroni, hot vegetables, chicken, and fish. Pabstet spreads and toasts to perfection, makes grand sandwiches and snacks. And it's also swell for dessert. Try Pabstead melted on apple pie. It's delicious. To all those mealtime, lunchtime treats, Pabstead adds its nourishing goodness of food energy, milk protein, milk minerals, vitamin A and vitamin G, also called riboflavin. Tomorrow, buy Pabstead, the delicious golden cheese food. Don't forget, you ask for Pabstead. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Abbott and Costello program brought to you by Camel, the cigarette that's first in the service according to actual sales records. See if your throat and your taste don't make Camel a first with you, too. Find out for yourself. Listen to the great rhythms of Freddie Rich and his orchestra, the swingy singing of Connie Haynes. And this being Thanksgiving Day, we recall this touching scene. As the good ship Mayflower landed at Plymouth Rock, the captain shouted to the Indian chief, Costello, Costello, do you realize it's 7 o'clock? Where have you been? Oh, Abbott, I just came from your house. And have I got news for you? What is it? Your cat just had chicken. My cat had chicken? <laughs> yep. My cat had chicken? Yep. You mean kittens. Cats <laughs> don't have chicken. Uh, what was that you brought home in a paper bag last night? Uh, chickens. Well, your cat just had them. I... <laughs> you mean that cat ate my chickens? <laughs> he swallowed the chickens, bag and all. Why, why didn't you take them away from him? Well, you know me, Abbott. I ain't the type that would let the bag out of the cat. Oh, I think well, I'm wrong, huh? Yes. Well, I've got plenty of other food around the house. Well, by the way, Abbott... What? Seeing that this is Thanksgiving Day... Yes? I, I hate to think of you eating alone. What do you mean? What do you say to having Thanksgiving dinner with me? Well, why, that's uh, mighty fine of you, Costello. Good. Uh, at what time? Eight o'clock at your house. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. You get... No, no, you'll get no turkey at my house. Then how about a little duck? A uh, duck? Yeah, that's a chicken with snowshoes on. Hey, uh, look... <laughs> I'm sorry, Costello. You can't come to my house for Thanksgiving. I'm having a dinner for the snooty set. Oh, the snooty set. You heard me. No, I'm not good enough to eat with pigs. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Will you listen to me, please? I'm listening. Tonight I'm entertaining a few of the 400. A few of the 400? Yes. That's 800 all together. Uh, no, 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 no. Just the 400. That's what I said. That's what I said. That's your line. Yes. Thank you. Well? Well, just because they weigh a little more than me, that don't make them any better than I am. No, no, no. Talk, talk sense, please. I, I couldn't have you at my house. This is going to be a very classy affair. Why, I have a, I have a little silver tray to brush the crumbs on. Crumbs? Mm-hmm. Certainly, don't you have crumbs at your table? Sure, Rabbit. You're welcome any time. No, 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 no. <laughs> there you go. You have absolutely no finesse. No what? I said you have no finesse. What would I do with a finesse? In California, you don't need a furnace. <laughs> if, if it gets cold, we turn on the gas heater. All right, Cousin. Look, I didn't say... Or the radiator. Right, look, 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 look. I didn't say... He's getting like boy, yeah. yeah all right, look, look, please. I... Furnace. Yeah, all right, all right. I didn't say furnace in the first place. I said finesse. Furnace. Look. You don't know what you're saying. All right, you're getting me all mixed up here. Look, I'm trying to tell you... Listen to me, please. <laughs> Your table manners are terrible. The yeah. last time you had dinner at my house, you did nothing but reach across the table and grab for the food. Well, what was wrong with that? What was wrong with that? <laughs> You've got a tongue, haven't you? Yeah, but I can reach further with my arm. 
There you go again, Costello. You see, you know nothing at all about the proper way to eat. You have no etiquette. I got no what? You have no etiquette. Etiquette? Yes, you heard me. You don't even know how to say the word etiquette. Yeah. You don't. What do you, you mean? You mean antiquity. And uh, now, <laughs> it's, it's etiquette. Well, etiquette, antiquity, it's the same All thing right, anyway. All right, so what? Well, I'll go out and I'll buy one of them books on etiquette by Emily Piller. Emily Piller? Yeah. That's, uh, that's Emily Post. Okay, I'll read the both of them. Both of them. I'll go from pillar to post. <laughs> well, you should read that book, Costello. Mm. It will tell you a lot of things. For instance, which is uh, proper to use when eating peas, a fork or a spoon? I, I don't use either one. Well, how do you eat your peas? Oh, I just slide my lower lip under the plate and bank the peas off the mashed potatoes. <laughs> Costello. Sometimes the mashed potatoes got in my ears. Yes, I can imagine. <laughs> Sloppy, huh? Yeah, yeah. Costello, you haven't got the brains of a two-year-old child. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Why not? Look at the difference in our ages. <laughs> the way you act, I could never have you at my table. Look, Abbott, if you know so much about manners, just answer me this one thing. What is it? Which hand do you stir your coffee with? I stir my coffee with my right hand. That's funny. Most people use a spoon. <laughs> Now, that settles it, Costello. You ain't got no etiquette. Yeah, that settles everything. I was just about to break down and invite you for dinner. But now you had to be a smart aleck, didn't wait, you? Wait a minute, Abbott. Yeah, you did. Wait a minute. Now. You're my old pal. I can't help it. You can't do this to me. Well, I did. You've got to invite me to dinner on Thanksgiving. I ain't got no place to go. Well, I'm sorry. You can't let your old friend starve. Ah. Look at me, Abbott. Yeah. I only weigh 90 pounds now. Uh, uh, 90 pounds? Why, you're 56 inches around the waist. Yeah, but I'm hollow. I, all right, look. <laughs> ah, look, all right, all right. You can come to dinner, Costello. But you'll have to make yourself useful. Now, get there early and wait on the table. Well, why should I wait on a table? Why can't I wait in Apollo with the rest of the people? <laughs> no, no, you dummy. I mean, I want I you... I want to sit on your table Listen, waiting. I mean, I want you to help with the serving. Now, the first uh, the first course will be hors d'oeuvres. Of course, you know what hors d'oeuvres are. Yeah, that's French for leftovers. No, no. <laughs> Costello, hors d'oeuvres are snacks. Now, you take care of the ladies first. It's, uh, it's up to you to see that each lady gets a snack. Are the husbands going to be there? Uh, certainly. Then I ain't going to do it. What? Uh, do what? I ain't going to go around snacking the ladies. <laughs> Their husbands are liable to come around and snack me. Uh, on second thought, you'd better stay out in the kitchen and help with the oyster dressing. Why, Abbott. What's the matter? What you said. Well, what, what, what's wrong? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Talking that way to a boy of my age. What do you mean? I'm just at the age of picking things up like well, that. Well, what's too. wrong? Why, it's a good thing my mother isn't here. Oh, the shame of it all. What are you talking about? How dare you ask me to help with the oyster dressing? What do you mean? Now, look at it. I didn't mind when you said I had to wait for you on a table. And I was only mildly surprised when you asked me to snack all the ladies, especially in front of their husbands. But when you have the nerve to ask me to go out in the kitchen and dress a bunch of naked oysters, you not only humilify me, but you have impugned on my good name. Tomorrow on the back cover of Life magazine, you'll see a very stirring set of pictures under the title, Pair of Aces Back to Back. A Navy dauntless dive bomber attacking a Japanese carrier. Notice, too, the pair of flyers, the pair of aces in the lower left-hand corner. And read the words they're saying. I quote, Camel's Our Cigarette. Suits the throat and the taste to a T. Unquote. C-A-M-E-L-F. Camels, they're aces with the aces. Could be with you, too. Here is Freddie Rich with Java Junction.
with a lot of shot man, shot now, and a mammy could have been beloved to shot man, bread, a mammy could have been beloved to shot man, a shot man. Now, Stella, now, Stella, you have to cut out that singing in the kitchen. You're disturbing the guests. Whatever, well, I always sing when I'm making sour milk biscuits. Sour milk biscuits? Sure. We haven't got any sour milk. Well, you will have when I get through singing. A mammy's little baby loves shotner and shotner. All right, uh, Nelson Eddie better save his money. All right, look. <laughs> cut, the, cut that out. Look, what are you doing there? What's all that stuff you're putting in? How to do it? What did she say? First, I got to put in two tubs of butter. Two tubs of butter? Sure, it says right here in the cookbook. Butter, two TBS tubs. Uh, <laughs> that's tablespoon. I threw them in two. You threw... Uh, <laughs> what else did you put in there? I put in some flour, salt, yeah. bacon powder, and three gallops of molasses. Three gallops? What are gallops? You know, Abbott, when you pour the molasses out of the jug, it goes gallop, gallop, gallop. <laughs> I, I put in three of those. Look, Costello, I, I don't want you to do any cooking. I've got a chef coming here to take care of that. I, I thought you'd be out here singeing the feathers off the goose. Doing what? Singeing, singeing. Don't you know how to singe? Sure, I know how to singe. I was singeing when you came in. A man is made up, baby. No, 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 no. I'm Cass. a good singer. Yeah, no, 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 no. Singe, singeing gets the down off the goose. Didn't you ever get down off a goose? No. No. Did you read that right? Yeah. Well, didn't you? Did I ever what? Didn't you ever get down off a goose? No, I got down off a horse. No, no. no, no, no. I never rode a goose. No. Hey, that was Wait a Oh, thank goodness. Here comes the chef. I am a run short on the cooking I'm at the end. Kitchell, don't tell me that you're the cook. Mm, yeah, could be, yeah. You know something over in Paris? I am known as the famous French chef, Pierre René. You're the great René? That I am, yes. Yeah. And what are you doing in California? Oh, I always come here in the René season. <laughs> the René season? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's a washout. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind that, Costello. Look. We've got to get my Thanksgiving dinner cooked, please. Yes. Kitzel, you'll find all the utensils in that big cupboard over there. Oh, pish pash utensils, utensils. Who needs your utensils? I brought along my own pot. That's the first pot I ever saw with a belt around it. Uh, uh, <laughs> Costello, please keep out of this. Kitzel, do you know uh, anything about cooking game? Do I know how to cook game? Why, I'm cooking the finest pinochle you ever tasted. You uh, cook pinochle? Sure, pinochle and sauerkraut. Oh, <laughs> Look, Kissel, I don't want to get personal, but why don't you pull in your tongue? Nobody ordered cold cuts. Ooh. Look, never mind that, Costello. Kissel, get busy, please, and get the dinner ready. No, no, no. Just a second, just a second, my little man. Don't get excited. First, I got to open my little bag and get out my chisels and saws. What chisels and saws? Cream chisels and cranberry sauce. <laughs> You know, Kitzel, it's too bad you didn't bring your monkey wrench. Well, for goodness sake, what would I be doing with a monkey wrench? Well, you could tighten the nuts on a fruitcake. Now, <laughs> 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 uh, Costello, please. Uh, will you get busy and help, Kitzel? I'm going into the living room and see if any of my guests have arrived yet. <laughs> Sebastian! Sebastian! Shut off that radio! Shut it off! Mm, my Sebastian. Well, I just come over to help you out, Uncle Bud, and I thought the guest would like some nice romantic music. Romantic music? Mm -hmm. Oh, that tiger isn't romantic music. It is to another tiger. All right. <laughs> now, look, Sebastian, if you're going to hang around here, you'll have to behave yourself. Now, this is going to be a very formal Thanksgiving dinner. The men will all wear tails. Tails? Who's coming? Mickey Mouse? Now, <laughs> will you please listen, Sebastian? It will be your job to usher the people into the dining room. I will sit at the head of the table. Ken Niles will sit on my right hand, and Connie Haynes will sit on my left hand. Ken Niles is going to sit on your right hand? That's right. And Connie Haynes will sit on your left hand? That's right. How are you going to eat? With your feet? No, no, no. <laughs> Look, when you get all the people seated, you go to the kitchen. Then when I ring this little dinner bell, your brother will hand me the carving knife, and you give me the bird. In front of everybody? <laughs> <laughs> That'll do, Sebastian. Now, go out in the kitchen and uh, make some ice water. And I do hope you can make ice water. Yeah, sure. You just peel an onion. An onion? Yeah, that'll make your eyes water. <laughs> Sebastian, ice water is frozen water. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Then what is frozen ink? I stink. Uh, uh, You'll get no argument out of me, brother. Ah, uh, what? <laughs> Come. 
Sonny Haynes in a current revival of a great song, The Sunny Side of the Street. Grab your coat and get your hat. Leave your worry on the doorstep. Just direct your feet to the sunny side of the street. Can't you hear a bit of pain? And that happy tune is yourself. Life can be so sweet on the sunny side of the street. I used to walk in the shade with those blues on the red. But I'm not afraid. This rubber crossed over. If I never have a thing, I'll be rich as Rockefeller. So dust at my feet on the sunny side of the street. read in the papers how people are smoking so much more and how cigarettes are being shipped to our fighting men overseas in huge quantities. And if your dealer occasionally should say, sorry, sir, we're out of camels today, don't let that stop you from asking for camels the very next time you're buying cigarettes. Remember that camels' rich, full flavor and kind, cool mildness make camels worth asking for again and again. Because war or peace, camel is still camel. And your T-Zone, that's T for taste and T for throat, will confirm that statement. C-A-M-E-L-S. Camels, now as always, the cigarette of costlier tobaccos. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we take you to the home of Bud Abbott, where a formal Thanksgiving dinner is about to be served. Costello has been working in the kitchen all day like a dog, but he is now ready to face the guests. Let us look in on this dog face. <laughs> Costello, Costello, the guests are arriving. Open the door and announce them as they come in. Announcing Mr. and Mrs. Ned Blank, Mr. and Mrs. Phil Kresner. Announcing Lord Hipsqueak, Knight of the Garter, Lord Beaverport, Knight of the Bath, and Hedy Lamar. Uh, Hedy Lamar isn't here. I was thinking of another night. <laughs> Young man, how dare you leave me standing here? Kindly take my card and announce me. Okay. Hillside, 2183. Ask for Hazel. <laughs> if a man answers, hang up. Oh. Wrong card! Wrong card! That isn't my card. I'm sorry, I got that mixed up with one of my own. Uh, Costello, watch your manners. Okay. This is Lady uh, Jennifer uh, Cookie Cutter. <laughs> That's right, old boy. My home, you know, is at Glen Dinning on the Tyne. Glen Dinning on the Tyne? Then you must know my great aunt Harriet. The old girl is bowling you know. Oh, from Glen Dinning on the Tyne? No, from hitchhiking on oil trucks. <laughs> All right, that's enough, Costello. Take uh, Lady Jennifer's coat and I'll escort her to the table. Oh, by all means, the table. Oh, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Yeah, Costello! Costello, get that horse out of here. Get out of here. Get, get out, out, of out of here. Get out of here. And uh, please, please, bring Lady Jennifer a cocktail. Yes, uh, make it a martini uh, with a black olive. You drink martinis with a black olive? Yes, I'm in mourning for my husband. <laughs> If I was you, Lady Jennifer, I would lay off those martinis. They're pretty hot. Costello, what makes you think they're hot? Because I just poured one. When I dropped the olive in, the olive stuck out its pimento. <laughs> oh, oh, by the way, Mr. Car Mr. Rabbit, I have a little uh, Thanksgiving present for you. A nice fat 
Belgian hair. I raised them, you know. Oh, thank you, Lady Jennifer. Costello, take Lady Jennifer's hair. Take her what? Take her hair and put it in the icebox. <laughs> okay, have it. Woo, 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 you fool! Hey, Costello, now look what you've done. Speak to Lady Jennifer. Hello, Baldy. <laughs> I've never been so insulted in all my life. Come, Lady Jennifer. I'll show you under the table. Uh, I'll show you... Uh... Get the line right, not under that table. No, no, I'm sorry, Mrs. Jennifer. I'll show you to the table. Very well. You may take my arm. Does that come off, too? Yes. <laughs> Costello, get busy and serve the dinner. And remember, I don't want to see your thumb in the soup. Okay. Lord okay. Beaverbrook. Uh, Bord, I pardon me, Mr. Beaver, Bord. Right, right. It's quite all right, please. Uh, what part of the turkey would you like? Well, I'm a flyer. I'll take the wing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Freddie Rich. Well, uh, I'm a musician. I'll take the drumstick. And, Sebastian, what part of the turkey would you like? Well, you can skip me. I'm a dead end kid. <laughs> I hope somebody will remember me. I like the neck. I like the neck, too, Connie. I'll meet you out on the front porch. <laughs> That's got to keep quiet and save the soup. And remember, I don't want to see your thumb in it. Okay, I'll fix that. Oh! Somebody turn off the light! Quick, turn on the light, somebody! There, the lights are on. Oh! What's the trouble, Lady Jennifer? Oh, my necklace is gone! Somebody stole my pearl necklace! Quick, Estelle, call the police! Please! Well, no, 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 no! No, no, use the French phone. I don't speak French. Oh, here. <laughs> please, here, I'll call him. Operator, give me the police. Hurry up. Hello, police department. This is Bud Abbott's home. There's been a robbery here. Come over at once. Well, here we are. We're from headquarters. What took you so long? <laughs> I so long. said, what took you so long? So long? What, are you leaving already? <laughs> Now, shut up, you. You look suspicious. Stick up your hands and reach for the ceiling. Okay, but I know I won't make it. I have... <laughs> Officer, there's been a robbery here. The lights went out and somebody stole Lady Jennifer's pearl necklace. <laughs> a stolen necklace, eh? Somebody will get the jug for this. <laughs> Sounds like you've had it already. <laughs> come on, come on. Line up against the wall and you too, fat boy. What's your name? Honest Luke Costello. <laughs> Costello, eh? Ain't you got a relative uh, doing time at Alcatraz? Yes, sir. That's my uncle Stebbins. They put him in for something he didn't do. For something he didn't do? Yeah, he didn't wipe off his fingerprints when he robbed the bank. <laughs> now get in line there. I'll take this gentleman first. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Lord Beaverborn. Uh, where were you sitting when the necklace was stolen? Well, I... You lie! Ouch! How long have you known Lady Jennifer? Well, I... You lie! Ouch! Gets rid of him fast, don't he? <laughs> All right, Sergeant, drag this man out of here. Now, Costello, you're next. I think there are others ahead of me. <laughs> I'm ready to take you now. But I don't want to be selfish. Women and children first. <laughs> Sit down there in the chair. Just a minute. Who are you shoving? Who are you shoving? I'm shoving you, and what about it? I just wanted to be sure. <laughs> now, where was you when the lights went out? I was... You lied. I expected it. Ouch! <laughs> uh, what's the matter? Look what he did. Did you hurt your head? No, but he broke my shoelaces. <laughs> Shut up, you. Now I'm going to question the little boy here. Oh, no. Not that. You can't question my little brother, Sebastian. And why not? There's only one head between us. I'm playing both parts. Oh, just a moment. Just a moment, officer. There's been a horrible mistake. My pearls went stolen to fall. They slipped off my neck into my tapioca. Well, leave them there. You look better wearing ta ta tapioca. <laughs> what happened to Costello? But wait. Wait a minute. There's one thing I can't understand, Costello. Who turned out the lights when you were serving dinner? I turned them out, Uncle Bud. Sebastian, why did you turn the lights off? Because you said you didn't want to see Louis thumb in the soup. Sebastian, do you realize what you did? You almost got me arrested. Your brother. They might have thrown me in jail. Then I would have to walk around with the pallor of the prison on my noble brow. Why did you do such things to your loving brother, Sebastian? Oh, I'm a man! Abbott and Co. 
Ralph Keller will be back in a moment. Thanks to the Yanks of the Week, tonight we salute Lieutenant Thomas A. McKenzie of Auburn, Kentucky. Fighting off unconsciousness from flak wounds in his chest, this bombardier hero completed his bomb run without even letting his own crewmates know he was wounded. In your honor, Lieutenant McKenzie, the makers of camels are sending to our fighters overseas 400,000 camel cigarettes. Each of the three camel radio shows honors the Yank of the Week by sending free 400,000 camel cigarettes overseas, a total of more than a million camels sent free each week. In this country, the camel caravans traveling from camp to camp have thanked audiences of more than 4 million Yanks with free shows and free camels. Camel broadcasts go out to the United States three times a week, are rebroadcast to our men overseas and to South America. Listen tomorrow to Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore, Monday to Bob Hawke in Thanks to the Yanks. And next Thursday to Abbott and Costello. And now here are Bud Abbott and Luke Costello with a final word. Well, yeah. Costello, now that we've done our show, let's get home and have our turkey, huh? I think it's a good idea because I'm just about ready for it now. Uh, did you make the stuffing? Yeah, I did. I made grand stuff. You did, huh? Yeah, I ground up a lot of breadcrumbs, and then I put in some garlic. Oh, that's And then swell. I put in a little onions, and I yeah. put in some more garlic, then a whole lot of onions, yeah. then a whole lot of garlic, then a whole lot of more onions, yeah. then a whole lot of garlic, and a whole wait, lot of more onions. Wait a minute. And then wait a, a little wait, more wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did you taste it? Taste it? I couldn't even get near it. Oh. <laughs> Good night, folks. Good night. Good night, everybody. Be sure to tune in next week for another great Abbott and Costello show. And remember, try camels on your throat and your taste. See for yourself how camel's mildness, coolness, and flavor click with you. The Abbott and Costello Show for Camel Cigarettes will be back at this very same time next week. Don't miss it. This is Ken Niles in Hollywood wishing you all a pleasant good night. Folks, you laughed with him when he played the Marine in the movie Wake Island, and soon you'll see him in two years before the mast. He's Hollywood's magnificent mug. Well, I may not have looks, but I got brains. Why, I got brains in my head that I never even used yet. <laughs> the American Meat Institute presents William Bendix in The Life of Riley. The meat people of America, providing a great food for a great nation. Three years ago this week, Pearl Harbor. Three years ago this week, the meat industry was called on to rush more than a million pounds of meat to San Francisco docks to replace supplies destroyed by the Japs. It was on its way in eight hours. That was meat's declaration of war, America, and meat has been in the fight ever since. <laughs> And now, on behalf of all those engaged in supplying meat to the nation, the American Meat Institute presents The Life of Riley. Well, it's lunchtime at the Los Angeles aircraft plant where Chester A. Riley employs his talents as a riveter. At the moment, Riley's own private debating club is in session, the members being Riley and his co-worker, Jim Gillis. And the topic for today is their usual one, the respective virtues of their sons. Say that again, Gillis. Okay, but I already said it four times. My boy, Egbert, is the most popular boy in the John J. Boscowitz Junior High School. Uh, it's wonderful what fathers will do for their children. They'll even commit perjury. <laughs> Listen, Riley, are you insinuating that I am distorting the facts? Oh, I wouldn't go that far, Gillis. You're, you're just allergic to telling the truth. 
<laughs> Listen, once and for all, how can your boy be the most popular boy in the John J. Boskowitz Junior High School when my boy also goes to that school? Quit. What do you mean, quit? Well, that's a geometry term. Q-E-D. Quit. <laughs> Means I just proved you're wrong. I ain't talking geometry. I'm talking my boy Egbert. Listen, what makes you so sure your Egbert is the most popular? What makes you so sure your junior is the most popular? Don't change the subject. <laughs> I asked you a question. Okay, I'll answer. All right. In the first place, you got to admit that my Egbert is good looking. <laughs> Honest, Gillis, your boy ain't good looking. You're just used to him. <laughs> I ain't used to him. He's good looking. Well, if your Egbert is good looking, it's thanks to my junior. He straightened out his teeth for him. <laughs> now, don't get sore, Riley. This is just a friendly discussion. He's certainly better looking than your kid. Gillis, you're just pretty juiced. <laughs> How can you say Egbert is prettier than Junior when Junior inherited his looks from a very handsome man? Oh, I thought you were his father. Ha, ha, ha. Ah, very funny, very funny. Okay, I'll give you a break, Riley. We'll call it a tie. After all, in boys' looks ain't everything. My egg bite is also smart as a whip. Well, maybe he is, but I never met a whip that did anything clever. My junior is smarter than a whip. And my egg bite ain't only popular with the pupils. Once he even had tea at the principal's house. Well, my boy doesn't drink. Only milk. You're going to be stubborn, huh, Riley? Uh, okay. Now I'll prove to you egg bites the most popular. Go ahead. I'm listening with a closed mind. <laughs> but remember, when it comes to popularity, my boy Junior was just re-elected president of his club for a fourth term. <laughs> well, maybe so, but hear me out. You uh, heard about the pre-Christmas dance the school has given? Yeah, only this year they're having it before Christmas. My junior's going. Well, so's my egg boy. Now, uh, tell me, Riley, uh, ever hear of a little girl in the eighth grade by the name of Marilyn Morris? Well, sure. My junior's got a big crush on her. Ah. She's very popular, huh? Mm -hmm. And all the boys is dying to take her to the dance, huh? That's right. So it figures the boy she goes with must be the most popular. You agree? Well, sure. Now, I got you. I'll bet you Marilyn will go with my egg bite to the dance. She will not. I'll bet you she'll go with my junior. <laughs> we'll see. Hello, Junior. Hello, Pop. Oh, I see you're playing with your chemistry set, huh? Well, I'm not playing, Pop. I'm making an experiment. Well, watch out. You don't stain the wallpaper. When we rented this house, the landlady took inventory and counted all the spots on the wall. <laughs> uh, what are you trying to do, anyway? Oh, well, I'm trying to combine the sodium in this test tube with the chlorine in this retort to make NaCl. So. What kind of an education are you getting? <laughs> Since when does NaCl spell salt? <laughs> that spells knackle. <laughs> NaCl is a chemical symbol for salt, sodium chloride. Oh, Junior, salt is okay, but, but but haven't you got something important to do, like like making an important phone call? Well, I don't have to make any phone calls. Well, oh well, then you've already asked her to go to your school dance. Asked who? Well, this swell girl, this Marilyn Morris. Hmm. She wouldn't go with me. How do you know she won't? Well, gee, Pop, she's the most popular girl in school, and... Well, I better go with Babs. Babs? Who's this girl, Babs? What kind of a girl is she? Babs, my sister. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you will not take your sister... I refuse to allow any fellow with as little nerve as you got to take out my daughter. <laughs> oh, gee, you think I want to take my own sister to the dance? I, I'd rather take Marilyn, but... 
Every time I get to the phone to call her, I get a funny feeling. Like butterflies in my stomach. Oh, so that's it. You got an interior complex. <laughs> Sit down, Junior. I think I can help you. Yeah. Son, every boy has got to face certain dangerous things in his life. First, you had measles, then you had chicken pox, then you had the mumps, and now it's time for girls. <laughs> What's your phone number? Evergreen 4321. But, Pop, I like girls, but... But, oh, when I have to talk to them, I get scared. Weren't you ever scared like that, Pop? <laughs> no, not about phoning them. The only time I was ever scared of a girl was when I proposed to your mother. Right in the middle of the proposal, I forgot what I wanted to say. Oh, what did Mom do? She prompted me. <laughs> Junior, it's silly for a guy to be scared of a girl of the opposite sex. Now, now go on. Go, go, go scold this Marilyn. Go ahead. No, I can't, Pop. Not now. Now, listen, Junior. You hello, go... Dad. Oh, hello, Dad. Listen, will you tell this brother of yours not to be afraid of phoning up Marilyn and asking her to the dance? Oh, I have been telling him, but it's no use. He's scared silly. Oh, cut it out. Go on, Junior. Phone. There's nothing to be scared of. I'll tell you exactly what to say. When Marilyn answers, the first thing you say is, hello. That is trying to break the ice. <laughs> then you say, listen, Marilyn, I'm taking you to the dance, and I won't take no for an answer. Oh, no, Dad. You must never say that to a girl. Please, Ben, don't tell me what to say to a girl. <laughs> Remember, I've taken out more girls than you have. Well, all right, if you want to ruin everything. Now, you, you, you listen to me, Junior. First you'll say no, and then you say, okay, if that's the way you feel about it, there's a million girls I could take. And I think I'll take them. <laughs> and then watch her snap up your offer. Oh, no, she won't, Pop. I know she won't. Junior's right. If a fellow ever spoke to me like that, I'd hang up on him. You will not hang up on him. You'll accept this offer. You'll go to the dance with this... But, Dad, no one is phoning me. Oh, yeah. That's good. <laughs> now, listen, Junior, stop stalling. Take the bulldog by the horns and phone Marilyn. No, I'm not phoning. I don't want to go to the old dance. I just want to be left alone. <laughs> well, what brought that up? Riley, what's the matter with Junior? Ran out of the house? Oh, and... Mother, Dad's been trying to get him to phone Marilyn Morris and ask her to go with him to the school dance. Oh, Riley, will you let Junior take care of his own business? Oh, but, Peg, the boy needs help. I'm, I'm only trying to build up his subconfidence. <laughs> He's got to take Marilyn to the dance. What if he doesn't? He'll get along. No, I, I won't. That Gillis will just... Gillis! Oh, so that's it. Oh, Dad, you're always arguing with Mr. Gillis about how wonderful Junior is. Well, what else can a father argue about? The election's over. <laughs> Baseball don't start until spring. Well, I'll show that, Gillis. Hand me that phone, Dad. Riley, what are you up to? Well, if Junior won't phone Marilyn, I will. Oh, See, Evergreen... Four, but, Dad, three, you can't two. do that. Now, stop worrying. Riley, put that phone down. Every time you button to Junior's business, you get him into trouble. Now... Hello? Uh, hello. Uh, I mean, uh, hello. Uh, please, could I speak to Marilyn, please? This is Marilyn. Who's speaking? Uh, you don't know me, but I'm a friend of Junior Riley. Oh, Riley, stop this nonsense. Uh, who was that? Oh, that was my wife. I, I mean... <laughs> I mean my mother. That was my mother. Oh, so you're a friend of Junior Riley. Oh, sure. You know Junior, captain of the football team... Star first baseman and high scorer and forward of the basketball team. If that's what you phoned to tell me, I find it all very boring. Goodbye. Oh, wait. Wait a minute. Uh, uh, Junior asked me to call you because he's got a sore throat. Junior wants you to go with him to the dance, and he won't take no for an answer. Oh, he won't, won't he? No, and if he wants to, he can take a million other girls. Well, let him. But, but, but... but... I'm not interested in any man who has to get some child to do his phoning for him. Goodbye. We were cut off. You mean she hung up? I told you that line of yours wouldn't work. <laughs> That's funny. It worked with you, Peg. <laughs> yeah. But hearing it again, I don't know how it did. Now, Dumplin', now. Pop, where are you? 
Oh, there's Junior now. You better tell him what you've done. Yeah, now, 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 wait, Peg. Stay here. Remember, you own 50% of Junior. Oh. <laughs> I'm not going to have anything to do with it. Uh, Babs, honey. No, thank you, Dad. Not me. I'm not getting into this. This is the thanks I get for trying to be a father. Oh, here you are, Pop. Uh, listen, Junior. I... Pop, I've been thinking things over, and I'm going to take your advice. I'm phoning Marilyn right away. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't be hasty, Junior. You... No, you were right, Pop. There's no sense in putting it off. i, I got to do it sooner or later. Well, I gave you a choice, so do it later, huh? Please? Well, it's silly to be scared of girls. I'll show you I got nerves. No, no, Junior, don't phone. H hang up, Junior. But, Bob, you were just trying to get me to... Hello? Oh, um, hello, Marilyn? Uh, this is Junior Riley. Junior Riley. Well, you've certainly got your nerve calling me. You ought to be ashamed getting your idiotic friend to phone me. What, Marilyn? I'll never speak to you again as long as I live. But, Marilyn... Hello? Marilyn? Marilyn? Bob, she hung up. She said something about an idiotic friend of mine that phoned her. <laughs> Bob, what's the matter? Your face is getting red all over. Uh, it, it must be my tight shoes. <laughs> Pop, uh, you, you phoned her? Junior, I didn't mean any harm. I, I was trying to help you, and it, it, it ain't as bad as you think. But look, 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 let's forget about it. You go to the movies. Wait a minute. Here's a quarter, Junior. Oh, Pop. Junior, J Junior, come back here, will you? Uh, believe me, there's a lot more important things in life than girls, and if you'll give me a little time, I'll think of one. <laughs> Well, Riley certainly has messed up his son's social life, at least temporarily, and there will be further developments in just a moment. Right now, this is Ken Niles speaking for the American Meat Institute. It was just 156 weeks ago today that the most shocking news of a lifetime started crackling out of our radios. Pearl Harbor. You know that our nation was immediately galvanized into action. You know that the miracle of American production is why we are on the winning side of the war today. Now, what happened to the meat industry at the time of Pearl Harbor? Well, at 9.30 Monday morning, after the Japs had hit and run, the Chicago Quartermaster Depot received an order to purchase one million pounds of meat, boned, frozen, and boxed for immediate shipment to replenish supplies. Contact was made at once for the meat packing companies. By 5 o'clock the same day, cars loaded with a million pounds of meat were rolling toward San Francisco. Since that time, meat has been mobilized for war. Better than 10 billion pounds of meat have rolled to American ports and camps of war. More than 7 billion pounds to our fighting allies, over and above supplies for the folks at home. Why do our fighters need meat to fight on? Why does our home front need meat to work on? Because meat provides essential bodybuilding proteins. In fact, meat is called a yardstick of protein foods because meat measures up to every protein need. And now back to the life of Riley with William Bendix as Riley. Well, Riley put his foot in it again. His attempt to get a date for his son, Junior, for the school dance by phoning Marilyn Morris and pretending to be a friend of Junior's ended in disaster. Now Marilyn won't speak to Junior, and Junior won't speak to his father. My own son, and he won't even talk to me. It's your own fault. I even offered to mow the lawn for him. <laughs> he didn't say a word. Well, you'll get over it in a day or two. Now, stop worrying. And if your friend Gillis teases oh, you for... I ain't worried about Gillis. It's what I've done to Junior. Well, next time, don't butt in. Uh, well, we've got to go and hang out the wall. I'm going to stay flat on this couch and turn this over on my head. Who's that? It's me. It's the Odell. Oh, the door's open. Huh. It ain't my favorite undertaker. How are you, Digger? Excellent, Riley. And you're looking fine. Very natural. <laughs> Wait, Digger, let me hang up your coat. Oh, don't bother getting up, Riley. Just lie there on the couch. I don't mind. I, uh, think I'd rather sit up. <laughs> you seem depressed, Riley. So I think I'll cheer you up. 
Have you heard the latest one? First man. It's a bad day for the race. Second man. What race? First man. The human race. <laughs> 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 Isn't that a scream? Yeah, I think I'll lie down again. <laughs> What's wrong, Riley? I can see something is troubling you. Well, yeah, something is. Riley, you can trust me. I won't tell it to a living soul. <laughs> well, figure it's all on account of a dance. Oh, a dance. Yeah. The art of Tupsikare. I adore dancing. It's so gay. <laughs> well, this one ain't gonna be for Junior You see, he was afraid to ask a certain girl to this dance And so I phoned her and made out I was a boyfriend of his And, well, I spoiled everything It isn't hopeless, Riley If I were Junior, I'd dig up another girl <laughs> Well, you could do that <laughs> but Junior wants to go with this particular marrow. I sympathize with the lad. When I was a boy, somehow I could never get a girl to go to parties with me. I don't know why. I was just as much fun then as I am now. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I wish there was some way to square things for Junior before he disowns me as his father. There is, Riley. Go to this girl and confess everything. <laughs> then she'll forgive Junior. Yeah. That's what I'll do. I'll go and confess. I'm glad I thought of that. Would you like me to... <laughs> would you like me to drive you there? There's plenty of room in my car. <laughs> No, thanks, Digger. I'll see it through alone. This is my funeral. Oops, that reminds me I have an appointment. <laughs> well, cheerio, bury me not on the lone prairie. Yes? Uh, pardon me, does Marilyn Morris live here? She does. I'm her father. Well... Could I see her, please, sir? What is it about? Well, I, I want to find out if she still hasn't got a date for the school dance. <laughs> Indeed. Aren't you a little too old for that sort of thing? <laughs> oh, oh, no, no. I, I don't want to take her to the dance. My wife wouldn't like it. I, 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 mean, I mean, my son wouldn't. I, I, I mean, I, I, I just oh, want to tell her something. Correct. Oh, oh, pardon me. I didn't know you had company. I haven't. You have, Marilyn. Oh? Uh, I'm Mr. Riley. Junior's my father. I, I mean... <laughs> I'm, I, I mean, I'm his son. I, I mean... I, 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 I'm pleased to meet you, Marilyn. Have a cigar. No, no, no. I mean... I mean I, uh, you, Morris. I, I, uh, Mr. Morris. You... I don't smoke. Uh, you wanted to see me, Mr. Riley? Well, yeah, I wanted to talk to you, uh, private-like. <clears throat> I, uh, figured if you were alone, <clears throat> there's something I gotta tell you just between the two of us. <clears throat> you can cough your head off, Mr. Riley, but I insist on being present during any conversation you have with my daughter. Ah, uh, well, well, uh, well, well, Marilyn, yesterday you, you got a phone call from somebody who said he was a friend of Junior? Yes, and of all the silly little dopes I ever heard, he certainly takes the cake. My Junior is no dope. I mean his friend who phoned. Oh. Oh. Well, well, don't you think you're being a little hard on Junior's friend? She is not. I happen to overhear that conversation on the extension in my study. Father! And I must say, Mr. Riley, if the boy who telephoned is the type your son associates with, I forbid Marilyn to have anything to do with him. <laughs> now, listen, now. The boy who phoned is a very fine tripe. He's a drip. I wish you, I knew who it was. Well, I... that, that's what I come to tell you. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm the drip. You? <laughs> Yesterday, I wouldn't have believed it. Today, I do. Well, you, you see, Junior was dying to ask you to the dance, but 
He was too scared to phone you, and so that's why I did. He, he didn't know anything about it. He... Oh, I see. Oh, I wish I'd known. I wouldn't have spoken to Junior the way I did. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, d- then you ain't sorry, Junior? Of course not. You forgive him, huh? Certainly. Oh, well, okay, then it's all settled. Junior will call for you, 8 o'clock, Saturday night. Oh, no, uh, no, I well, can't go with him to uh, the dance. I'd like to, but I can't. Uh, why not? I've already accepted a date with Egbert Gillis. You... <laughs> what a wonderful pal I turned out to be for Egbert Gillis. Well, we're off to the movies, Riley. Now, have a good time, Dumplin'. Come on, Dad, dear. Junior, are you sure you don't want to go to the dance tonight? I'd be glad to go with you. No, I don't want to go to the dance. Now, nah, you just leave Junior alone. He'll be okay with me. Go on, go ahead, go on. Go on. All right, then. Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, cheer up, Junior. Tonight, us men are going to make a night of it, huh? How's about starting off with the, with the snappy game of checkers, huh? I, I don't feel like checkers. Well, then, how's about showing me how you make salt on your chemistry set? No, I just want to sit here and think. About what? Oh, about life and how mixed up it gets. Junior, you got to learn to smile. Listen, I heard a great joke today. Listen, first man. Ain't this a bad day for the game? Second man. What game? Third man. The human game. (laughs) Ain't that funny, Junior? (laughs) Yeah, Pop. It's hilarious. I told you I'd cheer you up. Now let's go in. No, I'll get it, Junior. Oh, it's you, Gillis. Good evening, Riley. Out! Take it easy, Riley. Don't close the door on my foot. Oh, I'm very sorry. Come on in, Egbert. Hello, Mr. Riley. Hello, Junior. Hello, oh, Egbert. I know why you're here, Gillis. All right, go on. Go ahead. Gloat. Go oh, on. no, Riley. I wouldn't come for that. Uh, we just happened to pass by on our way to pick up Marilyn, so uh, I figured maybe I could give Junior a lift to the dance. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you, Gillis, to go four miles out of your way and use up a half a gallon of General Eisenhower's gas. But it so happens Junior ain't going to the dance. Him and me are sitting this one out. You don't, sir? Yeah. Oh, well, don't take it too hard, Junior. Some kids are cut out for social life and some ain't. It ain't that. Junior's got more important things to do than go dancing. He's staying home tonight to, 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 to work out some chemistry experiments. He's, he, he's going to make salt. What for? You can get a whole pound for a dime. <laughs> he's inventing it with his chemistry set. So, that's baby stuff. Sure, my egg bite makes iodine with his chemistry set. Made a whole bottle of iodine last night. Ah, well, he should have pasted a picture of your face on a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> How could you make iodine, Egbert? We don't learn that till a senior year. I did so make it, didn't I, Father? Yes, sir. The finest iodine I ever saw. How do you know? Did you taste it? You don't believe us, huh? No. Where's your chemistry set, Junior? In the other room. Okay, come on, Egbert. Oh, but, Father, I'll be late for the day. No, no, you won't. You'll see, Riley. Whether it's social stuff or chemistry. My egg bait is a great little mixer. Well, egg bait, uh, when do we get the iodine? In a minute, Father. Just as soon as I heat this test tube. Egbert, I think you made a mistake. You should have I know it. what I'm doing, Junior. Sure, Egbert knows what he's doing. Junior, don't interfere with Monsieur Egbert Pasteur. Come on, Egbert, we're waiting. Come on. All I've got to do is hold this flame under the test tube. Just no, no. Egbert! Egbert! Oh, I'm all right, Father. I'm not hurt. I guess I made a mistake. Egbert, where are your eyebrows? <laughs> I don't see your eyebrows. <laughs> Holy smoke, his eyes are bald. <laughs> Where's the mirror? Where's the mirror, Papa? Oh, here, look. My eyebrows! Oh, don't cry, Egbert. I haven't got any now, look, Egbert, now, now, don't take it so hard now. So you won't grow up to be a John L. Lewis. What? <laughs> Egbert, you, you'll be late for the dance. I can't go to a dance without eyebrows. You don't dance on your eyebrows. <laughs> Come on now. Like All right, don't go, but stop crying. Please, stop crying. Quick, Junior, get dressed in your best suit. Dress? 
Marilyn? Yeah, if I know women inside of 15 minutes, you're going to get a call from a certain young lady whose initials are Marilyn Morris. Bob, it's over 15 minutes and Marilyn hasn't phoned. Well, she'll phone. Just give her time. Remember, Junior, when she phones, play hard to get now. Now, now keep cool. Don't be nervous. I'll, I'll take you to her house in a taxi. Now, let's get ready. We better get... Well, where's my hat? On your head. Well, never mind. I'll look for it later. Huh? <laughs> now, 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 be calm. Now, relax, Junior. Oh, that, that's her. I told you. She's, I'll, I, I'll answer first. But, Bob, you, you listen in. Uh, hello? Oh, Mr. Riley, this is Marilyn Morris. May I speak to Junior, please? Well, he's kind of tied up now. No, Pop, no. It's very important. It's about the dance. I'd like him to take me. Well, if he can tear himself away from the girls. Girls? Oh, yeah, the house is full of them. Always after Junior. Well, in that Give me the phone, no. Pop. Hello, Marilyn, Mrs. Junior. I'll be glad to take you to dance. I'll call for you in five minutes to taxi. Goodbye. She's gone with me. She's gone with me. Well, sure, just like I told you, Junior. It always works. Play hard to get. Here's a special message from our star, Riley himself, William Bendix. Folks, all over the world, millions of American boys are carrying the flags of the United States and the United Nations ever forward to victory. That victory over our barbaric enemies is inevitable. We know that all too many brave young men will never return to share the fruits of peace we also know. If these men are willing to stake their lives on what they believe in, the least we, safe here at home, can do is to give them weapons they must have to fight with. We must buy war bonds, lots of them, more than we think we can afford. Each bond we buy is an investment in America's future and a tribute to those who are willing to die to protect that investment. Good night. Don't forget to live the life of Riley with us every week at this very same time. Next week, Riley goes to adult evening school and gets entangled with a love-starved female. We think you'll enjoy the results. This is Ken Niles in Hollywood saying good night. This is the Blue Network. 7.30 at KECA, Los Angeles. The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson Wax products for home and industry present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn and Phil Leslie, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. You know, it's not so long ago that Saturday was best known as bath day for the kids and baking day and floor scrubbing day for their mothers. But now you mothers are more fortunate on that floor business. Johnson's Glow Coat has moved that unpleasant chore back with the antiques. You'd never think of doing all that hard work again when with Glow Coat it's a cinch to have linoleum floors clean and sparkling all the time. Glow Coat saves work, first because it needs no rubbing or buffing. You simply apply and let dry. It saves work also because it's so easy to keep a glow-coated floor clean and beautiful. Spilled things are wiped up with a damp cloth in a jiffy. Besides saving you work, self-polishing glow coat saves your linoleum, makes it last ever so much longer because it protects against dirt, wear, and moisture. And, of course, a beautiful floor protected with glow coat makes your kitchen a more cheerful room to work in. People at 79 Wistful Vista have been having a little trouble with their radio. All week it's been going... (whistles) This morning, however, Mr. McGee made a couple of minor adjustments, and now it goes... (whistles) But never one to give up until something is either fixed or ruined, he's still in there fighting as we meet... Fibber McGee and Molly. Sound any better now, Molly? 
Uh, if I wasn't so fond of you, dearie, I'd say that every time you touch that thing, it sounds worse. Well, I think I've located the trouble. I think it's got a grid leak. Hmm. Shall I get a pan to put under it? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you don't know much about electricity, Snooky. <laughs> what I mean is AC is uh, the AC is draining off into the DC. Now, let me see if I put this... Over. What on earth are you doing? I'm just feeling around inside this radio. I think possibly the condenser is... Yes! No! <laughs> what are you dancing around for? I don't hear any music. <laughs> Got a shock. My gosh, I just absorbed enough juice to light the city of Akron. Hey, you got any rubber gloves? No, no, I haven't. I sent the only pair I had to Cousin Letty. Hmm. She's going to work on a farm this summer, you know. What does she need rubber gloves for to work on a farm? Well, she punches little holes in the ends of the fingers with a needle. Yeah? Fills the glove with warm water and practices milking. <laughs> it's going to be a little confusing when she finds out a cow only has four fingers. <laughs> Oh, well, I guess I don't need it anyway. Now, let's see. Where's my pliers? In your left hand. Well, what did I do with my left hand? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> now, let's see. If I tighten this little dingus here... Oh, I'll bet that did it. Now, listen. And as Mr. Stalin says to the Yalta Conference... <laughs> my, my. Isn't Russian an interesting language? <laughs> I think maybe i better take the whole radio apart. Oh, dear. Unplug the plug out of the wall plug, will you? <laughs> Thanks. Ah, now to work. Ah, here we go, laughing and scratching. I still think we ought to call the radio repairman, McGee. No, nah, no, nah, it'll take too long. There's an opera singer on tonight that I don't want to miss. Gloria Pizzicato. On that Gilly Garden Hose program. <laughs> Why, she can't sing. Hmm? She's only on that program because her husband is Mr. Gilly. And she only married him because he manufactured hose. She not knowing it was garden hose. <laughs> She's positively the worst. Oh, hello, Alice. Hello, Mrs. McGee. Hello, Mr. McGee. Something wrong with the radio? Yeah, tubes burned out or something, Alice. Oh. Tuned in the Andrews sisters last night and could only get two of them. Oh. <laughs> uh, plug it in and let me hear it, Mr. McGee. Okay. I'll see if we can get that program Molly likes. Joyce Jensen, girl gopher hunter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the one. Too. And as we leave Joyce Jensen, girl gopher hunter... That's it. ...trapped in the blazing reptile house at the zoo, where she has been lured by Ben Baxter, who is secretly trying to break the will of the dying Mortimer Bixby, because he is secretly infatuated with Tracy Lammermore, whose father has been missing since the blueprints of the new battleship was stolen by Siegfried Schoenfeld, the Nazi spy, who is secretly in love with Alice Greekfeather, who is Ben Baxter's secret mother. <laughs> We wonder how it will all come out. Tune in all day tomorrow and let your housework go straight to... <laughs> Sounds like your condenser was shot, Mr. McGee. <laughs> Sounded more like the announcer was, Alice. <laughs> and none too soon, Edie. One of these days, John's other wife is going to fall secretly in love with one of the quiz kids. And Clem McCarthy will get so excited, he'll bite H.B. Kaltenborn in the ankle. <laughs> well, I'll just check this radio all over, well, I guess. If I can help you any, Mr. McGee, I have my toolkit upstairs, and I'll be glad to run no, up... No, 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 thanks, kid. <laughs> I'll make out okay. This is man's work. Mm -hmm. I used to build radios, you know, back in Peoria. Indeed, he did, Alice. Betcha. Many's the oatmeal box I've held while he wrapped wire around it, and then held again while he unwrapped the wire and got his thumb out of it. <laughs> I built the first GA set in Peoria, Alice. What's a GA set? Get anything. <laughs> Had 12 dials on that baby. Took up the whole mantle. <laughs> My father used to be a great radio fan in the early days. He'd sit there night after night with those headphones glued to his ears. Mm -hmm. Mother finally had to do something about it. What'd she do, Alice? She had to spank my little brother and hide the glue. <laughs> <laughs> well, this isn't getting the radio fixed, girls. <laughs> One side, please, while I make a mug out of Marconi. Well, I'll be glad to help you, Mr. McGee, if you want me to. I'm very happy. No, 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 no. Thanks, anyway. This is no job for a bent hairpin, kid. Well, all right. Just call me if there's anything I can do. Yeah. <laughs> Call her if there's anything she can do. 
I never saw a woman yet that didn't think a shingle nail was something to scratch herself with when you had the shingles. Oh. Now, let me see. Where's my tire tape? Uh, well, I think I saw it. Oh, there. I know. It's right here in the hall. Oh. One of these days, I gotta straighten out that clock. <laughs> Billy Mills in the orchestra and play ride in July. Place, well, I think I know where the trouble is. You see this tube? Hold it up to the light. That's it. What do you see? A lot of little fine wires. Exactly. And naked as a boiled potato. No insulation on them. <laughs> Pretty shoddy workmanship, if you ask me. Well, uh, how do you get the little wires out of the tube to wrap them with the insulation? Break the glass. <laughs> yes, but maybe... And if them little wires were properly insulated, they don't need any glass around them. See? <laughs> Another thing is here, you got to have these things. Hello, folks. Oh, hello, Mr. Wilcox. Hi, Junior. Fixing the radio? Now, there is an intelligent question. <laughs> got my hands full of tools and the radio scattered all over the joint, and he asked me, am I fixing the radio? No, Junior, I'm up on the roof measuring the chimney for some new soot. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be sarcastic, McGee. It was a natural thing to ask. Just uh, what was wrong with the radio, pal? Can't say exactly, Junior. All I know is I don't get what I tune in for. Well, some program you particularly want? Yes, he wants to hear that opera singer, Gloria Pizzicato, over WVIS. Gloria Pizzicato? Yeah. That babe couldn't hit high C with a bazooka. I used to have a Model T Ford with a worn brake drum that could sing better than she can. <laughs> Now, look here, Junior. Don't tell me who to listen to and who not to listen to and who to. Besides, I've heard you sing. And your lower register ain't fit to dry a pair of overshoes on. You got the rhythm of a spavined horse in a cobblestone alley and a tonal delicacy of a dentist drill. You must have trained with a busted windshield wiper for a metronome, accompanied by a sweet potato that was left too long in a damp basement. <laughs> Oh, I could say more, but I don't want to hurt your feelings. Thanks. I guess McGee didn't know you used to sing in Chautauqua, Mr. Wilcox. Didn't you, pal? Sure. Thinks mules used to be in vaudeville, too. <laughs> the 
they took their last bow in a glue factory. <laughs> so if I want to listen to Gloria Pizzicato tonight, I'm going to listen to Gloria Pizzicato tonight. Catch on. Well, they're your eardrums, chum. Suit yourself. Say, uh, I know where you can get that fixed in no time. Where, Mr. Wilcox? My cousin's a radio repairman. Hmm? Big Freddy Wilcox. At 14th and Oak. Oh, my God. Say, incidentally, you know what Freddie told me about a radio? What did he tell you, son? A very interesting thing. Parlor trick, sort of. Uh -huh. He says, if you turn your radio on, and while it warms up, you talk into the speaker and turn it off. It will play your own voice back to you when you turn it on again. Well, heavenly days, I never heard that before. Here, let's try it. Turn it on. Okay. Now, I'll talk into it fast, shut it off, and turn it back on again and hear my own voice repeat what I said. Isn't this fun? No? Well, go ahead, Junior. Talk to it. Okay. <clears throat> This is Harlow Wilcox speaking. Big Harlow Wilcox. Oh, oh, yes. This is Big Harlow Wilcox speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax. Closer into the speaker, Harlow. All right. I am just reminding you again that Johnson's Wax is the finest protection money can buy for your floors, furniture, woodwork, picture frames, leather goods, and a hundred other things you want to guard from dust and dampness, scratching and smudging. Better cut it short, Mr. Wilcox. This is a very dumb radio and won't remember very much of what you said. <laughs> Remember, Johnson's Wax, when you want to protect your fine possessions against dryness and dampness, wear and tear, use and abuse. Now, shut it off. Quick, pal. Now, on again. Hmm? I don't hear a thing. Well, I'll be darned. What do you know about that? I don't know anything, Waxy. <laughs> but I suspect a plenty. I got a sneaking suspicion that I you just... I told Freddy I didn't think it would work, but he kept insisting and insisting. Mm. I'm going down and tell him right now. <laughs> See you later, folks. Man, I never caught on. I never caught on. After all these <laughs> years, I never caught on. Well, now, look, dearie, if you intend to hear Gloria Pizzicato on that radio tonight, you'd better start getting the real snook wired back into the audio hoosis or something. Oh, my gosh, I guess I better have it there. Hey, I just got an idea what might be wrong with this thing. What's that? Uh, this wire here is marked ground. You see? Yeah. Well, all the time we've had it fastened to the radiator. <laughs> that radiator is eight feet off of the ground if it's an inch. No wonder the darn well, thing... Well, you do it your own way, sweetheart. But I hope you get the radio fixed before Roosevelt's next inauguration. Hmm? I haven't missed one since I was a child. <laughs> Well, I've got to go out in the kitchen and see how Beulah's coming along with the dinner. Okay. Ah, there goes a good kid. She knows when it comes to repairing a radio, I don't know an aerial from a real set. But does she say anything? No, sir. <laughs> but does she think things? <laughs> Brother, you got no one? Come in. Oh, hello there, Teeny. <laughs> Rest your rompers on the rug there and watch Uncle Fibber set the radio industry back 15 or 20 years. What you doing, mister? What you doing? Watch ya. To the world at large, sis, I'm fixing the radio. But strictly between us kids, I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I love to listen to the radio, I bet you. I like Bing Crosby. He, he sends me. <clears throat> well, I wish he was here now. I'd ask him to do it. <laughs> See, if I move the octostat near the flanellium here, it ought to make the variations more sanitized. Hey, I wish I was smart enough to take a radio all apart. You, huh? Hmm? I says you do, eh? Do what? You wish you were smart enough to take a radio apart. I know, huh? And, and if I was that smart, I'd be too smart to do it, I bet you. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, if you're so smart... What makes the radio work, mister? And what does? Hmm? Will you explain it to me, mister? And will you, please? Hmm? Why, team? Do you mean to sit there with your little pigtails on the wrong end of the little pig? <laughs> and tell me you don't comprehend the nature of the wireless? Uh, no. <laughs> Close your mouth and open your eyes and I'll tell you something to make you eyes. Now then, what happens when you turn on your radio? It makes it kind of a little quick and then the little light turns on. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And way out in the ether, Mother Nature hears that little click. Oh. And quick's a flash. She calls in all her little kills and megs and says... Radio turned on a 14th and oak. Whistle this way. And all the little ki kills hop onto their killer cycle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all the little megs hop onto their mega cycles. And they race away as fast as their little fat wavelengths will carry them. Um, you know what a wavelength is, sis? Sure I do, I betcha. Five feet two. I figure that. My sister is a wave and that's her length. <laughs> Well, 
announcer. All them little kills and megs ride along on their kilocycles and megacycles till they see that little light that shines in your radio. Oh. Yes, sir. And then they hop off and into the back of the radio. That's why they always leave the back part of a radio open. <laughs> and quick to wink, they decide who's going to be music, who's going to be dialogue, and who's going to be announcers. And if any little meg or little kill has got a bad cold, they let him be the static. <laughs> well, sir, then you hear the music and the dialogue and the commercial, which is when everybody turns the radio down and rushes out into the kitchen for a bottle of root beer before the music comes on again. <laughs> Boy, that was a wonderful story, mister. <laughs> I thought so. Gee, poor Mr. Marconi. What do you mean, poor Mr. Marconi? To think he spent his whole life laboring under the delusion that radio was based upon the utilization of electromagnetic waves, converted into electrical impulses known as audio frequency currents and amplified by means of the vacuum tube through a diaphragm or loudspeaker. Gee, if he had only known. Ha, ha, poor Mr. Marconi. <laughs> The King's Men singing Leave the Dishes in the Sink, Ma. Uh, uh, Mailman! Paul started running when he heard the whistle blow. The postman brought a letter, an airmail from our Joe. It says he'll soon be home again from far across the blue. And Paul took off his apron and hollered out, Yee-hoo! Leave the dishes in the sink, Ma. Leave the dishes in the sink. Every place will have to wait Tonight we're gonna celebrate Leave the dishes in the sink Pa started jigging And he cried, Ma, shake a leg I'm going to the cellar There's cider in the cake Bologna's in the icebox And there's cheese and pickles, too We're calling all the neighbors Tonight's our night Leave the dishes in the sink Ma, where it'll just get ruined peeling potatoes and apples. Yeah. Oh, Beulah! Beulah! Somebody ball for Beulah? <laughs> hey, Beulah, bring me a small knife, will you? I gotta slice some wire. Is there something go bluey with the radio focus? <laughs> yes, Beulah, and Mr. McGee wants to get it fixed in time to hear Gloria Pizzicato tonight. Gloria Pizzicato? Mm-hmm. Oh! Oh, man, that gal... That gal got a voice like making a bed with broken fingernails. When she sing, it makes a half stand up on a scrub brush. We won't discuss my musical taste, Beulah. No, sir. Excuse me, sir. Well, it's a good thing we won't, dearie. I happen to know that your idea of fine music is hearing the curse of an aching heart played on a musical saw. Oh, yeah. 
Well, I like imitations of a locomotive played on a banjo, too. <laughs> and believe me, that ain't easy. You mean it ain't easy to like for? I mean it ain't easy to play it. Oh. Uh, you said you played the piano, didn't you, Beulah? Yes, ma'am, but not so much anymore. Housework and the hot chai ain't strictly compatible. <laughs> <laughs> Music is like chicken pockets. Oh, you gotta keep your head in or you don't get no place. <laughs> You can say that again. Yes, and you can like picking pockets. Got no, 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 no. <laughs> he, uh, he means you're right. Oh, thank you, sir. And you wishes me to bring you out a little parent knife? Yes, if you'll be so good as to. <laughs> when I get through with this radio bill, it'll tune so fine you can hear Mr. District Attorney filing a brief. Yeah, Mr. <laughs> District Attorney filing. What is a mail thing? <laughs> <laughs> I won't mention it again after this, but uh, why don't you just toss all those parts into a pillowcase and haul them down to a radio repairman? No, sir. I can handle this with... Just a knife, sir. Thank you, Beulah. Ah, now I can get someplace. Let's see. Oh, my gosh. When were these things sharpened last? I'd hate to be trapped in a cobweb with only these knives on me. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you noticed that, pet. You've been promising to sharpen those knives ever since we... Come in. Hello, Molly, my dear. Oh, come in, Dr. Gamble. Hi, Doc. Hello, my boy. Well, what are you up to now? My clavicle in this radio. (laughs) Pull up a chair and I'll show you a few of the finer points of radiotronics, Gamble. Finer points of what? Radiotronics. Spell it. Skip it. (laughs) The radio has been acting up, Doctor. I wanted to send it to a repairman, but himself here thought it was a waste of money, so... Oh, it is, my dear. It is a waste of money. Sure. Unless, of course, you plan to use the set again sometime. (laughs) I suppose you're throwing this one away when a little fumble foot gets through playing with it. What do you mean, throw it away? Stick around, wise guy, and I'll show you how... Hey, you got your satchel there? Let me uh-huh. have a scalpel a minute, will you? Why, certainly. Hey, you are, my boy. Yeah. Although if you're planning on cutting your throat in despair, let me do it. I'm a doctor, you know. We learn how to do those things neatly. And besides, you... Hey, what are you doing with that? Give me that scalpel. Okay, okay, take it, Indian giver. I was just trimming those wires down to fit. My best scalpel. Of all the unmitigated, colossal... My $12 scalpel. Well, that's what you get for lending your stuff around promiscuously, you big stoop. You're not supposed to lend your surgical tools to a guy who's not a doctor anyhow. You know how septic people are. You could get in trouble with the AMA for that. <laughs> Why, of all the... I ought to... Oh, all right, I asked for it. Anybody who lends you anything without keeping one hand on it ought to have it ruined. Shh. That's what... Huh? To what? Oh, oh, plug it in over there, Doc. Okay. Now get a load of how a radio ought to sound after a good overhaul. Get a load of this reception. Very good. <laughs> That's the same kind of reception he gets when he walks into the Elks Club, Molly. <laughs> oh, take it easy, you old buckethead. My guys, I just got to... Say, Mr. McGee. Oh, hello, Dr. Gamble. Oh, hello, I say, Mr. McGee, maybe I could help a little with that radio if you want don't me to. Don't worry about it, Alice. We can get a repair man. Oh, I don't mind, Mrs. McGee. I just thought maybe I could help. Sounded to me a little while ago like the condenser is improperly wired. Maybe it's crossed with a transformer. Condenser? You're thinking of an icebox, Alice. This is a radio. Oh, you're thinking of a compressor on an icebox, Mr. McGee. I said the condenser. Yeah, but I don't think... Why don't you let her look at it, you noisy little feedback? She at least knows more than you do about it. Which could be nothing at all. Okay, Go right ahead, Alice. You two know all about radios. Go ahead, fix it up. I'm through. Well, jeepers, I don't want to... I mean... Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll just sit over here. Well, I'm, I'm sure it won't take but a minute. I work on radio sets all day long at the airplane plant. Hmm, I think you've got the condenser hooked into series with the amplifier tube. Huh? Uh, wh- what that does is build up a charge in the resistor tubes and screwdriver, please. Uh, oh, oh thank you. And, and when it attains sufficient ohmage, it develops a squeal. So I'm I'm changing the wiring so that the grids alternate with the resistors, and so the condenser can function properly. And ah, there we are. Now try it. Clear as a bell. Shucks, she only did what I was starting to do. 
Only she's got smaller hands. She can reach in farther. Oh, hey, it's time. Get Gloria Pizzicato. It's time for her to be on. W-B-I-S, Alice. Oh, all right. Here. Pizzicato with her first number this evening, Why Do I Love You? Ah, just got it in time. the idea, McGee? I thought you wanted to hear Gloria Pizzicato. Of course I did. If I didn't hear her, how would I know when to shut her off? <laughs> I hate that woman. I shut her off every night. Thanks very much, Alice. Don't mention it, ever. <laughs> If one of your friends said to you, I keep house with wax, would you know what she meant? Well, if you went over her home room by room, I think you would. Because in every one of those rooms, from the front door through the kitchen, you'd find wax protection, wax polished beauty. Floors that grow lovelier with every application of Johnson's wax. Tabletops, sideboard, chair arms that gleam with wax protection that are so easy to keep clean and sparkling. Window sills that are not afraid of a sudden shower. Venetian blinds, picture frames, leather articles, lampshades that wear a coat of Johnson's wax proudly. Yes, you'd find in every room evidence of regular applications of Johnson's wax to all kinds of surfaces, protecting them, preserving them, adding beauty and length of life, and saving hours of housework. That's what we mean by protective housekeeping with Johnson's wax. And believe me, it pays big dividends. these parts Alice had left over, McGee. Throw them out and be thankful we haven't got a television set. Why? Imagine getting that put back together and having three faces, two bodies, and a piccolo left over. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Good night. Good night, all. <laughs> This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson Wax Finishes for Home and Industry, inviting you all to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Once again, it's time to walk down Baker Street with its swirling fog, its passing hansom cabs, and bustling London life. Hello, this is Ben Wright, welcoming you to two more new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. At the end of each broadcast, the announcer says, Tonight's episode was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher. Both men, although they are no longer with us, were married. Dennis Green's widow, Mary Green, lives in New York and is still active in theatre and dance. And Phyllis White, Anthony Boucher's widow, lives in San Francisco and makes numerous guest appearances at Mystery Club gatherings and at the meetings of the Baker Street Irregulars. Well, tonight it is my pleasure to present Phyllis White, who will tell you a little about what her husband and Dennis Green did for the Sherlock Holmes radio series. Phyllis? I've been asked to give an account how it happened that my husband got involved with the Sherlock Holmes show. The way his career developed was not according to any underlying plan. Whenever he turned a corner and moved into a new field, it was brought about by chance. And this was a good example of that. He was at the time a mystery reviewer for the San Francisco Chronicle. Well, this time he went over to the book department office, got his books and his mail, and found among the mail an invitation to a cocktail party. It was in honor of Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, who had come to San Francisco to do a war bond promotion. The party was going on right then, so he could quite easily have learned about it too late. But he trotted right over, and aside from meeting Rathbone and Bruce, there were other people who had come along from the radio program. 
there was Glenn Hall Taylor, who was the producer, and there was Dennis Green, who was one of the writers. He was writing in collaboration with Leslie Charteris. Well, as it turned out, the Greens were staying on a little longer in the Bay Area. My husband invited them to come over to Berkeley and have dinner with us and see his Sherlock Holmes collection. Well, they, they went back to Hollywood, and not long after, it turned out that the program was in need of a new writer. Dennis suggested Boucher. Well, it turned out that it uh, meshed just beautifully as a collaboration. Here was uh, a noble project working with gifted colleagues, something that they could all feel affection for and respect and a lot of fun along the way, too. Thank you, Phyllis. And now, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in Colonel Warburton's Madness. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson as he tells us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And you know what I wish I could share with you sometime? A bottle of Petri California Sherry. Have you ever tasted Petri Sherry? It's just perfect before dinner. Why, that Petri Sherry can change the usual before dinner lull into a special event, and that's a fact. Just look at the clear color of Petri Sherry. It's a deep, rich amber, clear and cheerful looking. And wait till you taste it. That's when you find out for sure just how good a wine can be. That's when you find out just what I mean when I say that the flavor of Petri Sherry comes right from the heart of the grape. Try Petri Sherry by itself, or with hors d'oeuvres or canopies or whatever you call those little cocktail sandwiches, and say, if you like your sherry dry, well then Petri California Pale Dry Sherry is the sherry for you. Just be sure the label says Petri, the proudest name in the history of American wines. <laughs> Now let's look in on our old friend, Dr. Watson. Doctor? I'm out here on the patio, Mr. Boucher. Come out and join me. <laughs> Quiet, Winnie. Quiet, down, down, Monty. <laughs> I see the welcoming committee's here. <laughs> Those little scoundrels. They begin to think they own this patio. Scoop them off the chair, Mr. Bartell, and, and settle yourself down. All right, off you go, boy. Off you go. Go on, off you go. That's it, my boy. As a matter of fact, it's rather appropriate that the puppies should be here tonight. As in the story that I'm going to tell you, a dog played a most prominent part. A dog? What kind of a dog, Doctor? Now, 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 my boy, don't get me anticipating my story. For once, I'm going to start at the beginning. Which was? On a summer morning in 1890, not long after my marriage. I'd gone back to my private practice, you know, and Sherlock Holmes was living alone in our old Baker Street rooms. Well, you still saw him, I suppose. Indeed I did, Mr. Bartell. In fact, occasionally I even persuaded him to forego his bohemian habits so far as to visit my wife and me. But to get back to my story, I'd been exceptionally busy that summer, and Consequence was feeling rather, shall we say, nervy and, and run down. So much so that Mary, oh, <laughs> Mrs. Watson, persuaded me to take a fortnight's holiday. We went down to the charming little village of Taplow on the lower reaches of the River Thames. But, as so often happens, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang up to glay. I guess the holiday backfired on you, Doctor, and you found yourself involved in a mystery. Maybe a mystery calling for the aid of your old friend Sherlock Holmes? Quite correct, Mr. Bartell. We'd only been down there a couple of days when the trouble began. In fact, the whole thing became so involved that I thought the best thing to do was to put the whole strange story in a letter to Sherlock Holmes. This I did. And I can imagine how he chuckled when he read my news. Dear old Watson, seems to be a little out of his depth. My dear Holmes, I need your help, or at least your advice. Two days down here, and I've become involved in a most unusual problem. It began this morning when Mary and I were out for an after-breakfast stroll. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, and there seemed every indication of it being a happy... And 
You know, Mary, I've always thought up to now that Barney was rather a silly word. <laughs> I still do, John, dear. Nevertheless, it's the only possible word that describes a day like this adequately. Very well, dear, it's Barney. Personally, I'm so happy to see you relaxing that I don't care what the weather's like. You've been working much too hard. Yes, it's been a busy year. Yes, and last year Sherlock Holmes monopolized most of your time. At least I've got you to myself for once. <laughs> you dear little thing, you... Always been rather jealous of my association with Holmes, haven't you? Not jealous, dear, but I must confess his influence on you wasn't entirely for the good. He had a habit of keeping you out all night. Well, you should be used to that, dear. After all, it happens often enough in my practice. True, John, but on those occasions I know where you are and don't worry about you. And again, you've copied so many of Mr. Holmes' eccentricities. Hmm? Keeping your tobacco in a Persian slipper, for instance. <laughs> and, uh, oh, John, look down. Do you see that woman walking across the field towards us? Yes, well, what's the matter? Do you know her? I'm not sure, but I think it's Ellen Warburton. I believe she does live somewhere near here. And who is Ellen Warburton? An old friend of mine. She's frightfully clever and advanced. She's interested in women's suffrage and all sorts of things. Oh, sounds dreadful. Imagine giving women the right to vote. Their place is in the home. It is Ellen. 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 Ellen Warburton. Oh, how are you? Very nice to see you again. I'm Mary Watson now. This is my husband. How do you do, Miss Warburton? How do you? Uh, how do you do? Mary, I'd heard that you'd married. Aren't you a medical detective or something, Mr. Watson? <laughs> Not quite, dear. Uh, I see... hold the degree of Doctor of Medicine from the University of London, madam. But he's helped the great Sherlock Holmes on many of his cases. So that's how I've heard of him then. Do you mind if I walk with you a little way? Of course not, Ellen. Come along. Uh, do you live near here, Miss Warburton? About four miles away, Doctor, at Chevy oh. Grange. I'm a glorified housekeeper for my uncle, Colonel Warburton. Oh, dear, that sounds rather dull for you. As a matter of fact, the state of my uncle's health at the present moment makes it anything but dull for me. That's why I asked if I might walk with you for a way. Well, what's the matter with him, Ellen? He's going mad. Before my eyes. And I can do nothing to help him. Mad? Come now, Miss Warburton, surely you... Doctor, I'm not an hysterical girl. In fact, I regard myself as something of a scientist. I studied physics for a number of years at Bristol University. And I tell you that my uncle is going insane. What are the symptoms? Most of the time, he's perfectly normal. But when these attacks are on him, he gets in the most frightful rages and says the strangest things. He's even complained of hearing a shrill, piping whistle that comes out of nowhere. I can't hear it, nor can anyone else. But uncle gets into the most dreadful state. I wonder... Would you have a look at him for me, Dr. Watson? Well, I don't... Of course, feel... John will do everything he can. Thank you so much. Then supposing you both come over for... So, my dear Holmes, at 7 o'clock this evening, we found ourselves approaching Chevy Grange. It was rather a forbidding-looking place, covering a little more than an acre, I should say. As we stood waiting for admittance, I must confess that I was not entirely... Oh. Gloomy-looking place, isn't it, Mary? It is a little forbidding, John, dear. Oh, dear. What's that? Sounds like a tom-tom. Someone singing a weird chant. Seems to be coming from the direction of that barn over there. It doesn't seem quite appropriate, dear, does it? I mean, not in the heart of Buckinghamshire. Why not knock on the door again, John? Yes, it's all right, I will. Perhaps they didn't hear us. Oh, oh, they did. Yes. It's Dr. and Mrs. Watson, my good man. Acker's the name, sir. Come in, please. The colonel's expecting you, sir. He's in the study. This way, sir. By the way, Hacker, as we were waiting outside the front door, we heard a strange chant, and it sounded as if someone was beating a, a tom-tom. Oh, that, sir. That was Miss Narder. You'll be hearing more of her. Beginning. Let's see what happened next. This uh, very unpleasant fellow hacker showed us into the study where we met Colonel Warburton. First, it was hard to believe that he was a sick man. He looked well enough, and his conversation was sprightly. Spent most of his army life in Africa as military governor in a Zulu district. And the African spears and other trophies that lined his study walls bore mute evidence to his past life. He encouraged me to tell him some of my own army experiences. Oh, dear. Poor fellow. It was really rather clever. 
There I was, Colonel Warburton, on the howdah of this wretched elephant. The river was a raging torrent and I couldn't get the confounded animal to budge. Well, <laughs> I'm a pretty strong swimmer, you know. Won several cups of swimming, as a matter of fact. Of course, I was a much younger man then. Uh, and John, I... dear. Yes, ma'am? You interrupted Colonel Warburton's story, oh, dear. Oh, sorry. I thought this little incident would be interesting to him. Uh, do go on, Colonel. Yes, uh, Your story was so interesting. Right. You were telling us that you were intercepted by an African drum code message. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I, I don't want to sound conceited, but I, I doubt if there was another Englishman in the world who could have told you what those particular drum beats meant. Oh, I don't doubt that, Colonel Warburton. Well, I'd spent a good number of years studying the native customs. I spotted the code right away. It meant that an uprising was planned to start throughout the whole province at noon the next day. Of course, I... Uh, there it is again. A devilish whistle. And you hear it, Dr. Watson? Mrs. Watson? I can hear nothing, sir. Nor can I. Of course not. No one could hear it but me. Now, 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 Colonel Warburton, don't get so excited, it's sir. It's black magic, that's what it is. Oh, really, sir, oh, black you magic. you must realize that the powers of jungle witchcraft are completely unknown in this country, Dr. Watson. But I know of them. And I can think of many people who might wish to employ them against me. Come in, come in. Oh. Oh, it's you, Nada. Great Scott, she's, she's... She's very beautiful. Nada, I want you to meet some friends of Ellen's. Dr. and Mrs. Watson. I am very pleased to meet both of you. How do you do? How do you do, Miss uh, Nada? Nada's father was a Chaga jeweler, one of the greatest Zulu chieftains I ever had the privilege of knowing. He did me the rare honor to swear blood brotherhood. So when the missionary sent Nada to England to complete her education, I insisted that she spend her first few months here under my wing. I... Listen... What is it, Colonel? That whistle again. For heaven's sake, say that you heard it this time. Please say that you did. I didn't hear a thing, sir. Well, I did. And I know where that sound came from. Nana, put down that spear at once, will you, Colonel Warburton? The devils are trying to kill me. I'll kill them first. No, no, no. Don't throw it, sir. Don't throw it. Someone's opening the door. Uncle! It's Ellen. Great Scott. The spear missed her by an inch. Uncle, what is it? Whistle. I heard it again, Ellen. And I'm going to find where it came from. I'm... Poor Uncle. Of course, you heard no sound. Nothing, Ellen. What can we do to help him, Dr. Watson? Well, it's hard to say, Miss Warburton. I'm not sure that medical help's what she needs. Uh, he seems perfectly sane and lucid, except for these strange outbursts. But we must do something. I propose to, madam. As soon as I get back to the inn, I think I'll write to my old friend Sherlock Holmes and ask... I can't feel that the man should be committed to an asylum, and yet, obviously, when these attacks are on him, he's as mad as a hatter. <laughs> well, fascinating problem, and one that calls for speedy action. I think a telegram to my friend Watson might help to clarify some aspects of the case. Yes. You see, uh, Dr. John H. Watson, Red Lion Inn, Taplow Bucks. I suggest that you ascertain one... One important fact, does the Warburton household have a dog? <laughs> Telegraph reply, Holmes. <laughs> oh, my soul, Mary, that's a cryptic answer to my letter. Yes, dear, it is. I'm afraid Ellen will be disappointed. She's coming over to join us for lunch to see if you have any news. Well, what on earth can dogs have to do with the case? I can't possibly... Ma Here's Helen now. Good morning, Ellen. Hello, Mary. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, good morning. I suppose it's too early to have received any reply from Mr. Holmes. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I just got this telegram from him. You can read it if you like. I can't see it. It makes much sense, Miss Hill. But that's extraordinary. I did have a little dog. He was killed a week ago. But it didn't occur to me to tell you about it yesterday. Well, that's amazing. How could Mr. Holmes have known about uh, it? There's very little that Holmes doesn't know, my dear. How was your dog killed, Miss Warburton? I found him in the grounds with his head smashed in by a stone. Oh, how dreadful. Who do you think did it? It might have been a poacher. And then again, it might have been... Your uncle? It's possible. When he's in those rages, I don't think he knows what he's doing. That's very important. I think I shall go and send Holmes a telegram at once. Don't wait lunch for me. did we have to walk over to the station, John, dear? To see if there was an answer at the station telegraph office to the wire that I sent Holmes. 
Oh, it's only 4.30, dear. It's hardly possible for him to have answered as quickly as that. In any case, they deliver the telegram to the hotel, you know. Well, it was a nice walk, my dear. Hello, there's a, a train in the station now. I wonder where it's from. Why don't you ask Pat Porter, dear? That's not a bad idea. Uh, Porter, eh? what train is this? Oh, it's the London train, sir. Right on time. Next stop, ready? Not many people getting off, are there? Greg Scott, <laughs> look who's here. Oh, dear, it's Mr. Holmes. And he's got a dog on a leash. Oh, Holmes. Watson, my dear fellow, how are you? This is Watson. How nice to see you again. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Oh, I'm Holmes. I'm delighted you're here, old fellow. We walked over to the station to see if you'd answered my telegram. And <laughs> here you are in person. <laughs> it occurred to me that I could be down here in the same time that it would take a telegram to reach you. And I decided that a day or two in the country would make a person change. Apart from the fact that Colonel Warburton's problem interests me enormously. Why on earth did you bring a dog? I felt that this was a case in which a dog would be of invaluable assistance. Oh, be careful, John. Yes, look out, old chap. I, uh, I think it would be safer not to pat him. I picked him up in the Mile End Road for a couple of florins, and I fear he's a dog that should have remained in London. A singularly unattractive nature seems to have been entirely ruined by an hour's train ride. Unpleasant brute, isn't he? By the way, Holmes, what do you make of the case from my letters? Well, I should prefer to reserve my judgment until I've met the colonel. However, I will vouchsafe one opinion. Oh, what's that? To paraphrase a proverb, don't disbelieve all you don't hear. I can't think why someone doesn't answer. They can't all be out. Well, while we're waiting, I think I'll tie the dog up to this tree here. I don't want my arrival to too much commotion. Quiet! Quiet! Well, don't you think perhaps we could try the door, John? Yes, certainly. It's a good idea. Hello, hello. It's unlocked. Then let's go in, old fellow. Let's go in. Colonel Warburton? Colonel Warburton? Ellen? Uh, Ellen? What was the name of that, that butler fellow? Hacker. Yes, of course, that's it, Hacker. Uh, Hacker! Hacker! We appear to be in an empty house. The dog! Oh, fool that I am, I shouldn't have left him here. Come on! Ah. Oh. We're too late. Oh, the poor dog. He's been killed. Yes, poor brute. Stabbed to death by one of the Colonel's spears. That proves it, Holmes. The man is mad. I think not, Watson. I think it proves that Colonel Warburton is a great deal more sane than some of the members of his household. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. Time for me to remind you that there's one secret every smart woman knows. Simply, good wine makes good food taste better. And by good wine... Naturally, I mean Petri wine. Try a Petri wine with your dinner. If you want a wonderful red wine, try Petri California Burgundy. If you want a perfect white wine, try Petri California Sauterne. In fact, try them both. You'll agree, I'm sure, that next to your good cooking, nothing can do more for a meal than a glass of good wine. A glass of Petri wine. <laughs> And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, the story of Colonel Warburton's madness. Holmes, why are we heading for this barn? Seems to me we should be back in the house. Why, old chap? Found the house empty. Besides, I thought I heard. Shh, shh, shh. What is it? Listen. It's the same sound that Mary and I heard yesterday. Once more, it's coming from the barn. Come on, Watson, but quietly. We can see through this window here. It's that Zulu girl, Nada. She's beating a drum and chanting. Who's the man with her? It's Colonel Warburton. No, it isn't. It's that servant fellow, Hacker. What in thunder is he doing here? Apparently assisting Miss Nada in some of her uh, African mysticism. It's black magic they're dabbling with, just as the Colonel said. Let's go in and catch him red-handed. No, no, no. Stay quiet. We'll talk to them soon enough. The moment I feel it's uh, much more urgent that we find Colonel Warburton. Come on. There's 
There's a colonel pacing up and down in front of the house with Mary and his, and his niece, Miss Warburton. We shouldn't have left the women alone with him, you know. The man's dangerous. I don't think the women have been in any danger, Watson. John, dear, where have you been? Oh, well, Holmes and I decided we'd do take a little walk. It proved very interesting. Uh, Miss Warburton, uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Mr. Holmes? I'm so glad you're here. How do you do, Miss Warburton? And this is Colonel Warburton, Mr. Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, eh? I suppose you think I killed your wretched dog. Well, I might have done it. When I hear that whistle, something seems to snap in my brain. I might have killed it. Why doesn't your doctor friend certify me as insane? Send me where I belong before I do any worse, Nemi. Poor man. Isn't there anything you can do for him, Mr. Holmes? I most certainly will try to, Miss Warburton. What's no fellow? I wonder if you'd follow the colonel and give him a sedative. I'm afraid he has quite an ordeal before mm. him. What's over, well, Holmes? Miss Warburton, where were you when my dog was killed? Down in the greenhouse. As soon as I heard the poor animal yelping, I ran up to the house. I see. Mr. Holmes, you are going to be able to help the colonel, aren't you? I'm convinced of it, Mrs. Watson. That is why I brought a dog with me from London. But now that he's dead, I... I must obtain another one before I can proceed further with the case. Now, I wonder where on earth I can find well, John. Look, look. Huh? Down by the gate, there's a little girl walking with the dog. That's Sarah Entwistle, the daughter of our neighbours. Sarah, eh? Oh, excuse me, will you? Just a moment. Oh, Sarah. Sarah, my dear, what a, uh, what a pretty dog you have there. What's his name? It's a her. Her name's Boojum. What's your name? <laughs> Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock? <laughs> That's a funny name. Yes, yes, it is, isn't it? Uh, look here, Sarah. Uh, here's a nice, shiny half-crown for you. Why are you giving me money? Well, because I love dogs, and I, I want to borrow, um, what did you call him? Boojum. Boojum, oh, yes, yes. I want to borrow Boojum for half an hour. Why? Well, I... I want to, uh, I want to play with her, Sarah. You can play with her here. She's awfully friendly. <laughs> well, you see, I, I, I really want to take her for a nice walk. Why? She's just had one. Now, look here, Sarah. It's a beautifully shiny half-crown. Mommy's told me I mustn't take money from strangers. But I'm not a stranger. I'm a friend of Colonel Warburton. Having trouble, Mr. Holmes? Yes, I am, Mrs. Watson. You see, I, I want to give Sarah half a crown for borrowing Boojum for a short while, but she, well, she doesn't want to do it. Sarah, does Boojum like bones? Oh. Oh, yes. Loves them. We've got a lot of bones up at the house we'd like to give her. Have they got plenty of meat on them? Mm, plenty. She can have a wonderful feast and then we'll bring her back in half an hour. All right. Go on, Boojum. Now promise you'll bring her back in half an oh, hour. Oh, we promise. Yes, Sarah. And, and, and Sarah, what about the, uh, uh, what about the half crown? Well, I'll take it home and ask Mummy if I may keep it. Good. Goodbye. Goodbye. And take care of Boojum. <laughs> oh, she's a sweet little girl. Mr. Holmes, you're not going to expose Boojum to any danger, are you? None, Mrs. Watson. Otherwise, I shouldn't have borrowed her. I'm convinced that Boojum will give us the clue to what appears to be Colonel Warburton's madness. Now, let me see. We're all here. Miss Warburton, the Colonel, Miss Nada, Hacker, and the dog Boojum. Yes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I propose to conduct an experiment before I conduct it, I should like to point out the chronology of the events in this case. First, Miss Nader arrived here. Mr. Holmes, you're not suggesting uh, uh, Please that. let me finish, Miss Nader. First, Miss Nader arrived here. Second, the Colonel first heard the mysterious whistle. Third, your dog was killed, Miss Warburton. Fourth, the whistling set in in dead earnest. Uh, the Colonel Warburton and Miss Warburton. Doesn't that pattern suggest anything to you? No, I... I can't say that it does, Mr. Holmes. I don't see what you're driving at. Well, more do I, Holmes. We should be more explicit. Very well, then I will. I shall uh, now conduct my experiment. I want you all to watch Colonel Warburton and the dog Boojum. Excuse me while I turn my back. Now. Oh. There it is again. That whistle. The dog heard it, too. Great yeah. oh. Holmes. What does it mean? It means that this wooden whistle in my hand is the answer to the mystery. The sound made by this cunningly designed instrument is above the normal range of pitch. You see, the colonel has hypersensitive ears. But the dog heard it. Perhaps I should have said the normal human range of pitch. Then do you suppose someone has deliberately been trying to drive the colonel mad? Of course, Mary. That's why the dogs were murdered. Whoever it was knew that a dog would give the game away. And it's not hard to guess who that someone is. Nada, this started when you came here. Is this your gratitude for the colonel's kindness to you? Endangering his sanity with your evil black magic? That is not true. Uh, one moment, please, Miss Warburton. Miss Nutter. 
Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, Dr. Watson and I watched you in the barn some three quarters of an hour ago with Hacker. Were you engaged in practicing any form of black magic? No, no. I was praying to my old gods to save the Colonel's sanity. What were you doing there, Hacker? Don't tell me you were praying to old gods, too. Well, I used to be a chapel going man, sir, but I don't know. No harm in trying something new, I always say. In any case, why should Miss Nada wish to persecute the Colonel? It might be for some tribal revenge. Oh, but that's ridiculous, Alan. Her father and I were sworn blood brothers. Exactly, sir. No, it should be obvious. Who had a motive for making the Colonel appear mad? His niece and heiress. What do you mean? She has studied physics, you will remember, and so could know about supersonic research. Possibly she was afraid the Colonel might leave his estate to Miss Nada and so wished him to appear insane and thereby invalidate a new will. Why? In any case, I found this whistle in a drawer in your room, Miss Warburton. Ellen! Ellen, how could you? I did it for your sake, to save you from Nada. She's just an adventuress, only you won't see it. Colonel Warburton, what action do you wish me to take regarding your niece, Miss Warburton? My niece? I have no niece, Mr. Holmes. Come, Nada, my dear. Oh, what an amazing case, Holmes. Mary, wasn't it clever the way Holmes solved it? It was very interesting, dear. I was quite enthralled. Oh, now I think I shall return to London and let you two finish your holiday in peace. Before you do that, Mr. Holmes, there's one thing we should do. What, Mary? Boo jump. <laughs> we promised, you know. Oh, yes, yes, of course, of course. I think the three of us might walk her home. But before we do that, I suggest we rummage through the kitchen. The kitchen? What on earth for? Bones, dear. Exactly. And bones with plenty of meat on them. Say, Doctor, that was a swell story. And look, uh, you mean there really is a whistle that only dogs can hear? I thought you'd ask me that question, so I've got one of those whistles to show you. There. Well, there's nothing unusual about it. Blow it, Doctor. Well, listen, Mr. Bartell, if, if I want you to come quickly, I don't just have to whistle. All I have to say is, would anybody like a glass of Petri wine? And, hey, hey, presto, there you are. <laughs> well, can you blame me? I know a good wine when I hear it. And Petri wine sure is good wine. It ought to be. The Petri family's been making wine for generations. As you know, ever since they started the Petri business, way back in the 1800s, that business has always been family-owned and operated. So just think of all the experience the Petri family's gained. They've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, all they've ever learned about the art of turning luscious California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. So whenever you're choosing a wine, a wine to serve before dinner, with dinner, or at any time, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Engineer's Thumb. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. The Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, Pet, Petri wine. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I remember one instance when um, the uh, culprit was not Willie. It was really Dennis's fault. He'd be naughty about putting an in-joke in the script. Holmes and Watson had to meet someone at a hotel... And he gave the hotel a name which was recognized by all the 
former denizens of London as that of a house of ill repute. Well, there were various comments about that, and Edna said, oh, but it's a very high-class one. Order was restored, and the rehearsal continued. Um, they read on. Holmes and Watson were making their way through the fog to this rendezvous until Watson exclaimed, There it is now. I see the red light. Edna used to permit a certain amount of this, but she would uh, clamp down firmly because it was a tight schedule. This is Ben Wright. Phyllis White and I will return shortly with another new adventure of Sherlock Holmes. We return again to Phyllis White, who has some more delightful information about the Sherlock Holmes radio broadcasts. Phyllis? Rathbone and Bruce were making films, and they had just one day off per week for the radio work. They received the scripts a couple of days early to look over if they had time, and they would turn up at the studio early the afternoon of broadcast day. And the first reading would be... Um, rather slow and broken up as there was discussion and maybe a few changes. Then there would be a reading for timing to fit to the exact number of minutes available. It was more likely to be too long than too short. And Edna would flip over a few pages and knock out a couple of words here and a couple on another page and it would miraculously come out exact to the minute. And so they went through the rest of the afternoon as they Tempo and pressure increased and the show sharpened up. At the end of the afternoon, they went on the air for the eastern United States. Then there was a couple of hours break, and everybody would go out to dinner. Then they would come back and do it all over again for the West Coast. I feel very thankful now that these live and ephemeral shows were captured on disc and that they could now reach a new audience. Now, please join Phyllis and I as we listen to The Iron Box. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Well, this is it, New Year's Eve. And I wish you could be here with us this evening so we could toast each other with a glass of Petri California port. As you know, port wine has long been a favorite wine for celebrating a happy occasion. That's because port is a wine rich in tradition. And you couldn't ask for a more delicious port than Petri Port. Petri Port is a deep, glowing red color. Beautiful to look at and wonderful to taste. With a hearty, full flavor that's right from the heart of the grape. And when you serve Petri Port to your friends tonight or, or any time, remember you can serve it proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wine. <laughs> And now I'm sure Dr. Watson's waiting for us, so let's drop in and see him. From Radio City in New York, the Judy Canova Show, brought to you each week by the Colgate Palm Olive Feet Company, makers of palm olive soap and Colgate tooth powder. <laughs> your beauty, hope, and Colgate tooth powder for a breath of sweet. Present the Judy Canova Show with Mel Blank, Ruby Dandridge, Joe Kern, Richard Coogan, Minerva Pius, Ernie Fiorito and his orchestra, and starring Judy Canova. Oh, wasn't built in a day. You 
have to pay for what you get. I will be here when you find me, so come and find me, my little pet. Judy is in New York, but uh, how she got here is a different story. As we look in on her now, she has just finished writing a letter to her Aunt Agatha. Say, Geranium. Yes, Miss Judy? I've just written a letter to Aunt Aggie telling her about our trip. I'll read it to you to see if I left anything out. Okay, honey. Says, Dear Aunt Aggie, just arrived from California. Travel first class. Gosh, them freight cars sure are stuffy. No kidding, we did all right, except when I first got to my car, I found a dog in my upper berth. So I said, Conductor, there's a dog in this upper berth. I can't understand it. And he said, I can't understand it neither. That dog paid for a lower. Oh. <laughs> Finally, Miss Judy, I didn't hear about that. Say, what'd you say to the dog? Well, Geranium, what do you think I said? I says, Lassie, go home. <laughs> well, what else you write, honey? I said, um, Pedro went to the club car and had a weekend cocktail. You drink it and your weekend's right there. <laughs> Oh, you've had them. Don't give me that stuff. <laughs> it's so powerful you can bite off the end of the olive and use it as a hand grenade. You know those kinds. Yeah, well, did you tell your aunt anything about the taxi cabs here in New York? Yeah, listen to this, Geranium. Mm-hmm. The taxis here ain't like Los Angeles. They don't blow their horns and scare you half to death. They chase you across the sidewalk and run you up the side of the building. <laughs> You know something, Geranium, I saw an awful, terrible accident yesterday on Fifth Avenue. You did? What happened? Well, sir, a lady came weaving down the street, wrapped her car around the lamppost, and when a policeman ran over and said, let me see your license, she said, you mean with driving like that I can get a license? <laughs> hey, you know something, Yeah, you know she did? she did? She got it. She what did. is it, Geranium? Yes, well, you know, those cross-town buses is the ones that fascinates me. They go up one street, come back on another street. Yeah, I guess they're ashamed to come back on the same street to go up on. <laughs> well, how'd you finish your letter to your enemy, Judy? Oh, let me see. Where was it? No, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Have a nice room. It's air-conditioned with a lovely view of the skyline. They hope to have the roof on by Christmas. <laughs> it is just as well you didn't come down to the station to see us off when we left Los Angeles because some very funny things happened there. We got there about 15 minutes Green Diamond Special leaving on track nine. All aboard for Kansas City, Amarillo, Newcomb-Carey, Ashtabula, Asayampa, and Ebbets Field. <laughs> car is ours. The following cars are ready for occupation. All aboard. Well, which car was that supposed to be? The smoking car. <laughs> Geranium, have we got everything? Oh, yeah, honey. We prepared for any emergency. Yeah, I'm even carrying my trusty old 45 on my hip. 
A forty-five revolver? No, a forty-five girdle. <laughs> I bet you thought I was a pistol-packing mama. Well, I don't know about the pistol, but you sure got plenty of packing. <laughs> Say, Geranium, I'm a little mixed up. Are we riding on the Challenger? The Challenger? Not me, honey. <laughs> All my money's riding on Joe Lewis. <laughs> attention, attention, please. The Pine Valley Express is arriving on track five at five o'clock. The Phoenix Flyer is leaving on track five at five o'clock. Golly, both trains on the same track. Won't there be a collision? Yes, isn't this the silliest way to run a railroad? <laughs> Gee, Geranium, look at all those servicemen. Oh, gosh, I wish some big old handsome sergeant would come up to me and say... Pardon me for talking in your face, senorita. <laughs> Pedro, where have you been with all our luggage? You're the sleepiest person I ever saw. Don't you ever do anything fast? Gee, I can get tired awful fast. <laughs> senorita, I'm sorry I'm late, but I just joined the Girl Scouts. Girl Scout? Why, I saw you with some sailors. See, we were scouting for girls. <laughs> Senorita, this is the first time I ever had to pay my fare on a train. Oh, well, Pedro, how do you usually travel? Well, my cousin Gonzalez, he packs me in my suitcase, and I leave one hand sticking out. What for? So I can carry the suitcase. <laughs> Something awful happened. A little animal got in my luggage. A little animal? See, si, the little punky got in my trunk. <laughs> he spilled all my junk. <laughs> so I gave me clunk. <laughs> now I am strong. Why? It was a strong. <laughs> Can you mean I have a poem for the new mayor when we get to New York? Well, how does it go, Pedro? There once was a man named O'Dwyer, a man who was a live wire. He's the man of the hour, but he's no little flower. He never runs out to a fire. <laughs> Pedro, you know something? If you recite that poem, the mayor's liable to give us the key to the city. And then change all the locks. <laughs> well, here's our train. Let's get on and find our seat. Hurry up, folks. This train goes to New York in 15 minutes. Ain't that wonderful? It used to take four days. <laughs> Easy there, young lady. Watch your step, young lady. This step is awfully high. Oh, watch it. I don't have to. Those sailors are watching it for me. a question from Colgate Tooth Powder. If you've not been asked to change your name, could a breath of trouble be to blame? You know that little breath of trouble, I mean unpleasing breath, can hamper your popularity, mark you down socially. It's happened to thousands without their knowing. So just do this. Brush your teeth night and morning and before every date with Colgate Tooth Powder. For Colgate Tooth Powder cleans your breath as it cleans your teeth. Yes, scientific tests have definitely proved that in seven cases out of ten, Colgate tooth powder instantly stops unpleasing breath that originates in the mouth. What's more, no dentifrice at any price cleans your teeth more quickly and thoroughly than Colgate tooth powder. Remember to buy it first thing, and remember the name, Colgate tooth powder, with the accent on powder. Don't take a chance with your romance. Use Colgate tooth powder. Well, Geranium, before you know it, we'll be in Chicago. Yeah, Miss Judy, it sure has been a nice trip. Get your box lunches here, folks. Get your box lunches here. Uh, box lunch, folks? No, thanks. I just ate one of them box lunches. Get your bicarbonate of soda here, folks. <laughs> Say, I wonder where Pedro is. 
Here I am, senorita. I've been up for hours. I always get up at the crack of dawn. You do? See, si. and I stuff up the crack and go back to bed. <laughs> but, senorita, last night when the train stopped in Kansas City, the shades was up and I couldn't sleep a wink. Oh, Pedro, why didn't you pull the shades down? Well, I couldn't reach that far. They was across the street in the YWCA. <laughs> senorita, this morning I met a pretty girl in a club car. What was she like, Pedro? Describe her. The scribe, senorita? Yeah, well, I, you know, I mean, was she tall? Was she short? What color were her eyes and so forth? Well, I don't know about her eyes and her face, but oh, that ends so far. <laughs> candy peanuts chewing gum. Candy peanuts chewing gum. Say, mister, what you got there? Sardine sandwiches. Yeah, 25 cents for the domestic and a dollar and a quarter for the imported sardines. What's the extra dollar for? Uh, the imported ones come from Sweden. Well, give me the domestic ones. I ain't gonna pay no sardines fare across the ocean. <laughs> Let them swim across. You know, I packed a lunch of ham and Limburger sandwiches myself, but I had to throw it away. Yeah, why? Well, the ham might have made it to Chicago, but the Limburger should have got off at Pasadena. <laughs> and that joke should have got off at Glendale. <laughs> and I should have got off before I got... Uh-oh, here comes that fellow who got on at Kansas City. I wonder what he wants. Hello there, girly. Just saw you talking to the candy butcher. You like men, I gather. Shucks, I like men anybody gathers. <laughs> hey, uh, mind if I sit down here? Well, now, I don't know. Thanks. I like to look at the scenery, but I forgot my glasses. Well, we're going through some pretty country. I'll point out the beauties to you. Oh, you don't have to point, sister. When I see one, I'll just whistle. Yee-hoo! <laughs> Ain't that a Jim Dandy? You tell him, tissue paper, you're terrible. Ha, ha, ha! Say, uh, <laughs> my, my name is Roscoe Wordle. I'm a traveling salesman. I got a line of fancy notions. Well, you better change your line, mister. I got a notion that ain't going over so well. <laughs> Say, ain't you kind of old to be flirting with a girl like me? Me? Old? Well, I'm just sneaking up on 27. Well, you better turn around. You're sneaking up on it from the wrong direction. <laughs> Hey, tell me something. Are you married? You tell him, Chimney. I don't smoke. Oh, that's a killer. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm married to the finest little woman you ever saw. Here's a picture of her. Say, she is mighty pretty. You tell him, typewriter head. Your next Underwood. Woohoo! I'm loaded tonight. <laughs> And took first prize in the beauty contest back home. She took first prize? You bet. But they made her put it back. Ha, ha, ha! Ain't that a piece of Reno? Ah, does it ain't. Yes, sir. You know, she's the finest little woman that ever lived. <laughs> she sure broke me up when she ran away with my best friend. Now, who is your best friend? Whoever she ran away with. Ha, ha, ha! <laughs> that ain't so bad. Well, so long, girlie. That feller's mother must have been scared by can you top this. <laughs> Gee, if you want to get something to eat, you better get into the dining car. That's right, Geranium. I'll go in for lunch right now. Hello, Miss Canova. I have a place for you. Oh, uh, do you mind sitting at the same table with that handsome gentleman? Well, I don't know, Stuart. That handsome gentleman is annoying me. Why, Miss Canova, he hasn't even looked at you. I know. That's what's annoying me. <laughs> Howdy, mister. Oh, how do you do? Well, won't you sit down? Thanks. Nice day, ain't it? Yes. Pretty scenery, ain't it? Yes. Kind of cold back here, too, ain't it? Yes. Golly, give this fellow a little encouragement, he'll talk an arm off you. <laughs> Say, mister, ain't you even going to talk to me? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I was preoccupied. Have you heard the rumors? What rumors? I heard we have a terrible washout on this road. Oh, shucks. I always look like this when I sleep on my face. <laughs> have you ever been east before? No, but my aunt is in politics in California, and I met some prominent New Yorkers. Yeah, Mr. Farley came up to my house, and Mr. Dewey came up to my ranch. How about LaGuardia? He came up to my knees. <laughs> Almost. 
<laughs> By the yes. way, are you on a pleasure trip? I sure am, boy. I'm going to New York to see the World's Fair. The World's Fair? Why, that ended five years ago. Five years ago? Yes. Doggone that Pacific Coast time. It always keeps throwing me off. <laughs> Waiting for the train to come in Waiting for my man to come home I've counted every minute of each live long day Then some melancholy says he went away I've shed a million teardrops or more Waiting for the one I adore I'm waiting in the depot by the railroad track Looking for the choo-choo train that brings him back I'm waiting for my life to begin Waiting for the train to come in I've shed a million teardrops or more Waiting for the one I adore in the depot by the railroad track Just looking for the juicy train that brings him back I'm waiting for my life to begin Yes, I'm waiting for the train to come in That is Judy Canova singing Waiting for the Train to Come In Remember, doctors prove Tom Olive's beauty results It's true Doctors prove palm olive soap can bring two out of three women a more beautiful complexion in just 14 days. And this plan was tested on women with all types of skin. Even women with dry skin, oily skin, rough skin, women as old as 50, even women whose skin wasn't clear. Yes, 36 doctors, leading skin specialists, have proved the 14-day palm olive plan improves all types of skin. Yes, brings fresher, brighter, younger-looking complexions. Start your 14-day palm olive plan now. It's as simple as one, two, three. Here's all you do. One. Wash your face with palm olive soap. Two. Then massage your face for 60 seconds with palm olive's soft, lovely lather. You see, one full minute of this cleansing massage brings your skin palm olive's full beautifying effect. Three. Then rinse. Do this just three times a day for 14 days. And that's all. Remember, doctors prove this beauty plan with palm olive soap. Brought two out of three of all women tested a more beautiful complexion in just 14 days. No matter what beauty care they used before. So get palm olive soap. See what palm olive can do for your own complexion in only 14 days. And for tub or shower, for loveliness all over, get the new big thrifty bath size palm olive. <laughs> Geranium, this cab driver's been driving us around New York for hours. Yeah, reminds me of the time I gave a soldier a lift out in Los Angeles. Yeah, that was very patriotic, too, Miss Judy. Did the soldier try to hold your hand? No. Nope. Did he try to hug you? No. Nope. Didn't he even want to kiss you? No. Nope. Then what'd you do? I sent him back for more basic training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that boy sure needed it, too. Say, driver, will you take it a little easy? This is the first time I've ever rode in a taxi. Oh, that's all right, kid. This is the first time I ever drove one. <laughs> Say, this sure is a funny-looking cab. What's that hole in the roof for? Oh, that's in case I get a fare with a bass fiddle. <laughs> hey, what is that picture there by your driver's license? What's that? That's my identification. Only your cab drivers have to have them. Yeah, but that's not your picture. What's the idea of putting Lana Turner's picture on your license? I don't know. I guess it's just a dreamer in me. <laughs> well, here we are, Geranium. How much do I owe you, driver? I'll check the meter, kid. Roughly $37.50. Well, that's a little too rough. You better smooth it out a little. <laughs> and say, driver, it's only six bucks from here to where you picked us up. What's the idea of detouring us to Brooklyn and back? Well, you see, kid, I was born in Brooklyn. And every now and then I get a yearning to see the motherland. <laughs> I wish 
we could find a place to live. You know, we even tried to find an apartment in the Umpire State Building. You mean Empire? No, I mean Umpire. We couldn't get the first base. <laughs> Say, maybe I can help you. You know, there's a place for rent in the joint where I live. It's a one-room apartment with an adjoining. Yeah, with an adjoining what? I don't know. We never could get that other door open. <laughs> well, anyway, we'll keep on looking. Gee, Geranium, ain't New York a swell city, though? Yes, ma'am. Look over there. There's a statue of General Sherman riding a horse and carrying a sword. General Sherman. Poor feller. Golly, they ought to give him a shotgun instead of that sword. Yeah, what for? So he could shoot them pigeons off his hat. <laughs> Say, here's the hotel where Pedro said he'd meet us. Gee, Willikers, look at this man in the fancy uniform by the door. Yeah, and look at all those medals he's wearing. Say, mister, are you a veteran? Uh, yes. Four years at Macy's. <laughs> well, what are those medals for? Honorable discharge. You see, I worked in the corset department, and I was injured during a bargain sale. <laughs> A bargain sale in the corset department? Yes, it was a counterattack in the Battle of the Bulge. <laughs> well, come on, Geranium. we got to find a place to live. Come on, let's hurry. Time's a-wasting. <laughs> Golly, I hope they got some rooms for rent here. Yeah, what can I do for you? Oh, uh, is this Mr. Broadmoor's boarding house? Yeah. Well, we're looking for some rooms. Well, you got a mighty nice day for it. I'm sorry, Miss Canova, we have no vacancies in this part of the hotel, but we have three lovely rooms in the annex. Oh, good. I'll take them. Where is the annex? In Pittsburgh. <laughs> Howdy, lady. Have you got any rooms? Well, we're very particular about whom we take in. Do you have any identification? Sure. I have a little ward on my arm. Senorita, is that any way to talk about me? <laughs> Is that any good? Young lady, our cuisine is superb. Yeah, I know that, but is the food any good? <laughs> our food is famous. Every day we serve two-way meatballs. Two-way meatballs? Yes, they melt in your mouth and harden in your stomach. <laughs> Hi, mister. I don't suppose you got any rooms. Why, yes, we just had a cancellation. I can put you in the bridal suite, in the presidential suite, the manager's suite. The housekeeper's... The janitor... How about an upper on the pool table? <laughs> Gee, I'm sure sorry you ain't got no rooms. This lobby sure is beautiful. Especially that white wallpaper with them pretty red blotches on it. That's pretty. Oh, yes, we're very proud of that white wallpaper with a lovely red pattern. It was designed by an expert from House and Gar... House and... Good housekeeper. He was an interior decorator. He was a well-known painter... A... A paper hang. A pa Forget it. We threw a ripe tomato in the electric fan. <laughs> well, Geranium, how do you like this room? Miss Judy, where'd you get it? Oh, boy, I'm telling you, these New Yorkers ain't gonna outsmart me. Well, I'm, I got this room, but just answering a won't ad. Yes, sir, I got a six-month lease for $200. Well, don't look now, but this is the waiting room in the Pennsylvania station. The waiting room in the Pennsylvania station? It sure is, honey. What made you answer that ad? Well, it said large room, hot and cold running water next to fine restaurant and close to transportation. <laughs> Thousands of married men in the armed forces have become fathers while they were overseas. And they're coming home now to the greatest thrill they've ever known. The thrill of seeing their babies for the first time. So tonight, I'd like to sing a song especially for them. Go to sleepy little baby. Go to sleepy little baby. When you wake, you patty, patty cake and ride a shiny little pony. Daddy's coming home to baby. Daddy's coming home to baby. Stop your crying, daddy will be by and you a shiny little pony. Hush by the little baby. By and by the little baby. Daddy's gonna be home with you and me. Then we'll never be so lonely Go to sleepy little baby Go to sleepy little baby When you wake you fatty fatty cake And ride a shiny little pony Rock 
talk about baby in the treetop when the wind blows the cradle will rock when the bow breaks the cradle will fall down will This is Tom Shirley asking you to follow the 14-day palm olive plan for a lovelier complexion and don't take a chance with your romance. Use Colgate tooth powder night and morning and before every date. Ladies, I know you're all happy that meat rationing has ended. No more red points, no more ration rumpusing. Ah, that's wonderful. But wait a minute. Let me read you a message from Secretary of Agriculture Anderson who says... Even though rationing is ended, there still remains the need for preventing waste of any fats and for salvaging all used fats so essentially needed for the manufacture of soap and for other industrial uses. If your dealer doesn't have all the soap you want, it's doubtless due to a shortage of fat. So here's your big chance to hasten supplies of soap, save and sell all the waste cooking fats you can. Remember, where there's fat, there's soap. Your butcher will still pay you four cents a pound for used cooking fat. So fill a tin and turn it in. Now, here's Judy. Folks, it was awfully nice being with you tonight, and I hope we'll all be together again next Saturday night. In the meantime, please don't forget the two products that bring us together each week, palm olive soap and Colgate tooth powder, the bestest in the world. This is Judy Canova from New York saying, Good night, soldier, wherever you may be. My and Henry Hopo. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the whistler. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. The Strange Sisters. The three Randall girls were as different from each other as day and night. Even the people of Newton who had watched them grow up found it hard to accept the fact that they were sisters. 
Pamela, the eldest, was forceful and overbearing, heavy set and unattractive. Kathy, the youngest, was a weakling. Life was a little too complicated for her, and she found the easiest solution was to let Pamela face it, to bring her problems to Pamela, to listen meekly to Pamela's instructions, and then to quietly obey. Yes, Pamela and Kathy were two extremes. And Sally, the third sister, was in the middle, both in age and temperament. The combination of Pamela's strength and Kathy's frailty had produced in Sally a kind of radiance that had made life easy for her, that had made her sure of success where her sisters had failed. And the more she succeeded, the harder it became for Pamela and Kathy to face it. Until one morning, Mrs. Stokes, the housekeeper, called Kathy for breakfast. There was no answer. Miss Kathy, your breakfast is on the table. Oh, that girl takes a team of horses to get her out of bed. Miss Kathy, your breakfast is ready, young lady, and I ain't going to keep it warm for you another moment. Miss Kathy, answer me. I know you're... Good Lord. Locked. And now, my key. Here. Miss Kathy, what are you... <coughs> Gas. The heater. Oh, where's the handle? <coughs> there. Miss Pamela! Miss Pamela, come up quick! Oh, the window. <coughs> there. Miss Pam! What's the matter? What's the matter with you? Oh, it's Kathy. She's... Oh, Miss Pamela. Yes. Uh, Miss Kathy? Miss Kathy? Here, here like me. Yes. Kathy. Kathy, dear. Yes. Let me see here. Her pulse. Hmm. Oh, she's alive. Call Dr. Johnson quickly. Well, do you think she's... Don't stand there like an idiot. Call the doctor. Yes, Miss Pamela. Right away. Hello, Pamela. Well, it's nice of you to leave your work, Sally. That's a peculiar remark to make. I think it's apropos of the moment. I don't. As usual, I suppose we disagree. Oh, where is she? In there with Dr. Johnson. Will she be all right? I don't know yet. Well, I'm going in and... Wait a minute. You're not going in there. You can't stop me, Pamela. I've got a right to know. And since you didn't choose to tell me over the phone, I'll find out for myself. I said wait. Kathy is my sister too, Pamela. She doesn't belong to you. You've had her under your thumb for so long, the poor girl can't even think for herself. All right, go on in if you want to kill her. What do you mean by that? I've managed to convince Dr. Johnson it was an accident. It was an accident. She left the gas heater on and You've never been very clever, Sally. Kathy tried to kill herself. You're wrong. You're making it up. She didn't have a reason. I admit it wasn't a very good reason, but it's been used a thousand times. Go on. It's a man, Sally, and a rather shabby specimen at that. She was in love? Yes. How long has it been going on? Six months or more. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. Who is it, Pamela? Your fiancé. Henry? Why? Oh, you're wrong. You must be wrong. He never gave her any reason. He's, he's hardly even spoken to her. You asked me and I told you. Pamela, where did Kathy get the idea that Henry French was in love with her? Tell me, Pamela. Where did it come from? I don't know. You stepped into that part of her life, too, didn't you? Answer me. Oh, come now, Sally. Don't distort that pretty finishing school face of yours. It's your biggest asset, you know. It's gotten you everything you ever wanted. There's no end to what it can do. How can you be so contemptible? Maybe I was wrong. Maybe you are clever. Insinuating your way into father's confidence. Bowing and scraping. Playing the faithful daughter when he was ill. That's why father left everything to you when he died. $50,000 and two sisters to provide for, if and when you felt like it. We're your favorite charity, aren't we? That's part of the act, too. Lady Bountiful. I've heard all I want to hear, Pamela. Very well, perhaps you'd better go. I'm going to see Kathy whether you like it or not. You see, I was wrong. I'm admitting it. Oh? I was wrong in leaving you and Kathy under the same roof. I just hope it isn't too late to do anything about it. Perhaps you're forgetting it's my roof, too. As long as I choose to let you stay here, Pamela. Hmm. It's funny, isn't it, Pamela? You try to be fair. You try to do the right thing, and it all blows up in your face. Well, Dr. Johnson? I think she's going to be all right. May I see her, Doctor? Uh, she asked for Pamela. Oh, well, I'm sure if she knows I'm uh, here. Perhaps you'd better wait, Sally. She was rather specific. 
What do you mean, specific? She doesn't want to see you, Sally. Oh. I'll go in, Doctor. Are you going to wait, Sally? No. I'll go. I left her prescription on the dresser, Pamela. Three drops and half a glass of water every four hours. Uh, may I drop you off somewhere, Sally? Oh, thank you, Doctor. Kathy? Kathy, are you all right? No. No, I'm not all right. I'll never be all right anymore. You mustn't feel that way, dear. I made a mess of this, too. I never do things right, do I, Pam? What will... What will Henry think of me now? They only know what I told them, Kathy. They think it was an accident. Don't worry about Henry, dear. You must have been wrong, Pam. He doesn't love me. He couldn't. He would have told me. He wouldn't have just gone off with Sally. Well, maybe you'll believe me now, Kathy. She's capable of anything. She owns it all now. The house, the money, and now Henry French. Don't you see, Kathy? He was the only thing she didn't have. He was yours. And she made up her mind she wanted him, too. He never told me. Of course me. he didn't, Sally. Never gave him a chance. I hate her. It's awful, Pam, but I can't help it. I hate her. So do I. What can we do? Well, well maybe you'd better rest a while now. No, no. Now tell me, Pam. What are we going to do? There's a way. Yes, there is a way. What? Kathy. Kathy, we're going to kill her. <laughs> With the prologue of tonight's story, The Strange Sisters, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. You've no doubt noticed those big red and yellow billboards that tell you you now go farther than ever with new Signal gasoline. Well, that's important. But unfortunately, there isn't room on those billboards to tell the equally important part of the story, the finer performance in new Signal gasoline that makes this good mileage possible. Now, here's what I mean. New Signal's quicker starting naturally saves gas. Signal's smooth, fast pickup saves gas. And Signal's effortless anti-knock power that sends your motor purring up the steepest hills saves gas. So you see, the features in gasoline that make driving a pleasure are the very same ones that add up to more mileage. That's why we say your speedometer is the best proof of gasoline quality. If you want the tops in performance from your car, the logical place to find it is the new super fuel that now helps you go farther than ever. New Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Pamela, jealousy can do strange things to a mind like yours, can't it? And it's a peculiar mind. Filled to the bursting point with frustrated black hatred for your sister Sally. Accumulated during the long years the three of you spent under the same roof with your father. She always had everything, didn't she? You and Kathy had to take what was left and like it. Yes, Pamela. That jealous hatred has brought you to the point where you'll stop at nothing. Lying, cheating, twisting the truth in such a way that your poor gullible sister Kathy believes the very existence of Sally condemns her to begging for crumbs at Sally's table when the bread is rightfully hers. And you've thought of everything, haven't you, Pamela? You're confident that Kathy is prepared for the talk with Sally that's bound to come sooner or later. But, Kathy, I know I'm right about Pamela. Why must you always talk about Pamela? Pamela did this if it wasn't for Pamela. Oh, stop it, will you? I tell you, Pamela's the only one in the world I can turn to. Please, Kathy, please believe me, you're wrong. I'm not wrong. You are, dear. She's filled your mind with all sorts of hateful lies about me and Henry. Why do you keep throwing that in my face? Henry, Henry, Henry! He's yours now, isn't he? You've got him. You were smart. Just like she said. All right, take him. 
marry him. I don't care. Doesn't make any difference now. Kathy, apparently there's nothing I can do or say that will make any difference in the way you feel. I promised Father I'd take care of you. Well, I'm leaving you the house and all the furniture. And I'm making arrangements for a trust fund that'll provide for you both. That's charitable of you. Under the circumstances, I think it is. I'll expect you and Pamela to be civil to Henry until we leave. Is that clear? Is he coming here? Yes. To live? Yes, for a week or so. I don't understand. It's very simple. We're going to be married tonight. Yes, Pamela. Kathy was prepared, wasn't she? Sally was right. Nothing she could do or say would make any difference. Because Kathy is yours, isn't she? For too many years, she's depended on you for guidance. Looked to you for advice. Regarded everything you said as truth and everything else false. Yes, jealousy is a strange thing, Pamela. It's been there, deep inside you, for as long as you can remember. And it was convenient for you to find a cause for it. Sally and your father, the legacy, the house, the money. But that's gone now, isn't it, Pamela? Sally's been pretty fair about it. She and Henry are married now, and... You have the house and your share of the money. That's what's strange about jealousy. The cause is gone, but it's still there, stronger than ever. And with it, your plan for murder. Did you get the key to their room for Mrs. Stokes? Yes. I... Here it is. She doesn't know you have it. No, she's gone to the store. I took it off the hook. Give it to me. What are you going to do? Just look around a little. Why? Henry's things are up there. He brought them in last night before they left. Well, I'm just curious, Kathy. Just curious. All right, Kathy, you can put the key back now. Did you find anything? Yes, several things. What? Kathy, I'll do the shopping tomorrow. Shopping? Pam, you never do... I'll tell you later. It seems Mr. French is a vicious man, Kathy. Perhaps you're just as well rid of him. Vicious? Of course. He must be, dear. Otherwise, why would he keep a loaded revolver in the upper drawer of his dresser? Well, Miss Pamela, what are you doing around here? Why, you ain't been in the store for six months now. Oh, I thought the walk might do me good. Well, what'll it be? A small rolled roast, please. About three pounds, perhaps. You got just the thing for you here. You ain't looking too well, if you don't mind my saying so. Something wrong? No, nothing. Oh. Yeah. Will this do? Yes, that'll be fine. It's kind of small. Oh, it'll do, Mr. Watkins. You see, Kathy and I haven't been too well lately. Uh, I, I thought so. Now, come on, what's up? I... Oh, I know I shouldn't say anything, but... I've got to talk to someone, Mr. Watkins. Oh, gosh, is it that bad? I don't know. It's Sally and that husband of hers. Oh, you don't see. Oh, they've been quarreling dreadfully. It's been going on all morning, and I just had to get away from it somehow. It was only married night before last. You, you won't say anything, will you, Mr. Watkins? Promise me. Oh, sure, sure. Well, it's about the estate. Sally told him she was going to deed part of it to Kathy and me, and he flew into the most dreadful fit of temper. I could hardly believe my eyes. Here's your sugar, Miss Pamela. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. I'm, uh, I'm sure sorry about that. You, you won't say anything, will you? Me? Oh, no, no. Ain't there anything you can do? Let's see now. You wanted a shampoo and a finger wave, Miss Pamela. Yes. Gosh, you know, I can hardly get my mind on my work after what you told me. Well, you, you won't say anything, will you? Oh, of course not, Miss Pamela. Not a word. <laughs> You're very efficient, aren't you, Pamela? The town of Newton is like a smooth pond. All you have to do is cast a few pebbles here and there, and the ripples spread over the whole surface, clear to the edges. There's another step now, a very important one. Sally is hostile and suspicious, and you're going to need her confidence. Who is it? Pamela. Well, Pamela, may I come in? Must you? 
Please don't make it difficult for me, Sally. I don't understand. I have something to tell you. I'd like to come in and sit down if you don't mind. All right, Pamela. Now, I, well, I've been doing a lot of thinking, Sally, and, and I haven't slept much. Not since you told us about the house and, and the money. Yes, it was so unexpected, I... Well, you see, it threw me a little off balance. What are you trying to say? Oh, you know me so well, Sally. The past few years have been hard, and I know I've been unreasonable and difficult. Pamela, you're trying to say you're sorry, aren't you? Oh, I... I'm so clumsy at this sort of thing. Oh, I do so want to have you and Henry forgive me. Oh, my dear. I really believe you mean it. I do, Sally. I do mean it. And I'm going to try to make Kathy understand, too. You're right, Sally. I, I've been such a terrible influence on the poor thing. Oh, Pam, darling, I'm so happy that it's working out. Oh, Sally, I... Come on, now. Let's forget all about it. I'm sure Henry will understand. It's odd, isn't it? I had the feeling underneath that somehow it would work out. I just knew it, Pam. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Now, you go on downstairs and tell Kathy. I've got to finish the packing. Packing? Well, but, but you're not leaving until the end of the week. Henry has to make a business trip to New York. Some things he has to settle up before we leave. Well, when's he going? Tonight. He's leaving at nine. Oh, that reminds me. I must call the cab. He said to be sure to have it here for him promptly at nine. Now, you run down and tell Kathy it's all cleared up, will you? Oh, of course, Sally. Of course. <laughs> That's what I get for avoiding them. How could I have been so stupid? Oh, it's all right, Pam. Henry will be back. Oh, don't be ridiculous. He's leaving for New York tonight, and they're taking the steamer from there in four days. No, Kathy. He's not coming back. He'll send for her, and she'll meet him there. But isn't there some way? There's only one way. It's got to happen tonight. Oh, oh I'm scared. Pam, maybe... Oh, stop gibbering, Kathy. The town is ready for it, and it's going to happen. Henry French is going to shoot his wife in a fit of temper and try to leave the country. Pam, Pam, the gun. How are we going to get the gun? You see, we can't do it. We can't do it without the gun. And, and, it, and it's in his dresser, and, and it, she's up I there. I said, stop gibbering. I've got to think. Turn on the light. It's getting dark in here. Yes, Pam. There. The light. Yes. The light. That's it. The light. What is it, Pam? The basement. Kathy, the fuse box is in the basement, in the furnace room. The fuse box. You get here about six. I'll go down in the basement and unscrew a fuse. The lights will go out. You know, Henry, he'll trot down to the basement to fix it. What about Sally? I'll wait till she's downstairs. You'll be on the second floor in a room at the end of the corridor. And then, when he leaves, you can go into the room and get the gun. You can see it pretty clearly now, can't you, Pamela? The People versus Henry French, the charged murder. It's easy to think there in the basement as you wait in a dark corner after you unscrew the fuse and listen to the confusion upstairs as they stumble around in the dark. Then, as an afterthought, you find an old blown-out fuse on the shelf and screw it into place, just in case Henry might wonder how a perfectly good one could come unscrewed by itself. Then, when it's over, you return secretly to your room at the end of the second-floor corridor. Did you get it? Yes, here it is. I wore my gloves, Pam, just as you told me. All right, now listen. We haven't much time. He's down there now, waiting for the taxi. Have you got your watch on? Yes. Now, let's see. Oh, luminous dial, that's good. Now, listen carefully. The taxi is calling promptly at 9 o'clock. Understand, it's going to happen shortly after he leaves. About 5 past 9. Who's going to do it? You are. Oh, Pam. You've got to. I'll have to be upstairs. You'll be in the basement. Henry will leave in the taxi at 9, and I'll get Sally up on the second floor on some pretext. At 5 past 9, I'll scream that you've fallen down the basement stairs. She'll run down. Uh, yeah. Yes, Pam. I understand. Now remember, not until after nine o'clock. 
We've got to be sure Henry is gone. All right, Pam. I'll look at my watch. I promise. Good. Now you'd better get down here. It would be rude of me not to be there to say goodbye to him. So the time has come, hasn't it, Pamela? Forty years of pent-up hatred is about to find release at last. For the first time in your life, you're actually cordial to Henry as you make small talk with him in the entrance hallway. And you feel a glow of satisfaction as you watch him carry his bags to the waiting taxi. Then, just as you begin to wonder why Sally isn't there to see him off, you hear a foot on the stair and your heart stops. Sally. What's the matter? Why, the... The suitcase. You're in traveling clothes. Well, what's the matter with that? You're going to... Oh, that's it. I guess I'm not used to having you concerned about me, Pam. As a matter of fact, we decided just five minutes ago, I convinced Henry that walking out on his wife after four days of marriage was a pretty dirty trick. <laughs> yes, dear, I'm coming. Well, goodbye, Pamela. I'll wire you if we decide not to come back. Sally, you... You can't. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing, Sally. You watch unbelieving as she walks down the steps to the taxi cab. It failed, didn't it? Just like everything else you ever tried. Sally succeeded and you failed. There's a lump in your throat. You're all choked up with disappointment and bitter, corrosive hatred. Then suddenly, you realize there is another way. You've got to get to Kathy and tell her. You glance at the clock, 8.45. It's still safe. Then over to the basement door. Kathy! Kathy! Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to tell you about an interesting experiment I witnessed the other day. An automobile motor that had been driven 35,000 miles without taking the head off was being torn down for inspection. Ordinarily, you'd expect to find a good deal of carbon in the cylinder head and worn motor parts. But this motor was remarkably clean, free of carbon, and all parts were in excellent condition. Now, the thing which makes these results so interesting is that this motor was lubricated only with Signal 4-Star motor oil. A signal engineer who was present, however, explained to me why Signal 4-Star oil takes such good care of motors. Because of solvent refining, one of the latest and most costly developments in petroleum engineering, Signal 4-Star motor oil has three important advantages. One, forms less carbon, far less by actual test than many leading brands. Two, its tougher film clings to moving parts, protecting them from wear and sealing in power. And three, Signal 4 Star oil flows freely, instantly on coldest mornings, yet doesn't thin out when your motor is hot. In these days when motors have to last and last, your motor needs this triple protection. You can get it by making your next oil change a change to the better, a change to Signal 4 Star motor oil. And now, back to the whistler. So it didn't work out, Pamela. You're a failure, even in death. And without you, Kathy is lost. She's helpless now, cringing before the sharp questions the officers throw at her, trying futilely to lie her way out of a hopeless trap. And Sally stands there, unbelieving, as the hatred, the jealousies come to the surface for all the world to see. More questions, more stumbling answers, then still more and more, until finally... <laughs> Take her away, Joe. Well, there you are, Mrs. French. I... I can't believe it. It's so fantastic. Yeah, it is at that. They knew Mr. French was leaving at nine. Planned to kill you with his gun. In the dresser drawer. That's where he kept it. Pamela was smart, Mrs. French. But she forgot one thing. 
The clock on the wall read 8.45. So she figured it was safe to open the basement door where Kathy was waiting to kill you. She forgot it was an electric clock. When she pulled the fuse down there and cut out the current, the clock lost 18 minutes. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, produced by George W. Allen, based on a story by Bernard Girard and Zane Mann, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That Whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines present... Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Robert Taylor in the house in Cypress Canyon, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those better-tasting California wines enjoyed by more Americans than any other wine. For friendly entertaining, for delightful dining. Yes, right now, a glassful would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Robert Taylor, star of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's Undercurrent, in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! Merry Christmas, Jerry. How's the real estate business? Oh, kind of early with your greeting, aren't you, Sam? Well, I got to get them in sometime. I may not see you again until next Christmas. If this real estate racket gets any crazy, I'll be dead by next Christmas. <laughs> I'm glad you could get up here, though, Sam. What's on your mind, Jerry? Uh, you, you'll probably shoot me when you hear it, Sam, because I'm probably nuts. But, but doggone it, you're a detective and you're my pal, and I just had to tell somebody. Well, you sound like it's serious. That's just it. I, I don't know what it is, Sam, but... Now, listen, you you know we're agents for a group of houses up in Cypress Canyon. Mm -hmm. Those places that were started before the war never got finished. Oh, yeah. All they got in were the foundations, just mm -hmm. concrete and a couple of beams. Well, they've been finished now. In fact, I'm putting up the for rent on the last of them today. Well, what do you want? Police protection from the mob? <laughs> listen, Sam, this house that I'm talking about, it's got a number now, uh, 2256. But before, when the men went back to work on it about three months ago... Well, they just started when the foreman on the job brought me a shoebox that he'd found up on a beam. And this box had a, a what do you call it, a, a manuscript in it, a story, kind of, all written out. Yeah. Well, he gave me the thing. I read it. I didn't think much about it. I put it in my desk. But the other day, when I happened to drive by there, I saw the number on the house and what the house looked like. I thought of this manuscript. And, well, I don't like it, that's all. There's something funny about it. Well, what's funny about it? Well, I... Mind you, this thing was found in an unfinished house in Cypress Canyon. House that was only just started building. All it's, right. Uh, well, listen, Sam, I want to read it to you if you got the time, and you'll see what I mean. All right, shoot. <clears throat> well, here's how it begins. Uh, to whom it may concern, my reasons for setting down on paper what follows here will be abundantly clear. What follows here will be abundantly clear to anyone into whose possession it may fall. First, let me say that I'm a very ordinary person. My name is James A. Woods. I'm 35 years old. 
by profession a chemical engineer. My wife, Ellen, was a school teacher when I met and married her in Indiana seven years ago. There's nothing in the past life of either one of us to suggest remotely any cause or reason for the dreadful thing that has invaded our lives. Our married life has been in no way different from that of millions of other average, reasonably happy, and congenial families. Three months ago, I was ordered by my firm to take charge of a rather minor project in Los Angeles, uh, Hollywood to be exact. The order was a sudden one. There'd been no time to secure accommodations, and conditions being what they are, the inevitable result was that until day before yesterday, we'd been living in the cramped quarters of one of those characteristic California motels. Needless to say, most of our spare time had been devoted to a search for something more permanent and comfortable, but the fruits of these efforts had been financially and in every other way a geometrical progression of discouragement until last Saturday afternoon, only four days before Christmas. We were driving into town on our way to a movie when Ellen saw it. Jim, look. What? That sign in front of that real estate office. Oh, yeah. But yeah. don't you see what it says? For rent, furnished, two-bedroom house, close in, immediate occupancy. Yeah, uh-huh. Aren't you going to stop? Oh, Ellen, you know a sign like that. It mean right out in plain sight in front of a real estate office. Oh, yeah, but Jim... Either they want $600 a month... We'll or... never know until we ask. Well, if it's any good at all, there are probably 50 people fighting for it right back there now. Well, honey, there's no harm in trying. Now, is there? You really want to go back? Oh, it's probably foolish, but what can we lose? Okay. Oh, darling, come on, cheer up. How do you know? Maybe our luck's changed. Maybe fate's going to give us a nice new house for a Christmas present. Come in. Oh, uh... We're sorry to bother you, but we just happened to see that for rent sign outside. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, I hung it outside just this minute. Is... is the house available? Why, sure, sure it is. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is James A. Woods, and this is my wife, Ellen. How to do? Wow. Looks like it's fixing to rain. Yes, so it does, doesn't it? Well, it was one of those things. The real estate agent had just been authorized to rent the place by mail that morning, and he'd hardly had time to look at it himself and put up his sign when we drove up. It was just an ordinary little California house about halfway up Cypress Canyon, number 2256. Just an ordinary, undistinguished little house. The agent didn't know much about it. Construction on it had been stopped by the war, and it had just been completed and furnished lately. It had been vacant while somebody's estate was being settled, and... Now it was owned by a bank in Sacramento. Of course, we didn't, we didn't care about it. Got this key in the mail along with the authorization to rent. Only one there is. Of course, you can have duplicates made. Yeah, seems to stick a little. Oh, no, there it is. <laughs> Doesn't sound as though that door had ever been opened. Well, a little oil on the hinges will fix that all right. Oh, sure. Now, now here's your living room. Furniture's a little dusty, of course. You've got to expect that. It's good furniture, though, you see? Benson Brothers. Yes, uh-huh. Now, over here's a little den. Panel, you see? Radio, fireplace. Really a very attractive little room, particularly for a man. Uh-huh, yep. Now, the, the bedroom's off the living room here. Everything's all on one floor, you understand? Uh-huh. It's uh, quite nice, I think. Yes. Uh-huh. You can see you get the morning sun here. There's a view of the canyon through these front windows. You've got cross ventilation. That's about all there was to it. It wasn't the best place in the world. It was small and badly built, but what would you have done? We took it with as little inspection as that. It was the Saturday before Christmas. And the very same evening, we were struggling up the steps from the road with suitcases and boxes and armloads of clothes and all the endless bric-a-brac that people collect and never know they have until they move. Ellen began unpacking, and I began moving things around and taking the worst of the pictures off the wall, doing... All the little things that everybody does when they move into a new place and try to give it something of their own. Don't be such a sour puss. You know, it's a roof over our heads for Christmas. That's more than we ever thought we'd get, isn't it? Now, what in the world are we going to do with those two pictures? Well, why don't we just leave them where they are? Jim, we can't. They're too awful. Well, all right, put them in the closet then. I can't. Both the closets are jammed full. No, I mean the other one in the little alcove off the den. At least there's a door there. I suppose it's a closet. Yeah. I don't know. That isn't a commentary on the housing problem, huh? 
A woman moving into a house without even knowing where all the closets are. Take the pictures down, will you, honey? Bring them in here. Okay, okay. Oh, I guess you'll have to help me with this door. I can't get it open. Let me see it. Well, of course you can't, silly. It's locked. Where are those keys we found on the desk? Mm, here they are. Mm, no, not this one. Sure, this one won't work. Feels like an awful solid door for a closet. Oh, and that's one solid door in the house. Well, this one won't do it either. Well, we'll just have to get a locksmith up here on Monday. I'll put the pictures behind the desk, okay? Yeah, yeah, all right. Jim, if you could just help me move this armchair, huh? Oh, Ellen, will you let it go until tomorrow? You know what time it is? Oh, but, honey, I'd like to get the place looking just a yeah, little bit. Yeah, but it's bit... almost midnight. In fact, it's, it's exactly... What was that? <laughs> Tomcat, I guess, out in the brush somewhere. Sounded near. <laughs> Hope that doesn't go on all night. Well, there's much we can do about it. Come on, Ellen. I'm dead tired. All right, Jim. All right. Where'd you put the toothpaste, honey? It's right in the medicine cabinet. Oh, yeah. Jim, we ought to get some firewood tomorrow. You know, a fire in that living room would make all the difference Make's in the world. Camp, Sunday. Well, Monday then. Jim, I think red curtains are what we need, don't you? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, just at least for the living room. Anyway, the ones in there now have just got to come down. Yeah, I suppose they do. What do you think of red? Well, I <laughs> guess it's all... Jim. That's some tomcat. Jim, it, it sounded in the house. Oh, now, how could it be in the house, Ellen? We've been over every inch of the house. Except the closet. Now, how could a cat or anything else be in the closet that's been locked up for over a year? I don't know. It's... Yeah, it's probably under the house. A wildcat or mountain lion or something. I hear they have them in California. Jim, I don't like well, it. Well, neither do I like it, but there's nothing we can do about it tonight. Well, maybe we ought to call somebody, the police or oh, some neighbor. Oh, don't neighbors. be silly, Ellen. You act like a kid. Come on, let's go to bed, huh? Well, all right. I suppose it is silly. Jimmy, did you lock the door? Yeah, yeah. Can I turn out the lights now? Yeah. All right. Good night, Ellen. Sleep tight. Good night, Jim. I don't know what time it was, perhaps an hour, perhaps only a half hour later. My mind was in that hazy borderland between sleep and a dream that's still part of consciousness. <coughs> then I was awake. <coughs> Ellen, are you all right? Yes. Did you have a nightmare or something? No. I heard it too. Well, that didn't sound like any cat. Put on the light. Yeah. It, it seemed to be... Out there, Jim, in the house somewhere. I'm going to look into this. Jim, you be careful. Come on. Where's, where's my shotgun? In the den, I think. Jim. What? There. There's something wet. What? Wet? Running from under the closet door. Sticky. Hey, Ellen, don't. Don't touch it. I had to. Jim, it's blood. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Robert Taylor in the house in Cypress Canyon. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of suspense, this is Ken Niles for Roma Wines. These days before Christmas are busy ones indeed, yet smart hostesses everywhere find time for shopping and distinguished home entertaining later. The secret? Magnificent Grand Estate Wines. Presented by Roma, America's greatest vintner, Grand Estate Wines add distinction to your hospitality on a moment's notice. Make your holiday welcome, effortless, and in perfect taste. The brilliant clarity, full fragrance, and mellow taste of Grand Estate wines please discriminating people everywhere. For Grand Estate wines, limited bottlings by Roma, are born of choicest grapes, then patiently guided to superb taste richness by Roma Vintner skill, necessary time, and America's finest winemaking resources. Delight your guests with Grand Estate California wines for entertaining, Medium Sherry, Ruby Port, or Golden Muscatel. For dining, 
Burgundy or Sauterne. So insist on grand estate wines and enjoy the crowning achievement of vintner skill. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Robert Taylor as James A. Woods with Kathy Lewis as his wife, Ellen, in the house in Cypress Canyon, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. not be too difficult to understand from the foregoing why I've taken the pains to set down in writing the events related here. To find in one's newly rented house a closet which cannot be opened is in itself certainly no great cause for alarm. But to be awakened in the stillness of the night by unearthly cries within that house, to find oozing from under that closet door something that is unquestionably blood, that's another matter. Perhaps others might have been braver than we. Suffice it only to say that we got out of the house in something very close to a panic and only returned when we had the moral support of two stalwart Los Angeles policemen. You uh, just moved in here, you say? That's right, officer. You can, you can see we're still unpacking. And the place has been empty right along before that? Yeah, I, I don't know much about that part of it. You could check all that with a real estate agent, though. Well, uh, <clears throat> where is this closet? Oh, it's it's right in here, officer. And and the blood, the blood is... Where? Where's the blood? Jim? Officer, I, I swear to you, there was blood on the floor less than an hour ago. I, I saw it. Uh-huh. It, it was running out from under that door. We heard that noise, and we got up, and then we saw it. The, the door was locked. Locked, huh? Oh, no. I... Well, it seems to be all right now. Hey, uh, you folks aren't trying to be funny, are you? Is, isn't there anything in it? No, ma'am, there is not. Look, officer, we're reputable people. You can call my firm. They'll tell you all about me. There's nothing wrong with this closet. Walls are solid, no trap doors. If you think I'm lying... I didn't say that, mister. Oh, you probably did hear some sort of a noise, and you got a little panicky, and... What, uh... what about the blood? It, it got on my hand. It isn't there now, is it? Yes. Where? I, I feel it. <laughs> now, you folks, just take it easy. You know, you're liable to hear all kinds of noises up in these canyons at night. You're uh, from the east, you say? Uh, yeah. I'm, I, I'm sorry, officer. Ah, oh, that's all right. That's all right. If you have any real trouble, call on us any time. All right. Well, good night. Good night. Good night. Hey. <laughs> you ought to have this door fixed. That's enough to scare you. Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to have it fixed. <laughs> say much about it after that. There wasn't much that could be said. The next day, I went down to a lot and bought a little Christmas tree and some trimmings, and we tried to pretend we were cheerful, but there was an uneasiness between us that had never been there before. Ellen seemed tired and listless. Several times during the day, I noticed her washing her hands with a, with a brush, scrubbing the one that had touched the blood. That night, we each took a sleeping pill and went to bed. <laughs> sometime after midnight when I was suddenly wide awake and staring into the darkness. In some way, I, I knew at once and instinctively what had awakened me. Ellen was not in her bed nor in the room. The nameless thing I feared gripped at my heart until I could scarcely breathe. I opened the bedroom door and started through the house, putting on every light that I could find. There was not much to search, but I searched thoroughly. The, the living room, the kitchen, bathroom, day, and even the garage... And all the time, the dread of looking where I knew at last I must look. For I think I knew from the very first time where I'd find her. It must have been a full minute that I stood before that closet door. Then, I opened it. She stood there rigid, her arms at her sides, the fingers extended like claws. Her hair was over her face, her eyes stared out of it. Her lips were drawn back in a grin like an animal at bay. For a moment, I was frozen with the horror of it. I stretched out my hand. Mm. Very deliberately, she turned her head and sunk her teeth until they met into the flesh of my forearm. I'd raised my hand to strike at her, but already she'd relaxed her hold and gone utterly limp. She would have fallen unless I'd caught her. I carried her into the bedroom and laid her on the bed. 
Strangely, at that moment, my only thought was how I might revive her. Until I saw that it was, it was not a faint, but a sleep that she'd fallen into. A sleep as deep and heavy as though she'd been drugged. And so I left her. But for me, that night, there was no sleep. Yes, Ellen? Oh. What are you doing up so early? Oh, I, I got a little restless. i make some coffee. Oh. Oh. I had the most wonderful sleep. And I feel so rested. Do you? Mm-hmm. Jim. What? What's the matter with your arm? Oh, I I just heard it. Honey, it's, it's terribly swollen. Let me see it. No, it, it's all right, Ellen. Oh, it isn't all right. You've got to see Dr. Wesley right away. Sure, I, I will. No, I now, will. you promise me, Jim, that you'll go the first thing this morning. How'd it happen? Why, oh, uh, th- there was a dog. A dog? Yeah, I, I heard him trying to chew through the screen door. I went out to chase him away, and he bit me. Well, you mean there was all that racket, and I didn't even wake up? No, Ellen, you... You didn't even wake up. It was clear to me that Ellen knew nothing of what had transpired the night before. I went to my office that morning and made a pretense of going over routine business, if only to restore my mind to some semblance of calm by the sight and sound of common, familiar things. Pain in my arm had become a persistent, dull throbbing. I made a late appointment with Dr. Wesley... He treated my arm with something of an arched eyebrow, and, and he said, Well, I've never seen anything quite like it before. That is such a rapid onset of infection. It was dark when I left his office. I hadn't realized it was so late. Driving home, my car seemed, seemed sluggish until I saw the needle on the dashboard and realized that I was pushing it to the utmost of its speed. I was racing home to prevent and something before it was too late, before the darkness had conspired against me. For somehow I already knew with certainty that it was the darkness and the night that I had to fear. The curves of the canyon seemed endless. And then the cold fear leaped up inside me. My house, too, was dark. I went slowly up the stone steps from the road, looking, praying for some sign of light or light. There was none. The house was empty. Ellen was gone. I, I looked with the same self-torturing thoroughness, and in that closet first of all, knowing as I did so that it was hopeless. And so, alone in that empty house, I waited, powerless and helpless now, deadened in thought and will, empty as the house itself, save only for the overwhelming sense of a terrible foreboding. For some time in the early hours of the morning... I snapped on the radio, shortwave. Why? Surely a minor question now. I only know that I did. And then I heard it. Car 58, car 58, go to Laurel Canyon, the 4,000 block. A report that a man has been injured or attacked. Condition thought to be critical. Ambulance will follow. That is all. I was there almost before the police, edging my way through the little crowd, staring down at the man lying there in his white uniform under the street light. Yeah, the milkman, poor guy. I heard him scream, but when I got here, just like this, there's All nothing right, on it. Stand back, stand back. Please, please stand back. Well, you again. I, I heard it on the radio. I, I live just down the road. Yeah, yeah, I remember. What, what happened? Well, take a look. Maybe you can tell us. He was dead. And he was lying on his back. And his throat had been torn out, as though by the fangs of some wild animal. It is now Christmas Eve, or rather Christmas morning, for it's a little after midnight. I've been waiting here, here in the stillness of this empty house for nearly 24 hours, waiting for the end. Already once tonight, I've heard that dreadful wailing cry somewhere in the hills. 
I've nailed up the closet door, but that I, I know was childish and useless. My arm is horribly swollen and turning black, but that's nothing. It's another end that I foresee, as, as surely as other men foresee the rising of the sun. I hear the cry again. It's nearer now. I shall leave these notes in a sealed envelope and put it in a shoebox in the hope that someone will give credence to these dark and terrible events, if indeed such nameless horrors can ever yield to mortal understanding. As for myself, I feel no longer any fear or even sorrow, only a desire that the end and the thing that I must do may come soon. And it will be soon, I know. Yes, for there is someone at the door. Someone at the door. Ah, well, what do you make of it, Sam? <laughs> it's quite a yarn. But what of it? That's what I thought. Now listen, that's not quite all of it. Huh? Clip to it's a newspaper clip. Listen. Hollywood, December the 26th. Police reported what was apparently a case of murder and suicide in Cypress Canyon sometime in the early hours of the morning. The victims were James A. Woods, a chemical engineer, and his wife, Ellen. Preliminary investigation indicates that Mrs. Woods was killed by the blast of a shotgun in the hands of her husband, who then turned the weapon upon himself. That she fought desperately for her life, however, was evidenced by the disorder of the room and the severe lacerations inflicted upon her husband about the neck and arms. This is the second tragedy to be reported in Cypress Canyon within 24 hours, the other being the unexplained death of Frank Polanski, a milkman. Well, no such murders or whatever they were ever occurred, if that's what's worrying you. The clipping, well, you have those things printed up, you know. No, no, it's not that, Sam. That story was found in an unfinished house in Cypress Canyon. No number, no nothing, just a framework. Uh -huh. Now that house is finished. When I drove by it today, well, that's what stopped me, Sam, because it all fits. Now that it's finished, it is the house in the story, the same construction, the same vines and creepers on the lawn, even the same number. So what, a guy who knows roughly what this house is going to be like writes a yarn and loses it or something. Did he know the place was going to be listed for rental today, the Saturday before Christmas? <laughs> oh, Jerry, coincidence. Two bits you find the guy next door is a ghost story writer or something, and he's been wondering for a year what happened to that thing he wrote. Okay. Okay, coincidence. Well, I, I'm sorry I bothered you, Sam. <laughs> Don't be silly. I liked it. It's a good yarn. Uh, that the uh, for rent sign you were talking about? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to put it up outside now. Uh-huh. Well, so long, Jerry, and Merry Christmas again. No, well, thanks, Sam. <laughs> I guess I was kind of silly, all right. Huh? <laughs> Listen, when a guy named uh, whatever it is, Woods, with a wife named Ellen, comes in to rent that place from you, then you can start worrying. <laughs> yeah. Well, so long, Sam. So long, Jerry. Come in. Oh, we're sorry to bother you, but we just happened to see that for rent sign outside. Well, yeah, I hung it out just this minute. Is... is the house available? Oh, sure, sure it is. Well, let me introduce myself. My name is James A. Woods, and this is my wife, Ellen. How do well, looks like it's fixing to... Yes, it does, doesn't it? Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, selected for your pleasure from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. Tonight's show marks the third birthday of Suspense on the Air, and this is Ken Niles asking our star of the evening, Robert Taylor, to help us celebrate. Why didn't you tell me before, Ken? If I'd only known, I'd have baked a cake. Well, Bob, all suspense parties are surprise parties. 
As an old hand on suspense, uh, you know that in our plays, the tables are usually turned on the star. So tonight, although it's our birthday, we're going to give you a present. Here it is, a gift basket of Grand Estate California wines from Roma, America's greatest vintner, to our distinguished anniversary guest, Robert Taylor. Thanks, Ken. You turn a nice table. And you can set a nice table with Grand Estate Burgundy in your basket, Bob. For Grand Estate Burgundy means rare dining pleasure. Adds memorable distinction to holiday dinner. Even everyday meals are outstanding in taste when Grand Estate Burgundy is served. Yes, all Grand Estate wines presented by Roma are limited bottlings of outstanding taste excellence. Well, that I know about Grand Estate wines, Ken. But did you know that for Grand Estate wines, Roma selects only the choicest grapes? Then the ancient skill of Roma master vintners, necessary time, and America's finest winemaking resources guide the cuvee of this grape treasure to rich taste luxury. That's why discriminating wine users everywhere look to Grand Estate Wines as the crowning achievement of Vintner skill. Reason enough. And now, Ken, who's all set to star on Suspense next Thursday? It's that very wonderful actress and wonderful girl, Miss Susan Peters. Susan will appear as a young lady in straitened circumstances who finds herself mistaken for a very rich young lady and who is forced into continuing the deception with murder as a result. I'll certainly make it a point to listen. And uh, before I go, I'd like to thank this really great company of actors who have played with me tonight, and particularly Kathy Lewis, who played Ellen. Thank you, Bob. Tonight's original suspense play was written by Robert L. Richards. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Miss Susan Peters as star of Suspense. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>